This is an unabridged audiobook by author Megan Linsky. To maintain content guidelines, certain scenes have been removed from this audiobook. Summaries of these deleted scenes can be found within this audio. To listen to this full audiobook with deleted scenes, please visit meganlinsky.com. The Dragon Oath, Hidden Legends, University of Sorcery, Book 2, written by Megan Linsky, Narrated by Liana Walsh and Max Pinkins. A note from the author. This book contains characters with the following medical conditions. The information included is meant to educate readers on disabilities featured within the University of Sorcery series. Common Variable Immune Deficiency Disorder CVID is a rare and complex primary immune disorder that is estimated to affect 1 in 25,000 to 1 in 75,000 people worldwide, including the author of this novel, Megan Linsky. It is categorized by low levels of immunoglobulins and antibodies, which makes the body prone to infection and other diseases. Patients are often treated with human plasma, which replaces the missing immunoglobulins people with CVID need to survive. Amputation Amputation is the removal of a limb by trauma, medical illness, or surgery. Some 1.8 million Americans are living with amputations. Many amputees use prosthetics as a way of increasing quality of life after losing a limb. Autism Autism is a developmental disorder that impacts the nervous system and affects each individual differently with a wide variety of symptoms. Challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, and speech are common. Autism can affect as many as 1 in 59 children. The University of Sorcery series is part of the Hidden Legends universe, a paranormal fantasy world created by authors Megan Linsky and Alicia Radez. Included in this universe are the following series, the Academy of Magical Creatures series, the College of Witchcraft series, and the Prison for Supernatural Offenders series, with more to come. Each Hidden Legends novel features magical romances with disabled characters fighting for a better world. You can find out more about the Hidden Legends universe by going to www.hiddenlegendsbooks.com. Chapter 1. Ethan you misunderstand. You think I'm a man with something to lose. My voice was low as it echoed around the dark chamber of the dungeon. The sound of water dripping onto stone rang throughout the chamber. Or was it blood? A cultist was tied to the chair. Red soaked his hands. The black claw robes he wore were stained with gore. The only light in the cavern was a single candle I'd placed on the table. The cultist's face was swollen with bruises. Both his eyes were black, and fresh cuts littered his skin. I'd caught this one sneaking around Delinska's streets at an hour known for dark magic. He'd been following a sorceress to her home and was waiting to abduct her for some sinister purpose. He wasn't planning to run into the phantom. I had captured him and dragged him back to my hideout in the chasms of Arcania University, where I'd tied him up and made good on my dirty work, trying to obtain information. Prince Ethan would be appalled by such behavior. He'd find it abhorrent and beneath himself. But the Phantom had no reservations. There was a darkness in him that waited inside and swallowed him whole. The Phantom was a hidden specter that lurked in the shadows eager to be let out of his cage so he could take his rage out on the world. And the only way I could do what I had to these days was if I separated the man from the monster. Two different personas, a singular man, one a devil, the other a saint. It was enough to make one man go mad. Dr. Jekyll had it easy. Yet this fellow wasn't going to crack. I'd question him for the better part of an hour, and he hadn't uttered a syllable on anything remotely interesting to my cause. I hadn't really hurt him. Even though there was gore on my mask and cloak, I hadn't even pursued the sick fantasies I wanted to do to this man. They thrilled the phantom, but scared me. 
I didn't understand why I had such reservations. This man was, most likely, a murderer. He'd plotted to hurt an innocent woman, and would have if I hadn't gotten there first. He deserved this. The cultist let out a wet laugh, and blood dribbled down his chin. You think you're so high and mighty. I'm certain you're getting some pleasure out of this. You'd be wrong. I wasn't proud of this, but a man could only be pushed so far, and I'd lost everything only a few weeks prior. I'd let my father down and sacrificed the throne. There was nothing, nothing I wouldn't do to prevent my cousin Elijah from taking the crown. I was merely getting started. I can do this all night, I told the cultist. I'll ask again, where are you hiding? I can't give up the location of my brethren. You won't find the black cloth through me. He spat a globule of blood at my feet, and my nose wrinkled. I needed to find where the black claw was. Only then would I be able to rip this disease out of my city for good. I think you need more convincing. Shall we? The cultist's eyes shone with fear as I raised my hand. As amethyst sparks flew from my fingers, the cultist began screaming. Blood-curdling yells of agony lifted past his lips as I made him see visions. An easy illusion. Nothing was happening to him physically, but in his head he felt pain as if I was peeling off his skin layer by layer. I pushed the magic further inward on his mind to make the torture worse. As he begged me to stop, I tapered the magic away. He took labored breaths and I crossed my arms. Like I said, I'm not fooling around, I said. I will push you until I get what I want. And then you'll let me go free, the cultist laughed. You must think I'm stupid. You'll kill me the moment I tell you what I know. He was right. I couldn't have him running off to his little friends. He'd tell them the Phantom had discovered their hideout. Though sparing his life was something Prince Ethan demanded, the Phantom wasn't so merciful. I'd figure out what to do with him when the time came. Last chance. Either tell me now, or I won't lift the illusion. I'll die for the Black Claw. The descendants of the unseely Fay deserve to be in power, the cultist hissed. Do your worst. This is a final warning. I was losing patience. My brothers will avenge me. They know where to find you. They know the man behind the mask. I reeled back in shock at his admission. Had the Black Claw figured out who I was? Did they know my secret identity? And if they did, why hadn't they acted to reveal me yet? He had to be bluffing. If the Black Claw knew who I was... They'd have told the Arcania Alliance, and I'd be imprisoned by now. No other explanation made sense. I was their biggest threat and hindrance, especially since the King's contest ended. I'd been patrolling these streets every night afterward, causing trouble for the cult. If there was a way for them to get rid of me, there'd be no reason not to take it. I'm sick of your lies. This is my last warning. The cultist coughed up more blood. What would your pretty little mate say if she knew what you were doing to me? She'd be terrified of you. Panic and possession streamed through my body. I forced my voice to be steady as I replied, I have no mate. The cultist snorted. Every shifter does. She's out there, and when we get our hands on her... At the mention of the black colt harming Emma, I lost my temper. My illusion magic erupted from my hands, sending a purple shock wave through the room. The cultist pleaded for me to stop, but I ignored him, and more sparks flew from my fingers again as I cast the spell. The cultist cried out in suffering. This time I gave the illusion of hot irons pressing into his skin, and though he begged, I didn't pull back. This was what I'd become now. A monster. The sound of a heavy door scraping open caught my attention, and I whirled around. Loud footsteps sounded on the stairs, and my illusion ended. The man in the chair slung against his binds in relief. My heart pounded against my ribcage. 
who in their right mind was at the university at this hour, on winter break, and how had they discovered my hideout? My breath quickened as my gaze landed upon none other than Lord Lucian. The old wolven wore a heavy cloak, and there were bags around his eyes, as if he was tired in a way words couldn't express. His mouth thinned as he caught sight of the bloody cultist tied to the chair. Of course he was here. Lord Lucian didn't have family to visit over the holidays. He stayed at the university all year. It was another careless mistake of mine to think that the school would be empty and no one would hear the man screaming. I'd been making too many mistakes lately. My mentor's gaze was cold as he stated, Going a bit far, aren't we, Phantom? There was a lump in my throat. I swallowed past it and said, He deserves it. The illusion I'd cast on my voice for disguising purposes had blended me well. No recognition ran across Lucian's face. He didn't know who I was. Good. I couldn't face him if he did. The shame would be too great. This wasn't what he'd taught me. Are you one of the seven gods to pass judgment like this? Lucian barked cruelly. Who are you to decide who deserves suffering? He chose his fate when he decided to join the Black Claw. My resolve was heavy. Guilt fought against my insides, but I turned it away. If this was the only way to protect my people, so be it. Don't allow the hero to become the villain. Lord Lucian reached for the sword hanging from his waist. Let him go. I couldn't let Lucian unleash my captive. Lucian drew his sword. I drew mine own. He swung downward and I dove out of the way. He parried away my returning blow, and our swords danced against the night as our two weapons crashed over and over. I attempted to find an advantage, but Lucian was too clever. I might have strength on my side, but he was fast and hard to combat. A bead of sweat broke out along Lucian's brow. This fight couldn't go on. Lucian knew my fighting style. He'd been the one who trained me. If I kept dueling with him like this, he'd figure it out. I went to trip him up so I could end the fight with a knockout to the head, but Lucian saw it coming. He ducked. Then, before I knew what was happening, he shoved me to the floor and kicked me in the head. I saw stars. As I struggled back onto my feet, the blurry image of Lucian cutting the ropes of the cultist came into view. The cultist staggered past me and up the stairs. Lucian stood stiffly by the puddle of blood on the stone. What did you do? I roared in fury. All I saw was red. The unbound anger of a wolf coursed through my veins. Lucian was evil for setting a filthy cultist free. Whatever you are, Phantom, this is not who you are. I won't have his blood be on your hands, Lucian boomed. No matter what you were planning, you would have never forgiven yourself. An angry noise erupted from my chest. I left Lucian, fool that he was, and darted up the stairs after the cultist. Lucian didn't follow. The cultist had gotten a head start, but he'd left a blood trail on the carpet. I dashed through the dark halls of Arcania University, using my woven scent to track the cultist's escape route. I caught up to him somewhere near the cafeteria. He was limping, but still, he was moving fast. He burst out of the palace and against the Malovian night into the gardens. I steeled my will, pushed myself to go faster, and followed him into the blustery storm. The blizzard whipped hard and cold past my mask as I gave chase. The snowfall from earlier had turned into a full-on blizzard. Piles of snow, three feet high, coated the pathways on school grounds. The cultist looked behind him and gave a screech as he saw me catching up, increasing his pace to get away. I felt a throbbing soreness radiate from my hip all the way down to the top of my thigh. I gritted my teeth to keep from crying out. My damn leg. It was slowing me down. The prosthetic dug into my skin, probably on account of me being in a hurry as I'd put it on tonight, and the sharp pain slowed me up. With my ill-fitting prosthetic dragging me down, the cultist was getting away. The cultist glanced back and his eyes widened. He saw that he'd put quite a distance between us. 
he had a chance. The cultist ahead exploded into a griffin. Feathers went everywhere and his wings spread wide. I gave a cry of frustration, but the griffin had taken off. The shifter batted his wings against the cold and tried to stay upright as he flew over university grounds. The blizzard almost knocked him out of the sky until he turned and flew with the wind instead of against it. I increased my speed, but my lungs burned, and no man alive could keep up on two legs against a soaring griffin. I finally came to a stop and watched the griffin become a dot in the sky before he vanished into the storm. It was hopeless. I didn't have my wings, and I couldn't give chase without them, not to mention the blizzard was too thick to follow his trail. Cursing the seven gods and all who belonged to them, I turned my back on the cultist and watched him escape. Damn Lucian. Damn his sense of morality. Now that sick, twisted individual was allowed to run recklessly on Dolinska's streets. Who knew what he'd do now that he was loose? What was more, he'd tell his friends I was looking for them. All because Lucian didn't understand. What was done was done. There was no reversing the situation. Patrolling Dolinska in this storm would be useless, and if I remained outside too much longer, I'd probably freeze, even as a shifter. We had a high tolerance for cold weather, but the temperature was dropping to an insane level. Malovia's winters were famous for being brutal, but even I had never seen such weather. The winters in Malovia had been getting worse and worse every year. This was the harshest yet. Such raw temperatures and vicious storms shouldn't be possible. It was almost as if the land was under some sort of magic or curse. The cultist had mentioned my mate, but it was a cheap attempt to intimidate me. He was right as far as every shifter had a mate. He'd assumed the phantom had to have one, but he didn't know it was Emma. He couldn't. He'd have to know I was Prince Ethan, and though we'd declared ourselves to be mates during the king's contest last year, I'd never admitted, not even to my love, that we were fated to be together, and that the magical mated bond had tied our souls as one. Emma was safe, for now. The Black Claw wanted her blood for other reasons, but if I found their hideout first, and destroyed them, I could kill two birds with one stone. The city would be secure from their wrath, and so would Emma. If only Lucian hadn't stolen my one good chance away. Arcania University remained silent and passionless around me as I fled the sanctity of the school grounds. Dolinska itself didn't seem welcoming in this biting cold. I was bitter as I hurtled over the walls, protecting the royal palace and slunk past the guards watching the great gates. As I climbed the tower to my room on the topmost floor, something I'd done a hundred times, I considered using my part of the royal treasury to buy my own mansion somewhere else. Somewhere more discreet, so I wouldn't have to do this anymore. I was getting tired of clinging to the shadows in my own home. Elijah and Gabby hadn't yet moved into the palace, thank the gods. They had to pass their proficiency tests to become the king and queen first, something that I was planning on stopping at all costs. For now, the castle was still mine. Wouldn't be for much longer, though. The thought of my smug cousin kicking me out of my own palace. I suppressed a growl as I pulled myself through the window. Snow flew past me and landed on the bed. I closed the window and removed the mask. I flung it to the side, and it clattered against a wall. I scowled as I watched it lay there. Close. So close, again. It was like my life was an endless round of watching the things I desired most be snatched away from me, right when they were about to be in my hands. Temper, temper. Didn't your mother teach you not to throw your things? I stiffened. As I turned, a monster of a man came into the moonlight. Stefan smirked. He raised an eyebrow and crossed his arms as his eyes roved up and down the cloak, then over the mask. You didn't go to a costume party, I take it. I could hardly breathe. Stefan had seen me take off the mask. He knew my secret was the only person that did. He knew I was the phantom. Yet he didn't seem surprised by it. Only irritated. How much had he guessed? Stefan cracked a sarcastic noise at my silence. 
You know, you can break the act. Broody doesn't work well on you. Anger flickered in my stomach. What the hell are you doing here? I snarled under my breath. These are my chambers. You're not permitted to be here. Don't pull that royal bullshit on me, Stefan shot back. By law, the prince's quarters are... Shove it up your ass. Stefan gave a casual snort before he placed a hand on my shoulder and pushed me back. What are you going to do? Behead me? My eyebrow twitched. How long have you known? That you have a weird complex that makes you dress up in tights? Ages, Stefan replied with a snicker. That's not an answer. Relax, Stefan rolled his eyes. You were hardly around last semester. Plus, your dorm was always empty at night. The Phantom didn't show up until after your dad died. It wasn't hard to piece two and two together. He shrugged. Does anyone else know? The sickening feeling of being exposed pressed in all around me until I felt like I was being crushed. How should I know? I don't read the news. Stefan, would you chill out? No one knows you like I do. Stefan leaned against the wall lazily. I doubt anyone else has figured this out. I relaxed, but only slightly. You're taking this a bit too casually. This isn't a surprise. I always knew you'd do something freaky when we got older, he said. I thought it'd be male stripping, but this is weird too. I threw a pillow at him. He smacked it away, and it fell to the floor with a flop. I'm not a male stripper, I said. With abs like yours, you'd make a killing. I've been thinking about a side gig that shows the ladies what I have to offer myself. Stefan flexed his muscles, and I hit him. He made an oof sound and held his gut. This isn't the time for jokes, I said. Are you going to keep this a secret? Nah, I'm going to run and tell your mom. Stefan gave me a scathing look. Do you really think I would blow your identity? I've been covering your ass. You aren't as obscure and discreet as you think you are. I scowled. He was right. I knew I'd been sloppy and made mistakes in the past few months. The King's Contest had me distracted. But that was over now. I wasn't distracted anymore. You have to be careful. If anyone finds out you know who I am, you'll be a target, I said lowly. Like that's different from any other day of the week. My ass is already a target for being your friend. Good thing I've got some firepower to back you up. I'm bringing the heat. In more ways than one. Stefan blew out a puff of smoke, then wiggled his eyebrows suggestively. Dragon shifters were insufferable creatures. Your puns are awful. You should get a better sense of humor. Stefan gave a dramatic groan. Come on, man. You've been a crabby bastard ever since you lost the contest. Are you going to act like this when Emma comes back? At the mention of Emma, I froze. It both hurt and made me feel wonderful to hear her name. She'd been the reason we'd lost the King's contest. But she was also my mate. And my very reason for breathing. Existing without her was like no kind of existence at all, and I'd hardly been living since she left to spend Christmas in Krakow with her mother. We'd parted the night of the King's contest with tense words and hadn't spoken or seen each other. Her absence from my life, even for a few short weeks, was the main reason I was losing my mind. We had an agreement not to talk about Emma, I began, because you still needed time to cool off. But school starts in a few days. She'll be back from her vacation with her mom any day now, Stefan said. She doesn't need a guilt trip from you on how she fucked up. She feels bad enough. I took a deep breath. The last thing I wanted was Stefan lecturing me on my love life. Why don't you worry about your relationship with Delmare? Which was non-existent, by the way, because they weren't together. Though it was obvious Stefan pined for her. It was a low blow, but effective. Stefan's tone became darker. We're talking about you right now, not me. I'm not the one wearing a mask and running around like a psycho torturing Black Claw cultists. You got issues, man. I wasn't torturing anyone, I sneered. Stefan snorted. Yeah, that's why there's blood all over your cloak. It's like you think I don't know you at all. I glanced down at the bloodstains, then glared Stefan's way. 
What I do as the Phantom is my business. Dude, can't you see that I'm worried about you? Stefan came forward and placed his hands on my shoulder. You haven't been the same since the contest ended. It's like, I don't know, you're turning into someone I don't recognize. I shrugged him away. Maybe it's better this way. Better how? We all agreed to make a plan to take down Gabby and Elijah together, Stefan said. Are you going to turn your back on that now? No. But you don't understand. I work by myself. It doesn't matter, Stefan said forcefully. This is too big for you to handle on your own. If you take them and the Black Claw on by yourself as the Phantom, you're going to get hurt. This is too tough a job for one man. Let us help. I know Stefan had the right intentions. His heart was in the right place. But he didn't get it. The closer people got to the Phantom, the more danger they were in. And after the King's contest ended, I didn't know how to let people in anymore. Just let me do my job. My voice hardened to indicate this was a final note. I need to do this alone. Stefan scoffed. You're never alone, Ethan. You've got friends. And once you pull your head out of your ass and realize that, come find me. Stefan left. The door snapped shut behind him, echoing the strained intensity between us. As I removed the cloak, it crumpled on the floor in a heap. Looking at it now, there was more blood on it than I realized. Stefan could be right. I needed help. I knew that. Doing this by myself was impossible. I'd gotten caught how many times, nearly died just as often. But I wouldn't put my friends in the same situation I was in. I couldn't ask them to risk their lives for me. There was more at stake than my freedom. I refused to put theirs on the line. And I'd been wounded too deeply to let anyone get too close. Chapter 2 Emma There was something about the magic of Arcania University that seemed to make everything all right again, even when it wasn't. I hugged my books to my chest as I walked the snowy path to the university gates. It was cold for the first day of winter semester classes, and I was bundled up from head to toe. A heavy snowfall coated the gardens. Shifters were everywhere, romping in the snow and causing a scene, while sorceresses flung snowballs at each other with their illusion magic. The university's tall towers and beautiful architecture was glorious in the winter. Golden windows and illustrious sculptures appeared even more regal than usual in the delicate snowfall. A dragon shifter flew overhead and dropped a large snowball on a griffin. It exploded, sending snow everywhere. The griffin shook his feathers of snowflakes and told the dragon to piss off, but the shifter only hissed with laughter. I smiled wistfully as I watched a woven shifter chase a sorceress around playfully, but it faded in a matter of moments. Things had changed since the king's contest. Would anyone even want to be my friend anymore? The king's contest was over, but I hadn't put it behind me. Ethan would be preparing to take the throne right now if it wasn't for me. I'd been the reason we'd lost in the first place, and the reason Gabby and Elijah won the crown. I'd used unseely magic and harnessed the power of the Dark Necklace to cheat during the contest to save my mate. I was the one who'd made us lose. My greatest fear was Ethan would never forgive me for it, that he'd always resent me. But in the back of my mind, I worried, too, that my friends wouldn't either. Yet there had been no choice. Milana, my goddess, the one I'd sworn myself to, had sent the hag to me to tell me Ethan wouldn't survive the contest if I didn't use the necklace. I wouldn't risk Ethan's death for anything, and the hag had promised that Ethan would be king in the end. I guess she must have lied, because the kingship was out of Ethan's reach forever. There was also the prophecy the hag had given. She told me I was the world weaver, and it would be me who would lead the Arcania into a new age before my untimely death four winters from now. Three, once this winter ended, I still didn't know what it all meant. All these rationalizations did me no good. No matter how many sleepless nights I'd spent contemplating if I'd made a mistake, I never got an answer. And I couldn't get past the guilt. 
Everything in my life had upended in a few months. Less than half a year ago, I didn't know magic was real or that shifters existed and I was descended from a group of noble fae. I didn't know anything, had struggled in all my classes and barely harnessed my powers. Then I'd been forced into a deadly contest where I'd almost lost my life. And almost lost the man I loved. My stomach clenched. I couldn't think about that. It was out of bounds. Remember your deal with Gabby. If I wanted Ethan alive, I had to keep my distance. I coughed a few times and let out a sniffling noise. I'd had trouble breathing for three days. The air felt thick and heavy in my lungs, and I had a cough that wouldn't go away. Though I didn't have a cold or the flu, my body felt hot, and chills ran up and down my skin every so often. Every step felt like walking a mile. I'd felt sick all break. It was obvious my condition was worsening yet again, and it was exhausting to admit. That, above all, was far harder to get accustomed to. Believing in things like dragons and alicorns? Easy. Accepting that I had an illness that was deteriorating me from the inside out? Impossible. Fuck common variable immune deficiency disorder. I hated having a primary immune disease. It made everything ten times harder. I wrapped my scarf tighter around my throat. The dark scars around my neck from using unsealing magic had faded, but it was like I could still feel the aftershock. Several nights over break, I'd woken up from fitful nightmares, though every time my eyes opened I could never remember what they were about. The warmth of the university pressed in all around me as I stepped into the grand entryway. It was a big room, one of my favorites in the palace, where large portraits of former Arcania royals hung. There were a variety of chairs and couches spread out in circles around the room for people to converse. A warm fire was crackling in the marble hearth. Students were gathered around it in their uniforms, laughing and talking. A girl was sitting on a guy's lap in one of the armchairs that surrounded the fire. She flung her arms around his neck and laughed before he kissed her. My heart wept at the sight. Since I'd discovered Ethan was my true mate, I'd felt incredibly lonely. And there was no more romantic place than Arcania University, where romance was everywhere. Your main job as a fae was to hook up with the love of your life and express it for all to see. But I couldn't do that because things were just too complicated between Ethan and I. I didn't think he'd ever let me in. As I came to the end of the grand entryway, my eyes fell upon an unwelcome sight, and I felt like vomiting. Gabby and Elijah were making out and they sure as hell didn't care who watched. She had a leg hitched around his hip while he palmed her ass, shoving his tongue down her throat. The edge of her skirt was rising up past her thigh. Her sweater was falling off her shoulder as she continued to swap spit with the ugly asshole. Elijah had a large scar across his face now from when he'd battled Ethan in the King's Contest. It only made him more disgusting. By the gods, they were going to be king and queen. Couldn't they get it together? Looked like they were using the titles as an excuse to act however they wanted in public. As I walked by, Gabby's eyes opened. She pulled her mouth away from Elijah's and gave him a soft smile. He nodded, almost evilly, as she strode away from him. My heartbeat increased as I realized Gabby was following me down the hallway. As we came to an isolated corridor, it was clear she wasn't letting up. I held my breath and turned around. You can quit stalking me. It's more than a little creepy. Gabby smirked. I wasn't sure you'd come back to school, but here you are. My mouth thinned. I thought about abandoning school and going back to Detroit because I was too humiliated to show my face around here again. But I'd considered Ethan and decided that wasn't an option. Why are you here? I spat. Tell me what you want. I've got class. Gabby wrinkled her nose. Is that any way to talk to your future queen? You're no queen of mine, I growled through clenched teeth. Gabby rolled her eyes. Whatever, Sosna. I don't need your allegiance. I need you to do as you're told. My stomach dropped. Of course, our deal. I'm not going to be queen anymore. The bargain's off. <laughs> like hell. Gabby made a scoffing noise. We hid an agreement, Sosna. You do what I say or I leak your fiancé's little secret to the Arcania Alliance. My mouth soured. Gabby and Elijah had information that Ethan was the Phantom. 
What was more, so did the Black Claw. Gabby and Elijah might have the Black Claw in their hand, but Ethan's identity would remain safe, so as long as I was Gabby's little errand girl. What do you want with me? You're the one in charge now. I don't have any power, I said. Your mate has been causing a lot of trouble for the Black Claw in recent weeks. Gabby's eyes narrowed. He's attempting to find the hideout of the cult and destroy it, and we can't have that happen. My shoulders dropped. What do you want me to do? Stop him, of course, Gabby said, as if it was obvious and I was stupid. How do you want me to do that? You made it clear I can't tell him what I know, I hissed. Gabby rolled her eyes. I don't know. Get creative. My heart pounded against my chest. She wanted me to stop the Phantom from harassing the Black Claw while keeping it secret I knew his identity? This is near impossible. Find a way. Gabby inspected her nails like she was bored. Ethan's become a problem. Either deal with him yourself or I'll find a way to take care of him permanently. My blood ran cold. I knew Gabby would make good on her threat. She and Elijah had killed Professor Waldron last semester to get an edge in the King's Contest. There's nothing she and her vicious mate wouldn't do to retain power now that they had it. I gave a furious sigh. I knew the only reason Gabby hadn't opened her fat mouth and landed Ethan in jail was because she asked me to do shit for her. She didn't have a hold on me without that bargaining chip. Before I agree to do this, you need to tell me something, I began. You're not in a position to be making demands, Gabby reminded me with a cold stare. Hear me out. I took a breath. How was I going to ask Gabby this without giving everything away? The Black Claw wants my blood. They need to use it for something. Because you're the World Weaver? Gabby asked. I felt the blood drain from my face. Gabby gave a cruel laugh and said, The Black Claw has told me everything, Sosna. They want your blood so they can raise Droga and bring the unseelie descendants back to power. Gabby huffed. They're fucking stupid. Anyone who looks at you knows you're the weakest fae ever to walk the earth. There's no power in your blood. I felt my skin boil with heat as she said that. She was a liar. I had defeated her in our duel in the King's Contest without using dark magic. That's why she was so scared of me, and why she was going to such great lengths to keep me in line. I was a threat to her. But... Gabby continued. The Black Claw agreed to follow Elijah and I because I told them I'd hand you over at the proper time for the invoking ceremony. I don't believe you have the ability to raise Droga, but if you do, that's all the better for us. We've sworn ourselves to the Dark God. Droga will help us retain power. When is it? I snapped. Why haven't they done it already? Droga can only be raised on a certain day, on a certain time. It's still a long way off. Gabby waved her hand. Don't worry your pretty little red head about it. Gabby wasn't going to give me specifics about the invoking ceremony to prevent me from finding a way out of it. At least I knew I was safe from being killed, until then. So you're going to wait for this day just so you can hand me over? I don't know the details, Gabby said with a yawn. In the meantime, the Black Claw has promised to let you be. You're under my protection. That is, if you do as you're told. My fingernails dug into the books against my chest. Fine, I'll keep Ethan busy. Good girl, Gabby cooed. This little arrangement might work after all. I should kill her. The thought came sharply into my mind as I watched Gabby's perfect curls bounce on her shoulders her ass swinging in an arrogant way as she left me behind. As I mulled the thought over to kill Gabby, I realized that wasn't an option. If I tried to hurt Gabby and failed, I was royally fucked. If I managed to succeed, I was still fucked. I wouldn't get away with it. My reputation was tarnished now that I cheated in the contest, and as Gabby's rival, I'd be the first person the Arcania Alliance would suspect. I'd be thrown in jail and scheduled for execution without a fair trial. Even if I made it look like an accident, people would find out the truth. She was to be the future queen. The Arcania wouldn't let her death go. As I headed on my way to the dormitory hall, my insides felt constricted. 
How could I have agreed to this deal? I was going against my own mate. All sorts of emotions came up when I thought of Ethan. Pain, loss, sorrow, undying passion, feverish love, and a need to protect and defend what was mine. There was no denying it. I loved Ethan, and though I still didn't understand that love, I knew it was something worth dying for. Ethan was kind and good and sweet. He'd never do anything to hurt me. He cared for me, no matter how much he tried to hide it. And yet, there was one thing I still held against him. Ethan was the Phantom, and he'd never told me. He'd never uttered a damn word. We took a sacred vow at our choosing ceremony last year to be mates forever, and he was still keeping it a secret he was a vigilante in disguise. I had to find out from Gabby he was more than he claimed to be. He was also hiding the fact he knew we were fated mates. Ethan wasn't stupid. Shifters knew when they bonded, and I damn well was certain he'd figured out we were destined to be together long before I did. But he'd played it off last semester like we didn't have a magical bond, as if agreeing to be my mate was a last option, an arrangement of convenience instead of one of love. It had to do with him hiding that he was the Phantom, but that he felt he couldn't tell me something this crucial hurt. I didn't know if he trusted me, but how could he after what I did? I squared my shoulders. What's done is done. I had to forgive myself for my choices in the contest. Feeling guilty about it wasn't going to help me now, and it certainly wouldn't stop Elijah and Gabby. My dorm felt like a safe and familiar refuge from Gabby's harsh stare. I tossed my books on the desk and flopped down on the four-poster bed in relief. My stomach growled. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten this morning, and class was in half an hour. There was no time to run to the cafeteria to grab something. I changed into my uniform before I groaned and walked to the mini-fridge. I didn't expect there to be anything inside except my plasma medication. I'd cleaned it out before break, but still, maybe there was a smoothie or something I'd forgotten about last semester that could ease the hunger pains. When I opened the fridge door, my eyes widened. On the shelf was a gray striped box wrapped with an intricate teal bow. Inside were four small tarts frosted with powdered sugar. It was those cherry pastries I liked from my favorite bakery in Dolinska. How'd they get in here? I feared they were deposited by Gabby, maybe poisoned. Then I noticed there was a tiny sticker on the side of the box that said the tarts were gluten-free. A softness swelled over my chest. People with CVID often developed digestive issues. A rule of having an immune problem meant that if your immune system wasn't working, that meant everything else went to shit too. Over break, I'd started breaking out in hives whenever I ate anything with wheat or gluten in it. That was before I'd begun throwing up. All my life, I'd eaten bread, but now it had a tendency to make me sick. I'd changed my diet over break, so I avoided anything that wasn't gluten-free, which sucked because hardly anything in Melovia was. I hadn't told anyone yet, except my mom, because it was one more thing that made me different. Not to mention made it inconvenient as hell for people to eat with me. But whoever had put these pastries here knew. I decided I didn't care if they were poisoned because I was starving and dove in. Heaven rose in my taste buds as I devoured the flaky crust. I hadn't eaten anything resembling bread for weeks. Jelly splashed upon my tongue and gave a sweet yet sour taste. I nearly cried with happiness. They were just the thing to perk my spirits up. The cherry pastries were charmed with a cuteness illusion. The surrounding colors tinted to shades of pink and red. As I walked to class, I saw little hearts rise above the heads of students walking by and pop, making squealing sounds. The air seemed fizzy and bubbling, like the world was dunked in a creamy soda. I felt like I was floating on air as I strode through the hallways of the university. I wondered if this was what Odette felt like 24-7. The illusion instantly faded when I walked into Lady Corva's classroom. She'd put a ward on it to prevent any students from using spells to cheat. She was the only teacher that had done so. She didn't trust her students. I didn't even think she liked them. Gabby and her clones, Morgan and Melissa, were at the front of the classroom heckling. I ignored them and went to my usual spot in the back. My heart contracted when I saw Kiara. She had her nose buried in a book and didn't look up as I approached. 
Her black curls were wild around her head, only contained by a small headband, and her yellow tie was loose. Kiara hadn't spoken to me since the king's contest before we'd lost the crown. I feared I'd lost her friendship. I slid into the seat beside her. Hey, I whispered quietly. Kiara put the book down. Hey, she didn't say anything more, so the silence was pregnant and awkward. I wasn't a person for small talk, so I got right to the point. Are you mad at me? Gabby let out a particularly annoying cackle. Kiara's eyes drifted to her before they settled back on me. No, but I am disappointed. That was worse. I'm sorry I used the necklace. You don't know how much I regret it. Kiara sighed softly. You did what you thought was best. I know you were trying to save Ethan's life. I don't agree, but I understand. Let's move on and forget about it. She gave me a kind smile and placed a hand on mine. Relief coursed through my heart. I was so relieved. Kiara was one of my closest friends. I couldn't stand to lose her. Enough mindless chatter, Lady Carva barked as she strolled into the room. The conversation died down instantly. One girl dared to give a girly giggle, but when Corva rounded her dagger-like gaze on her, the alicorn shrunk down in her seat. Lady Corva crossed her arms and scowled. This is your second semester of first-year illusion. Seeing as how so many of you girls struggled to pass your exams, I expect you to pay attention this time around. Anyone who I deem not proficient will cease to move on to their next year of university. Jeez, I thought she'd be in a better mood now that her son was going to be the future king, but I guess fucking not. You could paint this woman's ass gold and stud it with diamonds, and she still wouldn't be happy. Lady Corva snapped her fingers. Continuing our theme from last semester, we will begin by working on casting illusions on ourselves. For your first lesson, you must learn to transform the sound of your voice. We'd already learned how to change our appearances last semester. I had strained to change the color of my eyes, and now I turned them and the color of my hair with ease, though I still struggled to hold facial features for longer than a few moments. Changing your voice sounded difficult, but Corva expected us to keep up because she cried. Manipulating your voice is a trick on the ears, not the eyes. If you get it right, you'll be able to hold the spell for as long as you please. This illusion is useful in matters of deceit. That made sense. The Fae were notorious tricksters. Disguising your voice was very useful for going undetected and deceiving unknowing foes. To cast the illusion, imagine your voice as a collection of notes, Corva said. You raise or lower the pitch to create a completely new sound. Think of it as tampering with the volume of a song rather than creating a new one. Those of you more musically inclined will have an easier time with this magic. Begin. Kiara and I faced each other. She cleared her throat before she waved a hand over her face. How do I sound? A little higher, but that's all, I told her. I barely noticed a difference. Kiara made a face and tried again. How about now? I almost fell out of my seat with laughter. You sound like a fucking tuba. Ha uh ha, -huh. Kiara said. Her voice returned to normal as she said, You try it then. Okay. I took a deep breath, then waved a hand over my face as I cast the illusion. Illusions, at their base, were intention. I'd taken choir in high school, and although I had no idea how to read notes, I wasn't entirely tone deaf. I pictured my voice in my head on a level with different pitches that went up or down. I imagined dropping my pitch while raising notes on a few particular syllables like editing a song on a computer. Did I do it? I clapped my hand over my mouth when I realized that my voice came out sounding strange. Holy crap, it worked! You sound beautiful, Emma, Kiara praised. Do it again. What do you want me to say? I asked, but my voice hadn't gone back to normal. My eyes widened and a huge smile bloomed across Kiara's face. You've definitely got it, Kiara said. Teach me, I want to know. As Kiara and I worked, Corva ran about the room, shouting at girls that their voices were all wrong. Her lip curled when she'd seen that I'd gotten a handle on the spell, but I was certain by the smoldering look in her gaze there was something else she wanted to talk to me about. 
Shut your babbling trap, Helena. You sound like a deranged seal, Corva yelled at the alleycorn girl who'd giggled earlier. Tears beaded in Helena's eyes, and she didn't try casting the illusion again. Revulsion for Lady Corva curled up inside me. I didn't know how this woman was still allowed to teach at the university. She had a degree in emotional abuse. It took Kiara the rest of the class to learn how to disguise her voice, but by the end, she'd done it. I was able to hold the illusion without any effort at all for the entire time, though when I tried to practice other things, like changing my nose, it didn't last for long. It looked like I was better with casting illusions on things that were unseen rather than things one could witness. I'd grown a lot since I first arrived at Arcania University. I was proud of myself. Ever since the King's Contest, I'd been practicing every day with my magic, and it was like my powers were unbound. I was happy that I didn't have to struggle so much anymore, at least. I packed my things into my bag. I could feel Lady Corva's eyes burning through me as Kiara and I made our way to the door. Most of the class had already cleared out, and I wanted to get out of here before- Miss Sosna, I need a moment with you. Alone. I cringed as Lady Corva called me as my hand was on the doorknob. I hesitated. I looked to Kiara, begging her not to leave me alone with this crazy woman. Kiara's gaze was sorry. I'll be right outside the door, she whispered before she ducked out, leaving Lady Corva and I alone. I swallowed and turned to face Corva. Her heel was tapping on the floor. Yes, Lady Corva? Corva wrinkled her nose. There's no need to play coy. I know it was you and your little friends who snuck into my office and stole the necklace from me. I gaped. A shudder ran up my spine as Corva ventured closer. If I had known you'd taken my necklace before your entry into the king's contest, you would have never competed. The fact that you used dark magic to cheat your way to the crowd is highly dishonorable. It borders on the edge of being unforgivable. I remained silent and Corva pressed closer. That necklace was a priceless heirloom passed down through my family for generations, Corva spat, and now it's been confiscated by the state because you couldn't keep your filthy hands off of it. I stilled. The necklace was an heirloom, but it had dark magic in it. Did that mean Elijah had unseelie blood? I knew Elijah was in with the Black Claw, but that didn't mean he was descended from Dark Fay, right? I wasn't sure. Anything was possible at this school. Whenever one secret came out, another took its place, and they were hardly ever in my favor. Corva didn't notice my reaction and kept ranting. You're lucky I didn't have you arrested for breaking and entering into my home. Then why didn't you? I spat back. I wasn't going to sit here and take this from her. Lady Corva paused, and I knew the answer instinctively. She hadn't turned me in because no matter what she said about the necklace being an heirloom, she wasn't supposed to have it. I care about the welfare of my students, she flung out. Making one mistake doesn't mean you can't be steered on the right path. You are new to the Arcania ways. It's only to be expected you'll make mistakes. I suppressed a snort. Yeah, right. She didn't give a shit about me or anyone she taught. She was just covering her own ass. My eyes flickered to the crystals lining the shelves of the classroom. I'd noticed them my first day here and hadn't thought anything of them because I didn't know anything about Arcanian society then. But now I knew that crystals were regarded as dark magic and forbidden by Fae to use. So why was Corva putting these on display? Corva caught my suspicious expression and said, confiscated items from disobedient students like yourself. They're there to serve as a reminder of things that can get you expelled. I'm sure. Gods, I knew I sounded snotty, but I couldn't help it. This woman was hiding something. Lady Magdalena needed to put her in line. Why was she allowed to get away with everything? If any other teacher had crystals in their classroom, they'd be fired. And yet Corva got a free pass? Why? Corva's eyes flashed red at my tone. Miss Sosna, let me make one thing very clear. Corva's lips tightened. If you ever steal from me again, I will make you wish you'd never been born. 
I barely controlled my rage. I balled my hands into fists and managed to force out, Yes, Lady Corva. She drew herself up and tossed her nose into the air. Good, you are dismissed. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. Kiara was stunned as I slammed the door to Corva's classroom behind me. I heard everything, Kiara said. I knew we shouldn't have gotten mixed up in this. Yeah, well, too late now, I said in irritation. I only wish there was a way to get Corva back for bullying me. You heard her. We can't mess with Lady Corva again. She'll make you pay. Kiara worried as we descended the tower steps. She can do her worst. I was in a tough situation with Gabby. She was threatening Ethan's life, and nothing was worse than that. What could Lady Corva do to me? I almost wished I was a guy so I could take first-year illusions with Professor Kaschak instead. It sucked how so many classes were sorted by either shifters or sorceresses at Arcania University. But at the same time, I didn't think I'd learn as much. Shifters were only required to take two years of illusion classes, while sorceresses had to take four, as female Arcania had stronger magic. Professor Kaschak wasn't as good as illusions as Lady Corva was, but maybe being weaker would be a decent trade-off for not getting yelled at all the time. Come on. Kiara said. The other girls are waiting. Kiara and I walked to a sitting room inside the main castle. My heart warmed as I saw Odette and Delmer. Odette was wearing this beautiful dress. She'd cast an illusion on it so the colors changed every few seconds, blending from pink to purple and then to blue. It glowed with a soft light and sparkled, like the radiance of the northern lights. Over the top of the dress was a fluffy white cape that suited her personality perfectly. Her large glasses perched on her nose, and her light blonde curls were tied back by a tiny bow. She was playing music from her phone, twirling around to it and singing in a light voice. Delmer had her uniform on, but her eyeliner was thicker than usual, and she was wearing these black lace gloves that complemented her personality. She moved red orbs around the room in a circle, practicing her battle magic that was a talent of the dragon faction. Delmer's smile brightened as she saw us coming. The battle orbs faded, and she reached for a tray of takeout coffees on the table. Coffee from Siona's shop, Delmer said as she handed me a cup. Figured you'd need something to warm you up on this cold day. Peppermint tea latte, just how you like it. I took a sip, and a minty taste spread across my tongue. Thanks, Mayor. You're a lifesaver. No problem. A cinnamon eggnog cappuccino for Kiara and a hot cocoa with sprinkles for you, Odette, Delmer finished as she gave Odette her cup. She sipped at her own coffee, which I was certain was black. What did you guys do over break? I asked, settling into one of the cozy armchairs by the fire. Odette sat on my lap. She giggled as she drank her cocoa. I didn't mind. Personally, I felt so relieved. My friends were acting like nothing had happened. I'd worried all break they wouldn't want to talk to me again, yet they were acting like this was just another day. As long as I still had them, I didn't care what the rest of the Fae thought. My friends were the only ones that mattered. I was in Russia at a ballet training camp, Odette sang. I practiced for 12 hours a day. All break? I asked. I tilted my head. That was a strenuous schedule even for a professional athlete. Yep, Odette peeped. Mother thought it was best. Delmer scowled like she didn't agree. But Kiara changed the subject and said, Siona and I went to South Africa to visit my parents. How about you, Delmer? If possible, Delmer's frown sunk lower. My mom was gone most of the time, but let's not talk about it. I bet Poland was amazing, huh, Em? Delmer's sour mood threw me off, but I said, Uh, yeah, Krakow was beautiful. I wish I had more time to enjoy it. I'd had to rest a lot in the hotel room in Krakow because I hadn't been feeling well. But I didn't tell my friends yet. They still didn't know I was sick, and it still didn't feel like the right time to come out to them about it. Ethan was the only person in our friend group I'd told. I was worried they'd treat me differently once they found out I had a disease. Though I couldn't conceal it much longer, I was getting worse by the day. Delmer settled into her chair. I think we have to get down to brass tacks, ladies. A lot went down at the ball and the king's contest last month. So, what are we doing about it? 
Yara got up to close the door to the parlor room. I lowered my voice and said, The plan hasn't changed. We need to keep quiet. Bull, Dalmere snapped. We overheard Gabby and Elijah confess to killing Professor Waldron. Even without evidence, if we tell the Arcania Alliance they did it, it might be enough to convince the Circle to take away Gabby and Elijah's win. The Circle was Malovia's governing force, second only to the authority of the King and Queen. But I was wary about going to them. That's not going to work. Lady Corva is in the Circle. She'll do anything to get her son off a murder charge. Most likely it'll come back on us, I said. At least we need to tell Ethan, Odette said. He's Elijah's biggest rival. I clutched my tea. I know, but I don't think we can. Why not? We agreed not to say anything to the boys until the king's contest was over, and, well, it's over, Yara said. What's holding us back? I held my breath. I'd told everyone that Gabby had been threatening me, though I didn't quite explain why. The girls didn't know Ethan was the phantom, but maybe I could trust them with the bare bones of what I knew. I had to tell someone. I couldn't carry this burden on my own. So to keep Ethan safe, I'd just modify the facts. We can't tell anyone about the murder because Gabby knows we overheard her. I started. She cornered me this morning. She told me if we turn her in for Professor Waldron's death, she'll kill Ethan. The girls let out outraged gasps. Odette's hand covered her mouth. Kiara asked, Are you serious? That frickin' bitch. Delmere cursed under her breath. Yes, I said. She isn't kidding around. She can't touch Ethan. Even though he lost, he's still the Prince Regent, Odette cried. She has power, though, Kiara mused. And now that she's going to be future queen, she could get away with it. So we're just going to have to keep lying to the boys? Odette whined. This doesn't seem fair. I took a heavy breath. It's not fair. But the more the boys know, the more danger they're in. We have to keep this between ourselves. At least until we find a way to deal with Gabby. And you guys can't tell Ethan she bullied me like this. He'll lose his fucking mind. Odette and Kiara nodded in unison. Delmer made a scoffing noise. That's putting it lightly. You tell Ethan that Gabby threatened you. He is going to tear this palace down to get to her. That boy cannot control his temper when it comes to you. Exactly. He'll make a scene and it'll land us in even hotter water. So this stays between us. Promise? I asked. Promise, the girls said in unison. We pinky swore, because really, that was a magic in itself that nothing should break. To seal the deal. I have to go, Kiara said, looking at her phone. I have class in a half hour. We'll walk with you. The three of us followed Kiara, though Odette more or less waltzed, out of the parlor room and into the hallway. We dropped Kiara off at her class and decided to hang out in the rec room. I didn't have another class until that afternoon, so I had some time to kill. Delmera, Odette, and I spent our time until lunch having an air hockey tournament until we got hungry enough to grab a quick bite from the cafeteria around 11. Stefan and Theo were there, getting takeout. Though they didn't stop to say hi, both of them waved. Odette had the nerve to blow a kiss to Theo and his cheeks turned pink. By the gods, what was I going to do with this girl? Stefan winked at Delmer as we passed. Delmer ducked her head and looked away. Stefan frowned, seemingly embarrassed. What's the deal with you? I asked as we moved through the lunch line. I piled shrimp cocktail high on my plate as I said, you could at least acknowledge he's alive. I already told you, I don't need a guy, Delmer said. I just need space. I don't think an Arcania in the existence of ever had said that until Delmer. Why are you avoiding him? He's into you. Delmer gave an obnoxious noise. I'm not into him. You're a liar. I fucking knew that Delmer liked Stefan. She had a crush on him, at least. That much had been obvious at the King's Ball last year. I couldn't figure out why she was pushing him away. Delmer blushed, but she rearranged her features and said, You're looking too far into it. He could be your mate, I offered. Why don't you give him a chance? Secretly, I was a bit jealous. If Delmer and Stefan were mates, they could tell each other. They could show their affection without all this stuff hanging over their heads like Ethan and I. 
Their love wouldn't have to be a performance put on for the entertainment of other people. I'm not ready to have a mate. I like my privacy, she said. Why can't you go on one date with him? It's not going to kill you, and I know you'll have fun, I said. Delmere rolled her eyes. Trust me, Em, I'm better off alone. It's what I deserve. Before I could say another word, Delmere hurried off, leaving her food behind. A pit grew in my stomach as Delmere drew farther and farther away. I wouldn't care if Delmere wanted to be single if that's what she truly desired, but I didn't think it was that way. Something in my gut told me she wanted to be with Stefan, but she didn't think she was worthy of him. What's with her? Odette asked. The only things on her tray was a slice of cake, a cup of ice cream, and a couple of brownies. So healthy. I have no idea. I shook my head. I wish I could get through to Delmere somehow, but her walls were so high, I didn't know how to break them down. Odette gabbed all throughout lunch about ballet camp while I played with my food listlessly. My stomach kind of hurt, and it made it hard to eat. I'd been looking around all day for Ethan, and I hadn't seen him yet. I didn't know if he was purposefully avoiding me or what. Odette twirled a blonde strand around her finger. What's wrong, Emma? You seem rather gloomy. I looked up from the remnants of my meal. I'm just worried about facing Ethan, I confessed. What if he hates me? He doesn't hate you. He never could, Odette said innocently. He loves you. I know, I thought. But would love be enough? My actions had cost him his dream. If he's still mad, just show him the goods. Odette cupped her boobs and wiggled her eyebrows suggestively. I laughed out loud. Odette. Ethan isn't going to magically stop being angry at me because I took my shirt off and flashed in my breasts, I cracked. He might. Boobs create peace. Boobs change the world, Odette insisted. Men can't resist their power. Try it once. I think not. Though it'd be hilarious to see. The thought of Ethan's jaw dropping open once I ripped my bra off and let my tits fly was enough to send me spiraling into a fit of giggles all over again. That's the spirit. Odette got up and patted me on the shoulder. Theo and I are bustling off to ballet, but don't you let your hopes fall. Your Prince Charming has forgiven you, I'm sure. A slight smile crossed my face as Odette skipped away. Odette had such a positive way of looking at things. I wished I could be like her. Things still felt heavy as I left the lunchroom. There was too much on my mind. Gabby, Lady Corva, Delmare, Ethan. I couldn't sit here by myself for hours and ponder it all. I had to clear my head before I went fucking nuts. The only place that made me feel better anymore was the ice. All my problems faded away at the rink. Nothing in the outside world mattered, so long as I was out there. It was like the boards around the arena created a barrier, a wall that kept all the bad things out and me in. I just needed to go for a skate to take my mind off things. Lady Magdalena insisted I take a few weeks off for recovery after the King's Contest but I hadn't skated since, and I was dying to lace up my skates. A quick practice would do me good, and I didn't have class until one o'clock. There wasn't much time to skate, but it didn't matter. The familiar feeling of freedom came over me as I performed every jump and spin with ease. I fell a few times on some of my triples, but after a consistent effort, I got them back. I was pleased to see I hadn't lost anything over break. Lady Magdalena would be satisfied with my progress. After some time on the ice, I felt a lot better and my head was clear. The empty locker room was friendly and kind as I changed back into my uniform. It felt familiar, normal. Nothing ever felt normal these days. I wished I could stay in the rink forever, where it was safe, but at some point I had to return to reality. I swung my cloak around me, dreading the long walk back to campus. As I entered the arena's lobby, shivers encompassed my body from head to toe. A man was standing by the sliding glass doors, checking his phone. His shoulders were broad and his dark hair was messy. Even through the sleeves of his shirt I could see the corded muscle. He stood tall and straight, his chiseled and perfect face set in a serious countenance. He was only a few feet away, and that distance seemed cruel and taunting. I was sensitive to his very presence now. Just the sight of him sent butterflies rushing through my stomach and wetness seeping through my panties. Those eyes, God, those amber eyes. They were wolf eyes, one of a hunter, an alpha. 
I could fall into them forever and be happy about it. I wanted him to chase me, and I wanted him to catch me too, because I desired to know what he'd do to me after. The amber eyes looked up and landed on my form. His entire figure froze as his gaze roamed me up and down, mentally undressing me with his eyes. Standing across from me, and looking hot as all hell in his hockey jersey, was the one man I was terrified to see. Chapter 3 Ethan Of course we'd run into each other at the rink. We both had practice here. Seeing Emma for the first time since the King's contest broke me. I'd had so much longing for her that I nearly collapsed at her feet. I caught her scent as it wafted off her red hair, and my heart pumped wildly. She came to an abrupt stop in front of me, her wide green eyes roaming over my form in both fear and hunger. There was anger there, too. It hadn't faded. I wanted to be free of it, but still, I had resentment. I didn't want to be that way toward her. I had to be a gentleman and remain in control. Hi, Emma started. Her voice sounded small and meek. Hi, I responded. Gods, could we do something else besides stand here and stare at each other? It was awkward. Not to mention there was a heat creeping over my skin that made me want to shed my clothes. And fuck, this was an ice rink for the gods' sake. What are you doing here? Emma tried to make small talk, but she wasn't very good at it. Her eyes ripped from mine and glued to my shoes. I had a meeting for the hockey team, I said. It was a luncheon to get the season kicked off. Oh, she hugged her bag closer. I just came for a break. I knew the feeling. How was Poland? I didn't bring up that I hadn't called. I was sick a lot. Don't tell anyone else. I said I had a great time. Her voice was deadened, but honest. The pit in my stomach twisted. I'm sorry to hear that. My Christmas was full of pompous royal affairs. It wasn't anything to miss. She grimaced. Ethan, I... You don't need to apologize. What's done is done, I said. It's time we moved on from it. She dared to lift her gaze. So what happens now? I blinked at her. What? Do you mean between us? She wrinkled her nose. Yeah, that would be nice to know. A hint of her familiar sarcasm came through, and it made me feel relieved. She was acting like her sassy self again, instead of being apologetic. I could treat her as an equal now and stop lording this power over her I didn't want. We declared that we're mates. I presume we're together, I began. She scoffed and rolled her eyes. I hardly want to date you for diplomacy's sake. It's not like that, I rushed to say. I like you, Emma. Really, I do. Her eyes challenged me with a statement that clearly spoke volumes. She didn't say anything, but I could almost hear her thoughts. You like me? But do you love me? What about you? I flung at her before she could accuse me of anything. We had that moment in the tent. Then you acted like you wanted nothing to do with me after. Have your feelings changed since then? Not whatsoever, she bit back, and her cheeks reddened. I said I wanted to take it slow, that I didn't want to rush into anything. You should have thought of that before you agreed to be my partner for the king's... I know, I know. She took a deep breath, on the verge of exploding. Can we move past this stupid contest already? I don't understand what's going on with us, Ethan. I knew you were upset with me, but you didn't pick up the phone all break. You never even checked in. How am I supposed to believe you want to be with me when you ghost me for weeks on end? I was busy, I said. Doing what? Her voice was flat. The way her expression burned made me freeze. She was implying that she knew something. I gave a heavy sigh. It doesn't matter what I was doing. I, I know it isn't an excuse. I should always make time for you. Damn straight you should, if you really want to do this. For God's sake, Emma. We were making a scene. There was no one at the ice rink this time of day, but still, I didn't want a random paparazzi to walk by and snap a photo of me 
the prince regent, getting into an argument with his fiancée in broad daylight. I grabbed Emma by the arm and hauled her down the hall to a nearby locker room. She didn't complain, just sent me a nasty look. As the door shut behind us, I whirled on her. Both of our bags fell to the floor. Let me make one thing clear, I said. I took my vow seriously. I am bound to you now in every way, shape, and form. It doesn't forgive me for ignoring you, but I'm not walking out on us. That's news to me, she hissed. If I had a boyfriend or a fiancé or whatever, it sure as hell didn't feel like it when I was on vacation. I barely knew what the hell we were. You didn't reach out to me either, I spat bitterly. That doesn't mean I didn't want to. I was just trying to give you time. She fisted a hand in her fiery locks. Gods, Ethan, you're so fucking stubborn. I'm stubborn. Yes, you're a pig-headed brute. She shoved me backward, or tried to. Her hands hit my broad chest, but stopped there. Moving me was like pushing over a boulder. All her touch did was make my skin grow hotter. I desired to rip all her clothes off right here, right now. I snagged her arms and held them tight. You need to settle down. Fuck you, Ethan Nowak, she spat. I did the only thing that could quiet the rage pulsing through my blood and kissed her. Emma made an angry sound of protest, but it melted away when I forced my tongue inside her mouth. Her body softened immediately, and my hands roamed over her back. The wolf in me whimpered when I was able to touch her again. It was like drinking the nectar of the gods themselves. Emma's fever on my lips increased, and her honey-soft lips danced against mine like this was all she'd wanted from me for days on end. The kiss wasn't enough. Both of us wanted, needed more. I hastened the tempo of my tongue against hers, and we kissed until both of us were dizzy and couldn't breathe. Emma slipped off her jacket. Before I knew what the hell was happening, she'd pulled her shirt off and tossed it to the floor, exposing her navy-colored bra. I automatically reached out and felt her breasts through it, and she gave a slight moan of satisfaction. Without a word, Emma jumped on me, and I hitched her thighs around my hips. Her legs wrapped around my middle as I supported her, pushing her body against my abs. My hands kneaded her backside as we hit the wall. She shoved her hand downward, refusing to remove her mouth from mine. I gasped when her fingers clenched the outside of my pants. Pleasure flooded and welled straight at the core of my manhood, and it was the most gratifying thing I'd ever experienced. I couldn't think. I could hardly move except to continue to assault her lips over and over. Gods, we had no fucking reserve. It was like we were crazed. Just when Emma gave another squeeze to my cock, and I was certain it was going to rip through my pants, there was a loud bang in the hallway. Both of us jumped. I suddenly realized we were in a very public place where anyone could walk in at any moment. Emma shimmied down my body, and I sprang to the other side of the room. As we were still breathing hard, I picked up Emma's shirt and threw it at her. Put your clothes back on. Don't tell me what to do, she snapped back, but she slipped it on. Her hair was messy, and there was a pink tinge to her cheeks that hadn't been there before. As she zipped up her jacket, I said, We need to go. I have class. So do I. Both of us grabbed our bags and hurried out the door. We left the ice rink as soon as possible and started down the path to school. What the hell was that? Emma bit. She shivered at the snowfall that was beginning to increase. Don't ask me. I had no idea what came over us. One minute she was going to make me lose my mind. The next, she made me want to lose my self-control. I was no longer all that angry with her. Emma was a complex being. Emma shivered. She wrapped her arms around herself as we walked against the wind. Our bags banged together as she drew closer. You cold? I asked looking down. Emma's teeth were chattering. The chill doesn't bother me. She was a liar. I draped an arm around her and pulled her close into my shifter warmth. There. Better? She took a deep sigh and nestled her hand into my jersey. A bit. Hmm. My tone implied I didn't believe her. She was no longer shivering. I guess I'm not telling you the truth. People with primary immune conditions can be hypersensitive to extreme temperatures. Don't worry. 
You'll have me to keep you warm. I rubbed her arm and she relaxed against my torso. Emma said nothing more, just stared out into the white void ahead. I frowned. She was being distant again. I didn't know why. Apparently things were going to stay like this forever. We were either succumbing to lust or freezing each other out. It was like walking in a blazing desert and then being dumped into a harsh blizzard all in a matter of a few seconds. I didn't like that there was no in-between. There was passion and desire, but no intimacy. Chemistry and connection, but no trust. Even I knew relationships like that didn't last long. What class do you have? Emma asked, breaking the silence. Now? Faction abilities. I'm going to be late. Emma stiffened. Wait, with Professor Lunesta? Yes, I said, not sure where this was going. I'm in the same class, she said. Damn. We had it together. I didn't know whether to be happy or sad about it. I couldn't avoid her forever, and I wanted to be in Emma's presence. Yet, also, there was so much between us we needed to work out, and I had no idea where to start or even how to begin to sift through the mess. Not to mention I was still carrying a very, very big secret. Good. We can be partners, I finally said. They always pair people up by factions. At least I'll know someone, she said. My wolf bristled inside at the thought of Emma learning woven magic with some random shifter guy sharing thoughts and telekinesis magic. Never mind. I was certainly happy we'd been thrown together for this class, no matter how awkward it was. Was it possessive? I hardly gave a shit. Halfway back to campus, I noticed Emma's steps faltering. Her pace slowed, and her face paled. I was guessing anything she'd pushed herself too hard during practice. I'm fine, she said immediately when she caught me looking. It's not that long of a walk. I shook my head. I'll carry you the rest of the way. I handed her my bag and changed into a woven before she could protest. My gaze told her she didn't have the right to object. But I don't think she had the strength to, either. She balanced the bags over my shoulders, then gingerly clambered on. I quivered as her hands dug into my white fur, and we started off. Emma and I had to drop our bags off and change before we went to class. Because of that, we were late. Due to the weather, Faction Abilities was being held inside this semester. We came to a classroom that was more or less an open stone chamber with a high ceiling and stained glass windows. Professor Lunesta always dressed up for the first day of the new semester. She was wearing a long white cloak that glittered like snow and twigs were arranged strategically around her elaborate braid. Emma and I took our seats at a two-person desk near the back of the room. Our friends were also in this class. Odette waved next to Theo, and Alexei hung close to Chiara as she mouthed hello. Stefan was sitting by Delmare in the desk next to ours, and she didn't look happy. Her arms were crossed. She faced away from him as he made his usual dick jokes. I see many of you have already partnered up with someone from your own faction, Lunesta said approvingly. Good. This class will be less about lecturing and more about experimentation. As each of the factions has a different talent, it is up to you and your partner to examine how your unique powers work together to create illusion magic. Your grade will be determined by how much you participate. I will go around the room and observe as you and your partner practice. Begin. I turned to face Emma. I figured I'd help her with levitation, as that was a woven telepathy skill, and she'd fainted while trying it last semester. But I was shocked to see that she'd gotten on it. Our textbooks were hovering a foot off the table, guided by her lifted hand. When she moved her wrist, the books hovered in a circle. Emma watched without breaking a sweat. You've been practicing, I said in approval. I wanted to become more competent with levitation before I came back for the semester. Emma let the books fall and looked at me. How about we try telepathy? It's a basic woven power, I said. She snorted and put her elbows on the table. All right, so how do I do it? Let's start by listening. I leaned forward. 
I repeated a thought several times in my head, boring my eyes into hers. At first, nothing happened. I was pretty sure I was talking to myself until Emma jumped in her seat. Oh my gosh, I hear it. Don't talk with your mouth, I said. Use your mind. Focus your attention on trying to get me to hear you without actually speaking. The trick is to feel our connection and then follow that magical bond until our minds become linked. Emma closed her gorgeous lips. Her face strained as she struggled to communicate until I heard her voice come across, faint and distant. Can you hear me? Barely. We have a bad connection. You need to close the distance, I stated. How do I do that? Telepathy is all about being open. My heartbeat quickened as I reached out and took one of her hands in mine. You have to keep yourself exposed to the mind of the person you're attempting to speak with. She scowled, as if she didn't like the idea. Was it so offensive to open up to me? She took my other hand and ran her thumb over it. The sound of her voice grew louder as she said, Is this better? Much, I replied. All wolvens can speak telepathically over long distances, and companions can naturally project their thoughts in order to talk in shifter form. But those who have declared each other to be mates share a special bond. Watch. I opened my mind to her, and everything gave way. I flashed back to that morning, sneaking into Emma's dorm and leaving behind a present. It was you, she said. You're the one who left the pastries. A wry smile worked its way onto my face. It was supposed to remain a secret. How did you know I was gluten intolerant? Who told you? She questioned, crossing her arms. Your mother sent me a message. She thought it was important I know, since we're mated. I hadn't been formally introduced to Emma's mother yet, though she'd reached out to me over text to let me know how Emma was doing. I'd been informed that she was sick over break, and it'd been even harder to be mad at her after that. Hmm. Emma pursed her lips. Guess you weren't that angry with me after all. I chuckled. Guess not. Emma pulled her hair back into a braid. Could other Arcania see your memories like I can? I'm allowing you to because we're mated. If I didn't want you to see anything, I wouldn't have opened up and you couldn't have seen a thing. Mind reading is supposedly possible, but I've never heard of a fae who can do it, I said. You'd have to be exceptionally powerful, stronger than a high priestess. She nodded. What about monsters? Can they hear our thoughts? Some species, but mostly only in the case of demon possession, I specified. She leaned back in her chair. That's a real thing? Yes. Forest demons and other monsters have been known to possess the souls of Fae. The demon will latch on and stay hidden inside a person's spirit until it's gained enough control there to begin taking over the host entirely. Emma wrinkled her nose. That sounds... unpleasant? It's not pretty. Though possessions have to be asked for, I said. Like any other type of fae, a forest demon needs an invitation before it's allowed to come in, to a residence or otherwise. It's like signing a contract or accepting a gift. Well, if I've learned anything, it's never to accept gifts from the ancient fae, Emma stated. They always want something in return. You are precisely right, which is why we must be ever vigilant when fighting demons above all other monsters. Trust me, Onawilke, demon possession isn't anything you want to get mixed up in. My own words made a chill rush up my spine. Possessions among the Arcania was rare, but not unheard of. I'd known someone who'd been possessed in my youth, and it didn't turn out well for him. The demon had killed him before taking over the body, and my father had hacked the poor vessel to bits. The demon had fled and possessed someone else before the high priestesses managed to exorcise and destroy it. Since then, I'd never encountered anyone else who'd been possessed, and I never intended to again. What I'd seen still haunted me to this day, and it wasn't a situation I wanted to repeat. Emma and I practiced telepathy for the rest of the class period, until incessant bickering nearby caught our attention. The shield Odette had been making with Theo dropped from her hands, and Kiara who'd been working with Alexei on empathy magic, turned in her seat. Irina, that's not right. Stefan was trying to teach Delmare how to expand her black and red orbs of battle magic, 
He conjured an orb of his own and demonstrated, You have to get past your own feelings. Channel your emotions into the orb instead of letting them fly all over the place. I can do it myself. Delmare's teeth were clenched as she attempted to expand the orb in her hands, but it fizzled out. She slammed a hand on the desk in frustration. Professor Lunesta noticed the commotion. What's all this? she asked, laying a hand on the desk. There's no need to get frustrated. She's not listening to me. I know she can do this, Stefan stated immediately. Delmare huffed. Forget it. I'm never going to master battle magic. Delmare kicked her chair back as she abruptly stood. She stormed out of the room. Uh, class dismissed, Professor Lunesta said. It wasn't yet time for us to go, but it was apparent she didn't want to make it look like she'd lost control. Emma and I gathered our things. Odette and Kiara had run after Delmare. Theo and Alexei stood in the corner of the room, sending glances at Stefan. He was still sitting at his desk, fists clenched and face red with anger. I should get going. Delmare looks kind of pissed, Emma said. She shyly hugged her books to her chest before she rose up on her toes to give me a peck on the lips. I'll see you later. A rush of emotion raced through me as Emma took off. I was so rigid I could hardly breathe. Nobody else gave a shit she'd kissed me in public. We were declared to be mated. It was what we were supposed to do. But gods if it didn't make me feel like I was floating. Glad you're not being ignored, Stefan said as he came to my side. His dark eyes still smoldered. Didn't look like your session with Delmare went well, I commented. You fucking think so? He punched a nearby stone pillar, and a chunk of it came flying off. She doesn't want me to help her. Maybe you should back off, I said. Stefan growled. Do you know how hard it is to do that? I left her alone all break and practically went nuts. Do you think you may be bonded to her? I asked. What does it matter? He burst. She won't give me the time of day. Calm down. You have to be patient. Easy for you to say. Your mate's hanging all over you. Stefan spat. Hardly. We had an argument earlier. You must have made up because she was looking at you like a five-course meal all throughout class. Stefan grumbled. My feelings twisted, but I said, You forget there's still one very big secret between Emma and I. So tell her. Stop making it a big deal. Stefan said. By the gods, he really was in a bad mood. You know I can't do that. It'll put her in danger, I said, lowering my voice. Maybe she'll want to help, Stefan said. I choked. Gods, no! Emma couldn't get involved in the Phantom's work. It put her right in the line of fire, and it was my duty as her companion to protect her. Stefan sighed and turned to face me. I can't keep doing this. If Irina keeps rejecting me, I have to look somewhere else. I've never felt such a strong connection with anyone, but I can't handle having my heart broken over and over. Sympathy swelled in my chest for my best friend. I put a hand on his shoulder. Just give her some space. If there's a mating bond there, Delmare won't be able to resist it for long. She'll come to you. Stefan scowled. I wish I could get her to open up. She's closed off to me. Well... Perhaps you need to open up to her first, I suggested. He made no further comment. As always, my mind drifted to Emma, and how I had to be careful with my thoughts around her now. I could shield my mind pretty easily from the other Wolvens, but Emma was my mate. We shared a deep connection, and our magic was bound. If I wasn't careful and I let my guard down, she might discover I was the Phantom. Then all hell would break loose. She'd chase me around the dormitories with her sword and threaten to chop my dick off for lying to her all this time. It'd be something she would do. And once she found out who I really was, she'd be in danger. On my life, I would not put her in harm's way. I wasn't ready to tell Emma that I was the Phantom. I never would be. Which is why I still kept my persona a secret, though a small part of me worried Emma had already figured it out. Chapter 4 Emma Seven crows clustered against the pillar, coats dark as night, their black eyes shining with greed. Students shielded their eyes from the crows who dared to come too close, 
Intimidation loomed from their inky forms, as if even the bitter winter wind did not dare to cross their path. I'd never seen so many birds on the Arcania University campus in my life. They were everywhere. I thought they would have migrated by now, but these crows must have been part of a residential group. Or perhaps they were some illusion meant to intimidate those that wandered through these great gates. I wasn't sure. I shivered as I left the school behind me. Delmer had invited me to partake in breakfast at a small cafe in town before classes began later in the day. We usually ate in the cafeteria, but Delmer insisted that the pancakes the cafe offered were to die for, and I had to try one. One crow seemed to have its eye on me. I turned my back, but I could still feel the bird's gaze piercing me, as if to say I was the next fated for death. The snow was picking up. It was so blinding I could barely see through it. Yet one shop front caught my sight as I ran past, and I skidded to a stop for a moment to look. It was an armory store, and the armor in the window was beautiful. It was designed for a sorceress and was white, made of leather in order to be lightweight and allow room for movement. The leather had designs of roses carved into it, the different pieces of it overlapping so the breastplates look like petals. The set was complete, with leather pants, bracers, and shoulder pads. It was topped off by a white cloak, which hooded the mannequin in shadow. The armor was gorgeous. Yet I had a set from Ethan, and there was no need for me to buy something that was new, though it still stuck out in my mind as I turned my back and walked away. I hurried down the cobblestone streets of Dolinska until I came to a tiny, crooked restaurant squeezed between brick buildings awkwardly, as if it wasn't meant to be there. The sign hanging over the door said the Fairy Glen. I headed inside and met a wave of heat. Inside the crooked building was the cutest little cafe. The walls were painted pink and white, and there was a long glass case full of beautiful pastries lining the head of the shop, underneath a blackboard with a menu of today's items. The tables and chairs were pink metal, save for the booths, which were a welcoming cream. It was packed. The smell of waffles wafted through the air, mixed with syrup and the scent of baking cakes. A shifter boy with an acoustic guitar played on a stool near the window. The tiniest little butterflies floated through the air. They glowed white before they began changing colors, from pink to purple to blue to green. They set the ambience as the lighting in the restaurant changed with the color of their glow. I spotted Delmer at a large table in the back. Art supplies covered the table, probably a project for her major. But she wasn't alone. Stefan was curled up next to her on the bench seat. He had one hand on her knee, the other around her shoulders. They were talking quietly, and both were smiling. They had their heads leaned in, as if sharing an intimate moment. Delmer didn't appear annoyed or bothered, merely relaxed. I didn't get it. Every time Stefan was in the room, Delmer acted like she couldn't stand him. Hell, they'd almost gotten into a brawl during class the other day. But now she was cozying up to him like he was her lover. It was like, because no one was watching, Delmer felt free to let Stefan in. He said something to make her laugh, and the smile that spread across her face as she giggled was brilliant. Delmer looked so happy with Stefan. Why was she always pushing him away? I felt like I'd be interrupting if I bothered them now, so I turned to leave. But Delmer saw me and waved me over. Emma, hi. I ducked my head. I'd ruined the moment. Stefan pulled away from Delmer, and I said, Hey, what are you working on? I'm supposed to create a collage for my art class. Stefan was helping me, Delmer explained. Was, Stefan clarified as he got up. I'm late for battle studies, but I'm sure Professor Clarion will let it slide. Delmer giggled. Thanks. I had no idea where to start until you came along. I'm your inspiration, sweetheart. Stefan winked at her, and by the gods, Delmer didn't yell at him for it this time, just smiled and waved goodbye. I sat down next to Delmer. As I did so, the waitress came to take our order. I got the gluten-free rainbow fairy pancakes as Delmer offered before I rounded on her. Okay, what the hell was that? I asked. I've never seen you act like that before. Well, he helped me with my project. Delmer gestured to her collage. I was stuck, but we happened to run into each other, and he suggested we work on it together. I had a creative block until he started firing off ideas. Now I think I have too many. Stefan's your muse. How cute, I said. Delmer slapped me on the shoulder. 
Stop it. It's not like that. We're just friends. I rolled my eyes. Sure, that's why you were cuddling two seconds ago. Friends can cuddle, Delmere said defensively. Yeah, next thing you'll say is friends can bang too, I said. She sighed and put her chin in her hand. It does look that way, doesn't it? You should talk to him and sort this out. See where this is going, I suggested. It's not going anywhere. Delmere. I put my elbow on the table and gave her a look. We both know you're lying to yourself. Delmere sighed. Okay, okay. To be honest, I'm worried about him. Delmere played with her collage. He's been acting a little distant. I think it's because I've been ignoring him. I don't mean to. I'm just not ready. If you want, I'll talk to him. I'm tired of watching you guys go back and forth. Someone's got to do something about this situation. I don't want to see you get hurt, I said. Delmere said nothing more in reply. She made conversation about school and her project, though I knew it was only to get me to stop pestering her about Stefan. When my pancakes arrived, the first thought I had was they were too pretty to eat. They were pink, purple, and blue, with a swirling design in the batter, and covered in rainbow sprinkles in the shape of fairy wings. Once I took a bite, I discovered they were filled with chocolate from Paris and stuffed with raspberries. By the gods, they were really freaking amazing. Wow, I said, my mouth full. These are seriously good. Aren't they, though? Delmere was pouring syrup on her order, a waffle stuffed with cheese, eggs, and sausage. I know the food at the school is free, but I can't get enough of these. We dug in. Delmere choked down her waffle like there was no tomorrow, but I was more careful. I savored every bite as I wanted to start cracking down on sweets. Too much sugar would make me sluggish during practice later. And the last thing I wanted was Lady Magdalena making me do laps in an attempt to get me to wake up. A tinkling laugh made us both look up. An ebony-haired woman had caught the attention of half the restaurant with her obnoxious giggles. I hadn't seen her come in. She had her arms wrapped around a brawny dragon shifter near the glass counter and was fawning over him. The woman had to be in her forties, though she wore a ton of makeup in an attempt to make herself look younger. Her clothes were far too tight and didn't suit her figure. Though she was skinny, her boobs were almost falling out of her top, which I'm sure the dragon appreciated. Delmer looked up at the laugh. Her face soured and she frowned. She stabbed at her waffle with a renewed vigor as the woman at the counter placed her order. Do you know her? I asked Delmer. Delmer gave a sarcastic noise of disgust. Yeah, she's my mother. Her mom? What the hell? I gave another look back. Delmer's mother was crackling hard at some joke the shifter had cracked. By this time, she'd noticed us. Her eyes scanned over the table, to me and then to Delmer, before she set her gaze forward. Delmer's mom didn't come over to say hi when she saw us. She didn't even wave or smile. She merely turned away and continued to cling to the shifter beside her. Is that your dad? I asked of the dragon shifter. Delmer seemed horrified. Him? Gods, no. I don't know the guy. She had another boyfriend last week, Delmer said. Honestly, he'll be old news by lunch. Delmer's mom left with her date. I played with my pancakes as I asked. Does your mom date often? A different man every night, Delmer quipped. Sometimes too. That was extremely unusual in Arcanian society. Her mother had to have a mate somewhere, right? Had he died? Delmer saw the look on my face and said, My dad left a long time ago. My mom kind of went psycho when her mate walked out on her. I was careful while asking the next question. Did it not work out? I don't know. I never met the guy. Delmer pushed her finished plate to the side. She used so much force I worried it would topple off and smash on the floor. I'm sorry. I wanted to reach out and lay a hand on her shoulder, but she seemed so on edge I was concerned she'd explode if I tried. It's not your fault. You know what it's like not to meet your father, Delmer said. That much was true. Anastasi Ignacy had passed away before I was born. Yet I knew that kind of wound wasn't one that went away. The pain ebbed, but it lasted for your entire life. It still sucks, right? Only difference between you and me is that your dad is dead. 
Mine's still alive, and he doesn't give enough of a shit to come find me. Delmer was gathering her art supplies, shoving them in her bag. Honestly, I hardly know my mom either. She was too busy dropping me off at the neighbors so she could go drink, or leaving me home alone while she went to parties. I think she celebrated once I left for school. I was finally out of her hair. Oh, I didn't quite know what to say. Delmer appeared to be in a rage. Her mother's appearance had ignited a fury in her. She broke several pencils as she smashed them into the pockets of her backpack. It's whatever. Delmer said the words, but I was sure she didn't mean them. Everyone's got a sob story. My mom just didn't care. Delmer laid money on the table to pay for her meal. She couldn't even wait for the bill. I was beginning to piece things together. It was clear Delmer didn't want to end up like her mother. Nobody's life is easy, I said. But don't judge Stefan before you even give him a chance. He's not your dad. Delmer momentarily paused. Her jaw worked before she shook her head and said, Dragon shifters are all the same. Delmer swung her bag over her shoulder. See ya, Em. A dark mood settled over me once Delmer left the restaurant. My mind was still on what just happened seconds ago. I'd wondered how Delmer could continue pushing Stefan away when it was obvious she liked him, but now the answer seemed plain in sight. Did Delmer really think that once he had her, Stefan would eventually walk out on her and break her heart like her dad had done? I knew that wouldn't happen. Stefan was Ethan's best friend. Ethan only hung around people who were good. Stefan was a little rough around the edges, and his jokes could get on the dirty side. But he'd been there for Ethan when he needed him the most. If Stefan was that faithful to his friends, I could only imagine the loyalty he'd have to his mate. But they'd never get there unless Delmer was willing to trust him. And I had a rotten feeling that Delmer had convinced herself men couldn't be trusted, because it was the only way to keep her heart safe. What a sad situation. But it could only get better from this point on, right? Maybe I was fooling myself. But I wanted Delmer to be happy, and no matter how much she denied it, I was certain Stefan was the one for her. And deep down, I think she knew it too. I paid the bill and headed back to campus, so I could make it to Enchanting 101 on time. On the way, I saw my own boyfriend up ahead. He was leaning against a stone wall, casually chatting with his hands in his pockets near the main entrance. But he was speaking to someone else, Chastity, the blonde-haired girl I knew. She had her snowboard in one hand, and they were laughing together. I felt a hint of jealousy rise in me. I knew Ethan and Chastity were just friends, but they had dated at some point, and there was a part of me that still wondered if Ethan wanted Chastity back. Chastity caught my gaze as I wandered forward. Ethan's eyes lit up when he saw me, and it sent butterflies ricocheting through my gut. Emma, hi. He leaned in to give me a kiss. How are you? I'm good, I said. My back kind of hurt and my stomach had been churning since that morning, but it was nothing unusual for my condition. This your girl? Chastity's wandering smile made me uneasy. She's cute. Bit of a handful, I've heard. Was that a dig at me for losing the contest? I went to respond, but Ethan said, She can be. Not unlike you. Chastity's white teeth flashed. Well, you always had a thing for reckless girls. Catch you later. Chastity headed off with her snowboard toward the slopes. Ethan squeezed my shoulder. You're freezing. Did you walk to town and back? I ignored his inquiry and decided to get straight to the point. Chastity seemed chipper this morning. Really? I guess, he said and shrugged. I hardly noticed. What was it like dating her? I couldn't help but ask the question. I wanted to know. Chastity? He seemed surprised. He scratched the back of his head and said, Well, she was a wild child. What do you mean? My heart picked up speed. She had a thing for getting in trouble, he said. She pretended she was innocent and harmless when important people were watching, but once their backs were turned, it was like she changed into a different person. Someone out of control. Wow, I said. Ethan made his ex sound cool. Way cooler than me, anyway. Yeah, she was too much for me to handle, he said. I needed a girl that was a little less crazy. 
Did that mean he thought I was controllable? I didn't know. You said you didn't have feelings for her now, but did you ever? God, I sounded like an obsessive girlfriend right now. Ethan grimaced. It's hard to explain. I couldn't trust her. She was fun to hang out with, but I never knew what she was going to do. It was almost scary. I felt the same way. I'd rarely been around chastity, but whenever she was in my presence, I just got this weird vibe. I'd been watching her at the training arena while she was working out for snowboarding practice, and no matter how much I observed her, I couldn't quite get a feel on her or what she wanted. Except Ethan had said she wanted to be queen, and something told me she wasn't done with my mate yet. I didn't want to talk about chastity anymore. Ethan was my boyfriend, and even though he'd assured me we were together permanently, I still felt self-conscious whenever her name came up. Instead, I changed the subject. I had to write a poem for enchanting class. I'm not sure what we're doing with them, but I want to make sure it's good. Do you mind reading it for me and telling me what you think? Sure, Ethan said. I handed him the poem. My stomach clenched in anxiety as Ethan scanned the words over the page I'd memorized by heart. When you are ill, no one understands. It's like a hole opens up in you and you can't fill it. Other people say they can, but they return blank stares. I can't bear one more person asking if I'm all right. Do I look all right? I am bleeding from the inside out. This is something no medication can fix, and everyone knows it. That's why they ask. No, I'm not going to try again. Yes, you can leave me alone. I am safe. It's been a long time since I've had any sense of peace, though it's easy to fake a smile. The best masks are worn by the best players. Acting is a virtue. I am the best player. I have the best masks and the prettiest smile. Men like it when you smile. They are always telling you to smile on the street. I play along. I play along because it is too hard to be real and too easy to pretend. Makeup is easy to wear. I hide behind the falsities of mascara and rouge, hoping no one realizes it hides the tear streaks. When you are real, the world tries to ruin you. The world wants an act. So I become desirable and kind, because that's what they expect. It is easy to lure men in for a distraction. All they want from you is sunshine. I give my beauty up like diamonds for free, to stop the voices and silence the nightmares. I know talk is cheap, but it's a distraction, and I crave it dearly, like sunlight. The darkness cocoons me, but if I stay here too long, I will begin to form calcite and dry out. I will lose all sense of me if I do not get out of this bed. So I force myself to rise and begin the day. Ethan frowned as he finished the poem. It's beautiful, but it's so sad. It bothers me you're experiencing such pain. It's just a poem. Don't look so far into it, I said, jaded. I didn't expect Ethan to get it. If he understood the amount of agony I dealt with on a daily basis, if anyone understood just exactly what kind of horror my body put me through, it'd be unimaginable to him how I could live that kind of life. Yet I did. It came naturally to me now because I'd been dealing with it for so long. Most of the time it was manageable, but at other times it was agonizing, especially at night with the jolts in my joints and the ache in my tendons keeping me awake. During daylight hours, I remembered the writhing that accompanied the fire burning through my muscles. The pillows and soft mattress felt far too often like spikes scratching and tearing at my fragile paper skin. Touch, even Ethan's, sometimes became something sheerly unbearable. It almost felt like pinpricks running over me instead of fingers. Needles drawing blood, except I knew the blood wasn't there and my body was just going awire. Ethan knew, yet he didn't know. He knew what it was like to be different, but not this different. I didn't think he'd ever pulled himself across the floor and rifled through pill bottles that doctors had prescribed looking for some kind of relief but found none, like I had in the previous weeks in Krakow. 
Sometimes I just wanted an escape, a careless morphine to drag me away from the agony. To be free of my body and in someone else's for one day would be a rare gift. I lived a good life. I was happy, for the most part. But I knew in my heart I'd be like this or worse for the rest of my life. And though I hadn't given up hope, it was troubling sometimes pretending to smile day in and day out. I never wanted to be normal, because normal was boring. But once I got diagnosed, I felt like I was alone, doing this all by myself. I didn't think Ethan knew the isolation I felt, or what kind of pain that isolation brought me. To be sick enough that no one could do anything about it. I was in a prison I couldn't escape unless I escaped it through death, and that was enough to drive anyone mad. Maybe my illness would get in the way of Ethan and I, and I'd bring our relationship to a brutal and bitter end. But then, I remembered his missing leg, and wondered if any of this would be relatable to him at all. And maybe, once I opened up, that prison of isolation would stop. Just take care of yourself, okay? Ethan's eyes knitted together with worry as he pressed his lips to my forehead. I'm concerned about you. There seemed to be a lot of that going around. He caressed my hair, and the feelings that welled inside of me were like a cold winter's day about to set upon summer. I took a shuddering breath. I'll be fine. I have to go, though. I have class. So do I. He gave me an affectionate smile, and my heart started. Before he could walk off, I said, Hey, do you want to get dinner? Maybe we could hang out tonight. I was asking him out. I was shocked I had the balls to do it, but damn it, I missed him, and I wanted us to spend some time together as a couple. Time that wasn't ruined by obligation, or rules, or expectations. Maybe we could just be regular old boyfriend and girlfriend for once in our freaking lives. Ethan started. It looked like he was going to say yes, before something crossed his mind and his expression dropped. Sorry, I have a prior commitment. My stomach jolted. Oh, what's going on? Just royal stuff, he stuttered. Nothing entertaining by any means. I promise I'll make it up to you. He didn't have royal duties anymore, not since he lost the contest. I knew what was going on. He was too busy playing superhero to even take me on a date. Oh, okay. Ethan waved his hand. A white rose appeared out of thin air, one of glass, sparkling and crystalline, a fanciful illusion. It was a beautiful work of magic. He handed it to me with a slight bow before he kissed my hand. I'll see you soon, Emma. He always had to be Prince Charming, didn't he? Frustration grew in my gut as he turned away. My breath came out in a whoosh. Yeah, see ya. As I watched Ethan walk away, I had a thought. Life is never the perfect picture that we imagine it to be. Our relationship was like this crystal rose, shatterable. Though Ethan and I were together, I sometimes wonder if what we had was going to last. I knew he loved me. Over break, I tried so hard to stop loving him so I didn't hurt him again, but I couldn't. I observed the glass rose in my hand and felt sick. Roses were seen as a flower of love, but I saw them as a flower of hatred, luring you closer with their intense beauty and striking colors, only to prick your finger with their thorns and laugh as they left you heartbroken, leaving their blissful prettiness out of reach. It was a sick metaphor for Ethan and I. What we had seemed perfect, yet fragile. So pristine to look at from a distance, but easily broken if you made the wrong move. Like Stefan and Delmer. She was so worried about breaking what she could have, she ran from the beauty before the thorns could cause her to bleed. But not I. Ethan was worth the risk. No matter the circumstances, I viewed him as my king, and I would be his queen. The relentless charging into the dark night against something you knew or hoped would never end. That was the beauty of being with someone you longed for, but couldn't really have. Not without secrets getting in the way. Now focus, ladies. Enchanting is all about putting your illusion magic into objects to serve a greater purpose beyond what it was made to do. 
Professor Calliope spoke over the class as we huddled two by two around the round desk situated in the enchanting classroom. I listened carefully as Calliope lectured. No doubt you have wondered why I asked you to create a poem and what that has to do with enchanting. Calliope crossed her hands in front of her body. As you all know, illusion magic is about intention, projecting your will onto energy and bending it to your desires. Poetry is a beautiful way of establishing and creating feeling, and feelings are the framework of how fey magic is incorporated into this world. Your emotions become your reality, and those emotions can reflect on the world around you. Today, we'll be working on taking the poems you wrote and putting their emotion into an object of your choosing. Please choose an item from the box and get to work. The girls hustled to a chest, which was stockpiled with various items. I saw clothing, trinkets, books, and bottles piled within the chest. I got shoved to the back of the line. Many people cut in front of me. Some even pushed me out of the way to get to the best items first. I fell down and nearly got stepped on. Kiara pulled me to my feet before I could get hurt. Out of the way, cheater! Morgan snapped at me. Leave the enchanting to the real sorceresses. Behave yourself, Calliope told Morgan. I won't tolerate rudeness in my classroom. She's been shunned by the circle for what she did in the contest. She shouldn't even be in this class, Morgan said as she pointed at me. That's for the headmistress to decide, not you, Calliope replied. Focus on your own studies. Morgan sneered at me, and a couple of girls followed her lead. I tried to shake off their cruel stares, but it was hard. I knew people didn't respect me because I'd cheated in the contest, but this was a bit ridiculous. These bitches literally acted like they were above me and it was getting old. Once I got to the chest, there was only one item left. I drew out a thin white mask. It looked old. The threads on it were wearing and the lace was coming undone. It probably been worn in a masquerade years ago and forgotten about since. It was hardly the best of the bunch. I sat at our small table and concentrated. I read my poem over again and tried to choose an intention for it, but I didn't know where to start. There were so many emotions in the poem. Anger, pain, desperation, and none of them seemed to fit the mask. I didn't want to enchant this mask with a spell of agony and cause grief to anyone wearing it. What good would that do? Kiara had already gotten her enchantment. She'd chosen a medallion from the chest and had infused it with a positivity spell, as her poem was a short haiku about happiness, instead of dark and depressing like mine. I should have written something easy and not taken this project so seriously. My eyebrows knitted together, and Kiara sensed my frustration. Something bothering you? This fucking enchantment isn't working, I raged. I sighed and tried to take a deep breath though it came more like a gulp. I'm shit with magic. You are not. You're capable of getting this. Yara held out her medallion. Here, hold this for a second and tell me if it helps. When I ran my fingers over the medallion, a burst of optimism rolled through me. I knew it was just an illusion, a pretty figment of my imagination and not how my emotions really felt. But it was good enough to start a bout of inspiration. My head cleared from my dark thoughts, and I was able to reread my poem with a clear mind. My entire poem was about deception, putting on a mask and hiding your pain from the people you loved most, becoming someone else in order to protect them from the suffering you experienced. My piece was a story about wearing a disguise and painting your face so no one else saw the ruse. I focused that intent on the mask. As I did, a white, glittering magic emerged from my fingers and landed delicately on the mask. The mask shone for a moment before the surrounding glow dimmed. I put the mask on. I then turned toward Kiara. What do you think? Her eyes were wide. Kiara shook her head. I don't know. It's like I forget I even know you. I don't recognize any of your features. Your spell is strong. Didn't know it would work like that. I took the mask off before anyone else could see me in it. How long do you think it'll last? An enchantment like that? Ages, Kiara replied. It won't go away until you remove it. I fiddled with the ribbons on the mask, thinking, this mask could be useful. When class ended and everyone took their items back, I pocketed mine in my bag and left. 
once I was in my dorm, I took the old mask and put it into my drawer. I wasn't quite sure what I'd use it for, only that it felt terribly important. I couldn't explain why. The crystal rose Ethan had given me was sitting on my desk in a vase. It sparkled in the winter sunlight and gave off a rainbow reflection, which shone on my bedroom wall. Hanging in a glass case over the desk was the sword Ethan had made me, Lord Brazan. I'd used it in the contest. I didn't have any weapons classes this semester, so it'd stay there until the fall, but now and then I ran my fingers over the blade, because I had a connection with it now and it made me think of my love. It was strange to think of Ethan that way. Maybe it wouldn't be so strange if I could admit my feelings out in the open. I admired both the rose and the sword for a moment before I got changed, grabbed a quick lunch from the cafeteria, and headed out to the rink. Gabby wasn't here, thank the gods. Lady Magdalena had put us on different ice sessions, as she felt we'd be a distraction to each other during our training. I warmed up by stroking around the rink and practicing a few easy spins and jumps. A skater stretching across the boards waved me over. I knew her. Her name was Samantha. She was part of the Griffin faction. She was technically one of my competitors, but we got along and she was friendly. She dyed her hair white with streaks of silver and had big blue eyes that matched the pale color of the ice. Hey, Emma, have a nice break? Amantha asked. I shrugged as I stretched my arms. It was okay. And yours? I barely got off the ice, she said. Magdalena grilled my ass from Christmas until New Year's. Sounds like her. My stomach wiggled when Lady Magdalena was brought up. I was expecting a lecture from her today. We hadn't spoken since the King's Contest ended. I was scared of what she was going to say to me. Would she even want to be my coach anymore after what had happened? Amantha scoffed. At least Gabby's not here. Last time we were on the ice together, I accidentally got in the way of her jumps. She called me a stupid kid. Amantha giggled. She probably wasn't looking where she was going. Gabby thought she owned the ice. She wasn't. She slammed into the boards the other day on her triple lutz. Amantha smiled. Eli was watching. She was trying to jump and cast a spell at the same time. She totally landed on her ass. That's not surprising. Casting spells is hard enough when you're not already doing something else, I said. Amantha laughed. Too bad Gabby doesn't know she's not the only one who can skate and cast illusions at the same time. Amantha skated off. She did backward crossovers around the center of the rink until she dipped into a layback spin. As she spun, she twirled her fingers above her. Beautiful snowflake illusions spanned across the ice, creating blue designs across the white sheet. They faded away as Amantha exited the spin. Impressive, I told her. Too bad the judges don't give out points for illusions. I know, right? Sucks there isn't a magical division for ice skating, Amantha said. You should try it sometime. Maybe I will, I said, but I resolved for it not to be today. I didn't want to be flamboyant and show off when I didn't know how Magdalena was going to act toward me. After I was done talking to Amantha, I continued my warm-up. Lady Magdalena entered the boards of the rink. She had her eye on me the entire time. She waited by the sidelines in a large gray fur coat and looked intimidating as ever. I stopped beside her on the ice. Lady Magdalena gave me a searching look. Sheepish, I looked down. Magdalena made a scoffing noise. Don't act like that, Emmeline. We have no time for you to be ashamed. I dared to glance up. I know you're disappointed in me. I'm sorry. Disappointed? Yes, Magdalena confirmed, and my gut sank. But disappointment won't change anything. We must look onward toward the future. You have proven yourself a skater of great quality, as well as an excellent sorceress. I expect you to put your talents to good use and not waste them. I'm sorry I used the unseely necklace, I blurted. It was stupid. I will hear no more of it. You have shown me you are willing to do whatever it takes to win an important quality in an Arcania, Lady Magdalena said. Sometimes we must be ruthless and unjust. It is the only way to get what we want. I didn't think we were talking about skating anymore. Lady Magdalena stood tall. Gabriella is talented, but she is more than what is to be taken at first sight. Things are not always what they seem. Her tone was firm as her eyes bored into me. 
I wasn't sure what Magdalena was hinting at. Are you saying Gabby is hiding something? Lady Magdalena shrugged, then flicked her fingers. Go. I want to see a triple sow cow double toe loop combination. If you wobble, you'll do it again. I skated off, though my mind was whirling as I prepared to perform the jump. I had a feeling Lady Magdalena was just as uncomfortable with the idea of Elijah and Gabby taking the throne as I was. And just like Ethan, I felt it in my gut that she would do whatever it took to stop them, even if her plans included using me. I came back from the rink tired and sore. Lady Magdalena had worked me hard today. I wasn't sure if it was punishment for what I did or preparation for the upcoming competitive season. The competition season in Europe was set to take place this January, but Magdalena had pulled both Gabby and I out of it on account of our participation in the contest. She wasn't allowing us to compete until next fall, when the Malovian National Figure Skating Championships would take place. Malovia was a small enough country that it didn't have qualifying events like regionals or sectionals back in the U.S. If I wanted to compete at big events like the World Figure Skating Championship or even, shit, the Olympics, I needed to first prove myself and be accepted into the Malovian figure skating team. Not an easy feat, as Malovia produced some of the top figure skating champions in the world. But Lady Magdalena was certain I could make it so I'd made it a goal of mine to compete with the best of them. That meant placing at least first, second, or third on the podium at nationals. Otherwise, I would have to wait until next year. If I had that long, battling my illness was taking a lot out of me. I feared a year from now, I wouldn't be able to skate like I could currently. I had to win at nationals because this was my final shot. I wasn't going to be queen anymore. So my top priorities were skating and graduating from Arcania University with flying colors. If I was a powerful sorceress with a reputation as a world skater and a national athlete, perhaps I could use my influence to curb Gabby's sick tendencies. That is, if I lived that long. The hag had prophesied I would meet my death in a few years' time. But the hag had been wrong about using the necklace to cheat in the contest. She said if I did, Ethan would be king, and that hadn't happened. She'd manipulated me, as Ethan had said. Because she'd lied, I didn't believe a damn thing the monster had said anymore, even if Milana had sent her. There must have been some misunderstanding along the way. Whatever it was, there was no figuring it out now. The crown was lost, so I needed to move on to other opportunities. I took a nap to recover, then headed to the library to do some homework once it got dark. I didn't come back to the dormitories until I looked up and realized time had gotten away from me. It was later than I expected, around midnight. Most of the other students had gone to bed or were in the rec room hanging out. The rest of campus was completely empty. When I put my things away and emerged from my room, I saw Ethan slipping out of his dorm. He looked around, then headed down the vacant hallway with his shoulders thrown back, a sense of purpose radiating from his form. Now where was he going? Getting into trouble as usual, I suspected. Gabby said I had to stop him from getting in the Black Claw's way, so I decided to tail him. Before I left, I grabbed the white mask from the drawer and pocketed it before I slipped on my jacket to follow. The thought came to me that Ethan was a shifter. He might smell me from a distance and realize I was chasing after him. I cast an illusion to mute my scent before I spritzed on a ton of perfume. My mom had gotten it for me for Christmas, and I'd had yet to use it. Ethan wouldn't recognize it. I choked on the heavy scent, but hey, it was better than being found out. I had to hurry to catch up with him, until I recognized voices ahead. Ethan was talking lowly around the corner. I pressed myself to the wall to listen. If you're not going to be supportive, get out of my way. He said, I don't have time for this. My heart pounded as I waited. Who is he talking to? I heard a familiar voice reply. You can make time. This is important. It was Stefan. He'd caught Ethan just like I had, though he didn't act surprised. Whatever you can tell me, it can wait. Ethan said, you know time's short. You'll want to listen, Stefan hissed. I think I may have found a clue. To the cult's location? Ethan's tone was hopeful. 
Yes, Stefan replied. It's somewhere in the woods to the west near the boundary wall, no more than a mile outside the city. Ethan was looking for the Black Claw's hideout to do what with it exactly? Blow it up? Like that was going to stop them. How'd you find this out? Ethan's tone was suspicious. People talk, I get around, Stefan replied. If you haven't noticed, I'm pretty popular with the ladies. I had to put a hand over my mouth to keep from snorting. I imagined Ethan was giving an eye roll. You're putting yourself in danger. You could say thank you. I just saved your ass from another night of waltzing around in the cold-ass snow without a lead. Stefan shot back. Stefan, I said I didn't want you getting involved. Did Stefan know Ethan was the Phantom? Interesting. Though it hurt my feelings that Ethan had trusted Stefan enough to trust him and not me. Though on second thought, maybe Ethan didn't tell him at all. That boy was too secretive for his own good. I bet Stefan had worked it out on his own. And when do I ever listen? Stefan's easygoing snicker echoed down the hall. I don't have to be out there with you, but there's no reason I can't gather some intel for you on the side. Ethan paused. He was thinking. If the rumor is true, they're likely staged somewhere near the boundary wall protecting the city. Though why, I don't know. Don't you think you can use your vast royal wealth and princely influence to change things in Dolinska for the better? Instead of running around as a masked caper, it would be much easier. Stefan said skeptically, I have no more influence over the country since my father died and I lost the contest. As for the royal treasury, I have no access to it but my monthly allowance. And though it's substantial, it's not enough to make a real difference. Ethan's tone was frustrated. This is the only way. I think Ethan shoved past Stefan because I heard a rustling noise and nothing more. I held my breath, fearing Stefan was going to round the corner, but the footsteps drew farther away instead of closer. He must have gone another way. I dared to peek my head out, and I saw both boys were gone. I picked up the pace and hustled down the hallway, working on instinct until I saw Ethan up ahead. I ducked behind a few statues of armor and watched as he took an iron doorway that I hadn't seen anyone else use before. I darted forward after the door closed behind him, but when I tried the knob, it was locked. I had to look for him elsewhere. He'd mentioned something earlier about heading toward the forest, to the west side near the boundary wall. I'd start the search for him there. But the mask wasn't enough. If I was going to tail Ethan around, especially in public, and stop him from interfering with the Black Claw, I needed a bigger disguise. The armor in the window of the shop came to mind. It was perfect but I couldn't walk in and buy it without providing evidence that I was a vigilante myself when the police started looking. Not to mention the shop wouldn't open up until tomorrow, and I needed the armor now. I hurried off campus and through the streets of Dolinska. I knew it wasn't safe out here for a young girl all alone, but I wasn't the defenseless little woman I'd been a semester ago. I'd been practicing my magic for months now, and realized the strength of my power when I had won the duel in the contest. I could protect myself. I came to the shop window. I tried the door, but it was locked. As I stood in front of the window, I saw my scared reflection stare back at me, the armor creating a silhouette around my form. Am I really doing this? I wasn't a thief. It was to protect Ethan. If he destroyed the Black Claw hideout, wherever it was, Gabby would retaliate and I'd lose him. I couldn't let that happen. I was serious about us. I'd die for my mate, and if it meant resorting to burglary to keep him safe, so be it. Lady Magdalena was right. Sometimes you had to be ruthless to get what you wanted. I placed a hand against the glass. As I closed my eyes, I imagined cracks spreading over the glass, creating an intricate web that caused the window to crumble inward. I pushed the illusion forward, forcing it upon reality though the image was only in my head. My illusion was so powerful, the glass shattered. The minute the window was broken, a screeching alarm blazed through the night, creating pain in my eardrums. I crawled through the broken window, ignoring the sound of the alarm. As I reached for the armor, I saw a thin blue dagger lying on the counter a short distance away. I had my magic, but I was certain Ethan was carrying a weapon as well. I needed one to protect myself. 
My sword was back in my dorm and was too heavy to carry around when I was trying to be discreet. I dug in my pocket and placed some money on the counter to pay for the armor and dagger. It was all the funds I had. Heart pounding, I grabbed both the dagger and the armor and ran off, arms full. Lights from the buildings ignited and doors opened as people around the area wondered what was going on. But I was out of there long before anyone saw me. In a darkened alley a block away, I changed. I slipped the leather shoulder pads, breastplate, and bracers over my sweater before I pulled the pants over my school tights. I yanked the white cloak around me, tying it at my front, before I put on the white mask and threw the cloak's hood over my hair. Before I headed off, I took a deep breath. I cast an illusion to modify the sound of my voice before I did another spell to change the color of my hair. It went from red to brown as I imagined the spell, eyes changing from green to blue. Once it was finished, I wavered. I had to place a hand on the wall to steady myself, but the magic held. I was tired. I'd done a lot today, and my magic was growing thin. But I couldn't give up now. I still needed to stop Ethan. I tossed the remnants of my school uniform in the dumpster. I had plenty more back in my dorm, all identical, and there was nowhere to store it in the meantime. Looks like I needed to get a secret layer of my own. I couldn't quite hang my superhero disguise in the closet. Superhero? Motherfucker, I can't believe I'm doing this crazy shit. It was all for the man I loved, who was also crazy because he'd gotten me into this shit in the first place. I took a deep breath and began my trek toward the woods to search for my mate and to sabotage his plans for his own good. Hey, Ethan wasn't the only one who could wear a mask. Chapter 5 Ethan My white fur stood out against the night as I prowled through the trees as a woven in the shadows. I kept crouched just in case there were cultists nearby. The wind whistled through the leaves creating an almost flute-like sound, and the snow crunched underneath my paws. The air felt crisp and brisk as the snowflakes trickled down. Hopefully the heavy snowfall would mask any paw prints I left behind on my journey. I was a mile outside of town, searching the woods. There were monsters lurking out here in the darkness, but I had no time for them. If one crossed my path, I'd do what I could to avoid it and move on unless I had no other choice but to fight. The trees parted slightly up ahead. I slunk to the ground and kept my ears up. My shifter sight helped me to see in the dark. Against the ridge of a mountain was the opening of a cave. I wasn't sure if it was my imagination or not, but the cave's mouth looked like a skull, gaping teeth wide to swallow Fay whole. Two eyes in the cave's ceiling looked on vacantly toward the world. I kept myself hidden in the snow as I waited. It wasn't long before I saw two cloaked figures wandering forward from the blizzard's rage. I couldn't tell who they were, only that their cloaks were black. They remained close together as the wind raged on. They could be cultists. I wasn't sure who else would be out here, up to no good in the middle of the night. The two figures paused at the entrance of the cave. One raised a hand. The air shimmered and weaved and the two figures stepped on through. I noticed as they passed. There was a particular shine to the spot they'd traveled through, a sort of glamour. With the sight of the illusion being performed, I was certain. So this was the Black Claw's hideout, a cavern. Interesting choice. I crept forward. When I got to the cave's entrance, I pressed a paw against the shield I'd seen the fade dissolve. My paw met a block, and I could go no further. The entrance to the cave was blocked by an enchantment. You needed a password spell to get through. I could try to break it, but then I'd be out here all night, and who knew if another cultist would discover me in the process. I returned to the safety of the trees and lay down to think. I could wait for them to come out, but that was a futile effort. I'd need an army to take on the cultists, and as Prince Regent, I didn't have one at my disposal. It would be an act of war and only a king could declare that. I had other options. I could cause an explosion and cave in the entrance. That would take care of the problem. A twist in my gut made me feel ill to consider the possibility. I'd never taken the life of a fae before, let alone the lives of hundreds. I'd only ever killed monsters, 
animals. I'd considered murdering the cultist I'd tortured weeks ago, but that was in a moment of rage. To slaughter so many people in such a gruesome way, trap them inside, with no light or food or way of escape, waiting for the inevitable end, it was monstrous in itself. I would not have the thought of thousands of cultists wasting away on my conscience, even if they were horrible people. I thought of starting a fire, but illusion magic couldn't conjure it, and I had no matches or gasoline to create one large enough to chase the cultists out of the cave. Not to mention, I had no way of getting in, or knowing if they had anything flammable inside. As I was contemplating, I caught the smell of heavy perfume. Roses. A scent I'd never experienced before, but that I liked. There was a woman nearby. A cultist, most likely. I shot to my feet in a start, heart beating rapidly. I'd been found. Someone was hunting me. My gaze immediately went upward. There she was, perching in the trees. A woman wearing leather armor and a white cloak hung in the branches, the hood cast over her head. She wore a mask, like me. You shouldn't be here. You need to leave. The woman's voice came out in a low, sultry tone. I didn't recognize it. I didn't know her. I bared my teeth. I'm not going anywhere. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to scare you off, the woman warned. Last chance. I didn't respond. Instead, I crouched down and leapt. I soared through the air, jaws extended, as I prepared to take her down from the trees. She moved quickly. She jumped to another tree branch, just as my paws skimmed her cloak. I fell to the ground, spinning in place to face her again. The woman gritted her teeth. You don't know what you're getting into. Enough talking, I said. You want to get rid of me, you'll have to do it by force. The woman didn't need any more convincing. She fell from the trees, her cloak billowing around her. She landed in a crouch and stood tall, flinging her arm outward. I attempted to charge, but I smashed against a painful illusion spell. The surrounding air crackled like glass, blue veins spreading around my form like I'd hit some kind of shield. I shook my head, dazed. No illusion had ever stopped me before. This was an exceptional sorceress. I know who you are, the woman threatened. You are Prince Ethan of the Arcania. You need to go back. I reeled in shock. Bile rose in my throat and horror spread from my paws upward. How did she know my name? My missing leg. I'd never acted as the phantom in my shifter form before. She must have guessed. Who are you? I breathed. The woman blinked behind her mask. She took a second to answer before she spoke. You may call me the White Rose. So no name. She was keeping it hidden from me, for obvious reasons. I changed back into a man. My hand immediately went for the blade at my side. Whoever you are, it's you who's met their fate. I attacked, but the woman was waiting for me. She combated my blade with a dagger of her own, and my arm was sent swinging to the side. My mouth dropped open in shock, but I gathered my bearings and charged again. I tried fainting at her left and going for the throat, but she dodged that and slashed at my chest. Blow after blow, our blades clashed, but she was too quick for me to make a move on. Every time I took a swing, she met me as an equal. Her fighting style seemed familiar, but I couldn't place where I knew it from. Not to mention the woman was so skilled, I had no time to wonder, as all my effort was spent keeping up. This opponent had the ability to guess my every move. How did she know me so well? Had she studied me in the king's contest and took notes for when we met? How long had she been following me? I lost my temper and stabbed forward with a snarl, but the woman beat me to it. She ducked beneath my arm and kicked me in the chest, sending me crashing to the ground. My weapon went flying out of my hands. I fell on my knees, looking upward at the advancing sorceress. God's damn it, she was good. Her teacher had to be excellent. I struggled to get up as she approached, a deadly illusion growing in her hand. The illusion glowed white, morphing into an orb that grew with each passing second. I told you to leave, she snapped. I won't ask again. I let out a laugh. 
I'm stubborn like that. The sorceress threw the illusion. I rolled to the side and grabbed my blade as I did so. The illusion skirted me by, rushing past and blasting a hole in the ground where I once lay. Our fight had caught the attention of others. I heard voices, cultists coming out of the cave to investigate. I hurried to catch my breath as footsteps approached. The sorceress advanced, another illusion growing in her hands. I wasn't so sure she'd miss a second time. There were too many of them for me to fight off at once. If the cultists found me cornered by this sorceress, I'd be outnumbered. I did the only thing I could. I ran. I had escaped the White Rose, but she still plagued me every waking night. A week passed, and my painful defeat was still resonating within me at the hands of the mysterious woman. I panicked inwardly, thinking every moment the Arcania Alliance would storm in here and arrest me for being the Phantom, but nothing happened. I couldn't concentrate in my classes. I couldn't eat. I barely slept. I wandered through the halls of Arcania University like a ghost, my mind in a craze, trying to figure out what had gone on that night. What was more, I hadn't put the mask on since. I'd been out late at night, but walking around as Prince Ethan, not as the Phantom. I considered it too risky, at least for now. I wasn't sure if I was afraid of the White Rose, or if I was afraid that whoever she worked for might be on to me. I knew where the Black Claw was hiding, but I couldn't do anything about it until I understood who was tailing my every move. The woman knew my name. She knew who I was. That was exceptionally dangerous. The only thing I couldn't fathom was why she hadn't turned me in yet. Unless she wanted to use my identity against me, for blackmail or otherwise. Whatever her reasons, I didn't trust them. This woman was a threat. I had to be very careful. I got out of magic rituals around twelve on Friday. When I headed to the cafeteria, my afternoon was ruined as I heard the sound of Elijah's mindless babble. He was in a corner booth, bragging. Gabby sat on his lap as he boasted loudly for everyone to hear. A crowd of ten people or so were gathered around him, pressed into the booth or standing beside it. My cousin had accumulated a lot of friends after he'd won the contest. I caught sight of many recognizable faces in the crowd and scowled. Quite a few of those people had attempted to kiss my ass in order to gain some favor in the realm. Now they were sucking up to Elijah. It was so typical. When I'm king, I'm going to make some changes around here, Elijah said. These peasants have been taking advantage of the system for too long. They need to work for a living. This was far past ironic, seeing as how Elijah, spoiled and rich as he was, never worked a day in his life. Made sense he wanted to cut social programs to fatten his own treasury. Gabby fawned in his lap. Exactly what I've been thinking, my dear. Elijah gave a smirk. Fay have been in hiding for too long. It's high time these humans learned who's really in charge. What an ass. Was he seriously considering exposing the supernatural world and revealing magic to the humans so the Arcania could try to take over? The last time the Fae had considered that, it had been over 80 years ago, and it started a world war between all the magical races. We'd lost. Did he really want to put the Arcania through that again? The people around Elijah nodded like dumb sheep. They didn't care what Elijah did, only if they were considered favorable enough to share in his power. I went to the other side of the room. Couldn't stand listening to Elijah blither on anymore, until I noticed Emma. Damn it. She was wearing those knee-length socks again, the ones I liked, along with a large blue sweater that acted as a dress. She looked so undeniably adorable, I had a difficult time restraining myself from kissing her on the spot. She must have been waiting for me. Hey. She reached out and caressed my hand, sending sparks through my skin. She sent a dirty look at Elijah. Do you want to get out of here? I can't take his bullshit any longer. Gladly. We grabbed takeout boxes and headed out. Elijah's words were still burning in my ears long after we'd left the dining hall. We found a small alcove in one of the hallways where there was an empty window seat. We curled up together and ate as we watched the snowfall outside. We were in close proximity here, but it didn't seem to bother us like before. We were fitting together like two pieces of a puzzle. 
I didn't know how much longer I could continue to keep Emma at a distance without driving myself insane. How are you and Elijah related, anyway? Emma asked, taking a bite. It's hard to believe you two come from the same family. You're so different. Lady Corva is my aunt. She's my mother's sister, I said. Both of them were duchesses before my mother became queen, and Corva became a lady by marrying Lord Zlodia. Emma shuddered. It's awful you share blood with that woman. She's vile. I heard you haven't been getting along. Emma gave a sarcastic noise. That's an understatement. Corva despises me. She despises anyone that's a threat, I said. You're a powerful sorceress, Emma, and that scares her. It's something my mother and she have in common, unfortunately. Emma frowned at the mention of my mother. Your mother has some strange ideas, that's for sure. She comes from a long line of high-bred fae society, I explained. Old money, old power. She considers herself better than those of inferior breeding. Doesn't think people of various social statuses should mix. Emma wrinkled her nose in disgust. The Arcania are disgustingly classist. My dad wasn't like that. He was a peasant before he became king, I said. My mother had no interest in him until he was rejected by his mate and the position of queen became available. I sat back. She was very interested in bolstering her position. You talk about her in a very blunt way, she said. I paused. Don't get me wrong. I love my mother, but I understand who she is, and lying to myself about her true self is a futile endeavor. She can be just as cunning as her sister if she so desires. Emma nodded. We already know she doesn't approve of me. Approve or not, she can't change it now. The choosing is done. You're mine forever. Emma smiled weakly. Got any other friends in high places? Stefan has royal blood, I said. His great-grandfather was king before my father was. The last dragon monarch we had, actually. Could Stefan be king if we managed to overthrow Gabby and Elijah? Her tone was hopeful. I let out a sarcastic noise. Stefan no more wants to be king than I want to be a jester. It's too much responsibility for him. Yes, but if he doesn't want to be king, he could at least be a lord of the circle, Emma pointed out, which would be useful if we're trying to stop Gabby and Elijah. Lords and ladies are voted in, but, I thought, Stefan's royal blood would be a significant influence. I don't believe the council wants a commoner on the panel, regardless of what they've done or how accomplished they are. I suppose they wouldn't want me, seeing as how I have peasant blood, she crossed her arms. I gave her a sad look. It would be very difficult for either of us to gain a seat on the circle now, after what we've done. What I've done, she said. You had no part in it. You are my declared mate. We are both to blame. Such are the laws of the Arcania. But it was my fault. No. What mates do, they do together, not alone. I consider myself equally responsible. I took her hand. It doesn't matter what happens from here on out. We're a united front against all odds. Your crimes are mine to bear. Emma's brows knitted together. She seemed conflicted, like she had something on her mind. She must have brushed it off, because she changed the subject and said, I think we need to talk to our friends about me being the world weaver and about the hag. I've been feeling guilty about keeping it in the dark. We should come clean. I wasn't sure if that was the right move. But at the same time, if this prophecy foretold anything about the horrors to come, we needed all the help we could get. Very well. When do you want to tell them? It's lunch. They're all free, Emma said. I asked Odette to get everyone around in the rec room. We should go there now. So she decided to do this in advance without telling me. I thought this was our secret to share, as it had happened to the both of us. But I guess she was the center of it. So she had the final decision. It was a blow to my pride, but still, I knew she was making the right choice. Let's go. The rec room was deserted this time of day, on account of everyone being in the cafeteria. Our friend group was in a secluded corner, goofing off by a long bench near a picture window. Odette was chatting in low whispers to the other girls, like usual, while Stefan shoved Theo, trying to get him to wrestle. 
Theo ignored him, though when Stefan pushed Alexi, the griffin shifter had no trouble hitting back. The two boys broke into a playful scuffle before they saw us approach. The conversation stopped, and all eyes looked up. You wanted to talk about something urgent? Odette asked. Emma took a deep breath and sat down on the bench. I sat beside her. Yes, it's pretty important, she said. She took my hand in hers for support. I squeezed it, and Emma said, At the start of last semester, Ethan and I ran into a monster near the edge of the school grounds. It was a hag, but she didn't attack us. She foretold a prophecy, said that I was the world weaver, and that I was destined to destroy the Arcania. What? Kiara asked. She turned pale. Emma steadied her breath and began to recite the prophecy that was spoken to us. And there shall be a sorceress who is above all marked. She will be written as destined and cursed, for there is not one who is as strong as she, nor one who is so damned. Realms shall bow to her will, but never shall she escape her cruel fate. She will be known as the World Weaver. She who holds the power of the Arcania will be their final end, for when the wolf howls, the World Weaver, who rules over reality itself, will surrender her magic and die. The room was dead silent. The boys were wide-eyed in shock, while the girls seemed breathless. Ethan and I have been investigating. We don't really know what the World Weaver is, but we know the Black Claw wants my blood in order to raise Droga from the dead. If they capture me, they can use it to summon the Dark God on a specific day, though I haven't found out which one yet, Emma said. If that happens, Droga will take over, and I'll have condemned the Fae to extinction. Emma, how could you not tell us this? Kiara asked in exasperation. This is important information. I'm sorry, I just didn't know who to trust at the time. She ran a hand through her hair. Though, I think I'm safe for now. I don't think the cult is chasing after me. Not at the moment, anyway. How can you be sure? I asked. Emma shrugged. I can't. But they were coming for me all last semester, and they've suddenly stopped. It's only reasonable to deduce that they're biding their time until the proper moment. If the ritual date were anywhere close, they'd be doing everything they could to kidnap me right now. Her point made sense. Delmare was the calmest. She laid a hand on Emma's knee and said, I understand why you didn't bring this up. It's upsetting to everyone. But we want you to know we're here for you, no matter what. That's not all, Emma continued. The hag said, before the first of the snow melts away at the end of the fourth winter, I will meet my death. That's only a few years away. Nothing is going to happen to you, I said, as the girls gasped. The prophecy is wrong. Emma frowned. Prophecy or not, this is serious. The same hag who came to foretell the prophecy came to me in my tent during the king's contest. She told me if I was to keep Ethan alive, I had to use the dark necklace to do it. She promised he would be king. I felt like she was sent by Melona to be my guide. I kept silent about the second encounter. The hag had made things up. I wasn't due to be king now, was I? Odette perked up. Is this like when you met Melona in the forest? Odette! Kiara and Delmare hissed at the same time. Odette turned pink and put a few fingers over her lips. The boys gasped. I felt blood rush from my face. W what Emma growled. Odette, you weren't supposed to tell him. I am your mate, I all but roared. Several people shushed me, but I ignored them. This is something I should know. Emma gave me a steely look. I didn't want to worry you. You saw a goddess, Emma. That's nothing to ignore. Those who meet Malona are destined for an early death. Alexei spoke up. His voice was wavering and fearful. The meeting was nothing bad. She came to me and asked me to be her champion. She wanted me to accomplish her work in her name, Emma said. She blessed me with her power. Why didn't you think to tell me this? I rubbed my eyes. I was absolutely furious. The king's contest was only a short time away by that point. I was focused on helping you survive the tourney, not venting to you about my issues, Emma cried. Uh, I think we're forgetting about one little tiny detail. Stefan said, breaking off our bickering. We don't know a thing about this prophecy, what being the world weaver means, or what Malona wants Emma to do. 
What we do know is that Gabby and Elijah are about to be coronated. We agreed after the king's contest to take them down, and we haven't done a thing yet to stop them. Who's we? Kiara's look was hard. Alexei and I weren't there. We made no such promise. Are you serious? You're going to back out? Emma snapped. Kiara faced Emma. I'm sorry, but this goes against our morals as Griffins. Our faction values honesty. You guys cheated, and as much as we despise them, Gabby and Elijah won the king's contest fair and square. They deserve to be on that throne. We'll help you with the prophecy, and as your destiny as the world weaver, but don't ask us to interfere with stopping the coronation, because we won't. Alexei said nothing, merely stared at the floor. I knew we couldn't get him on our side if Kiara wasn't willing to help. Gabby and Elijah aren't going to do Malovia any favors. We'll be lucky if they don't rip it apart, I said. I understand your concern, Ethan. I know they're going to be horrible rulers, which is why Alexei and I won't turn you in or try to stop you, Kiara frowned. But don't ask us to get involved. We can't risk our lives for something we don't agree with. Stefan crossed his arms and mumbled under his breath. Cowards. Alexei started, and Kiara grew an illusion in her palm as a threat, but I came between them. It's fine. I'm not forcing anyone into this. Privately, I didn't want anyone but myself getting involved anyway. I didn't wish to put my friends in the line of fire, but the rest of them were in too deep to go back now. Kiara dropped her head. I'll do what I can to research this prophecy and the world weaver. I want to make sure Emma lives past the ominous date the hag gave her. As far as overthrowing Gabby and Elijah, keep us out of it. Kiara scurried away, and Alexei followed. Theo scowled and said, Griffins, no sort of spine to them whatsoever. Alicorns never run from a fight. It doesn't matter. We don't need them, I forced out, but it felt like a lie. Stefan's right. As far as we know, the Black Claw has stopped coming for Emma. She's safe for now, but Gabby and Elijah are to be crowned by the end of the semester. If it's going to be hard getting them off the throne beforehand, it'll be nearly impossible after they're coronated. So how do we stop them? Delmare asked. She leaned forward. The rest of us created a circle, dropping our voices to a whisper. The trials of competency, I hushed. They're due to take place in March. If Gabby and Elijah are proven unfit to rule... The Circle will have to find another king and queen. But that's months away. Can we wait that long? Stefan asked. We don't have a choice, Emma replied. We can't assassinate or otherwise incapacitate them. It looks too suspicious. One of us will get caught. The best way to get rid of them is to prove to the Circle they're not competent enough to run a country. That gives us almost eight weeks to come up with an ironclad plan, Delmare whispered, one that's idiot-proof. Hey, Stefan started, but Delmare smacked his shoulder. I rolled my eyes. Are we in agreement? The competency trials are our best bet, I asked. Everyone nodded. Students were beginning to come back into the rec room after lunch. Odette gave a shifty look around, and Theo said, We should split up. It looks like we're plotting something. We were, but we didn't want to get caught for it before we'd even made a plan. Odette paired off with Theo and Stefan with Delmare. Both couples went in different directions. Emma went ahead of me to return to her dorm, but I hastily followed. As she opened her door, I grabbed her arm. I dropped my voice low. The goddess, Emma? How many more secrets are you keeping from me, Ona Wilke? Her tone was hard. Let me get one thing straight, Ethan Nowak. Everything I do in my life is for you. Even back then, before we made our mating vow, it was no different. I didn't tell you about Malona because I knew it would upset you. I didn't want to argue about this out in the open. I pulled her inside her dorm and shut the door behind us. Before I was your mate, I was your friend. Friends tell each other major stuff like this. You told the girls before you told me. The contest was days away at that point. Your life was on the line, she shouted. Besides, when something bad happens to me, you freak out and become uncontrollable. And this wasn't even bad. This was something good. My blood pumped as my temper rose, and I became aware of the privacy around us. Being alone with Emma was always dangerous. All it made me want to do was rip her clothes off and plunge into her. Arguing only made it worse. 
It's a visitation from a goddess, I said. You don't understand what that means in our society. I do. It means I'm marked for death. But so what? I already knew that from the hag. She shot back. I don't want you to die, Emma. The pleading helplessness in my voice was evident. So many signs were piling up, foreshadowing Emma's end, and I couldn't bear it. This was torturous. Emma's face softened. She reached up to brush back my hair and said, If Malona wills it, I'm okay. I want to do what's best for the Arcania, not for myself. I hated she was like me in that aspect. I wanted her to be selfish, to hoard her life and shrink from the path Malona had called her to. Mostly because I didn't want to give her up, but also because I wanted her to live, even if it wasn't by my side. If Emma rejected me, so be it. But regardless, she needed to stay alive. I will not have you dead. I reached out and took her face in my hands. Overcome with passion, I kissed her. Emma did not resist the kiss, only pressed into me and fisted her hands in my shirt, as if this was her way of apologizing. My tongue entered her mouth, and Emma moaned. I wrapped my arms around her and drew her close. She felt so small and frail against my wide form that I held back, fearful I may crush her. Her needy hands yanked me closer, and I felt our bodies press against each other, both of us pulsating with undeniable need. Her breasts crashed against my chest, and as my fingers caressed her thigh, I felt her shiver. Despite myself, I found my hand inching up under her skirt. She gasped, and I pressed my fingers against her panties, which were wet. Hmm. Looked like arguing turned her on, too. I didn't know if that was fucked up or hot, only that there was so much passion in the room it felt like it was hard to breathe. These school uniforms were brilliant. They made for easy access. I moved aside her panties and shuddered as my fingers graced the soft area between her thighs. I rubbed her lightly there, and her head lolled as she enjoyed the heavy moment. I'd never touched a woman in this way before. It made the wolf inside me go mad with want. We were cloaked under a fog of desire that made it hard to keep our thoughts straight. I couldn't process words, only feelings and emotions. Everything was Emma, and I was becoming so wrapped within her essence that my mind found it hard to escape. Just as I was about to enter her, Emma slumped. I thought it might be from pleasure, until I realized with horror she'd passed out. I caught her just before she hit the floor. Emma? Emma! All the sexual tension in the room had evaporated to be replaced by my panic. I carried her to the bed and asked, Ona Wilke, what's going on? What do you need? Water, she said. I went to the mini-fridge and pulled out a bottle. I handed it to her, and she sipped from it slowly. Are you okay? Why didn't you tell me you weren't feeling well? Gods, had this been my fault? I should have taken things slower. I was lightheaded after the group conversation, she murmured. I went to lie down. And I'd followed her in here to yell at her. What a jackass I was. I'm so sorry, Ona Wilke. What can I do? I just need sleep. I've been up late most nights, she yawned. Doing what? My mind wandered. Just studying. My classes are hard this semester. I'm exhausted. Emma nuzzled against my side and closed her eyes. She curled into me, and I stroked her red hair until she faded off into dreamland. I didn't have classes the rest of the day, so I stayed with Emma until she woke up later that afternoon. She remained at my side, sleeping soundlessly against my chest. When she asked for food, I insisted she remain in bed while I got something for her supper, though she seemed too weak to take down anything but soup. She went back to bed shortly after that. I let her rest as the nighttime hours closed in. My stomach was knotted with anxiety. I felt like there was something Emma wasn't telling me, something that was affecting her health. A million terrible thoughts flooded my head. What was she too afraid to tell me? I needed to be there for her and I needed to find out what she was hiding so I could do something to help. That is, if it was within my power to do. Though I couldn't shake the nauseating feeling that whatever was wrong with Emma had something to do with me. Chapter 6 Emma I hope you're keeping your mate in line, Sosna. Or should I say, White Rose? 
Gabby had cornered me on my way to introduction to portals. She placed a hand on her hip and raised an eyebrow at me. My insides curled viciously. All I wanted to do was slap her in the face, but as students passed me by, I knew it'd be a bad idea to lash out. If I hurt her, I'd get into trouble for smacking the future queen, and she'd bring down more repercussions on me after. Gabby knew my identity as a vigilante because I'd been forced to tell her. It was my only plan for keeping Ethan off her back, and thank the gods, she actually thought it was a good idea. The Phantom hasn't shown up since the White Rose confronted him. I scared him off, I said. For fuck's sake, what more did the bitch want from me? I was doing what she asked. For now, Gabby said. But if I know the prince, curiosity will get the best of him. It won't be long before he's back out there hunting cultists, and I expect you to stop him when he does. Stop him how? I was getting impatient. Gabby tilted her head. By any means necessary. I've been informed by the cult he's discovered their little hideout. If he does anything, and I mean anything, to interfere, he'll pay the price. The Black Claw are our allies. We need them. They're no allies of mine, I sneered. Gabby frowned. Careful, Sosna. Things are changing quickly in Malovia. You'll want to be on the winning side if you know what's good for you. Gabby swaggered off. I tried not to scream. If I didn't choke her before this was all over, it'd be a miracle. What did she mean by winning side? Did she expect the Arcania to revolt once she and Elijah brought Droga back from the dead? Of course she did. Not so many Fae would be willing to follow the god of the Unseelie. Most Fae had sworn themselves to Tomir, the god of Seelie Fae. They'd fight back. And Gabby and Elijah were planning to crush that rebellion as swiftly as possible. I hated that I was working for them. But I had no choice. Not if I wanted to keep Ethan breathing. Ethan hadn't become the Phantom again since I'd spooked him but he still crept around at night, which meant I had to tail him in case he got into trouble. Sleep was the last thing I was getting, which was proving detrimental to my disorder. It was the reason I'd fainted while we were fooling around last week. I'd been running on less than a few hours of rest, and he hadn't touched me since that moment, the fucking tease. He hadn't even kissed me. I didn't know if we were waiting to talk about boundaries or if he was just scared to make the first move. I resolved if Ethan didn't do something about it soon, then I would. I was only holding off on getting close to him because Gabby was keeping an eye on us, but she didn't have cameras in my bedroom. I could fuck Ethan all I wanted, and she didn't have to know a damn thing about it. Still, how could Ethan and I share our bodies when we were both hiding a huge secret? Could I give him everything while knowing he didn't want to tell me about the Phantom? Sex was supposed to make you vulnerable. Ethan and I still had our walls up. He'd had such pretty words for me the other day. He said that whatever mates did, they did together, for better or for worse. That both were equally responsible for the good or bad that arose, from the relationship or otherwise. But it didn't seem to be that way with the Phantom. Ethan said my crimes were his to bear, but it was the same the other way around. His crimes were mine, too. Yet that wasn't all. Ethan had a vision we could change our society, that we could keep the good things about the Fae and change the bad ones. And because he was my mate, it had become my dream, too. Everything about our lives was becoming integrated, weaving together and spinning into threads that were so tightly bound I didn't know where his dream started and mine began. It was like we were one and the same. It was overwhelming to the point I almost needed space. I hadn't seen Ethan since that heated moment we'd shared. And to be honest, I didn't want to. I was still trying to process our relationship and everything he meant to me, which was more than I could put into words. Lord Lucian taught introduction to portals. I entered his classroom and took a seat near the front. Odette was in the seat beside me. She was cheerfully humming, writing into her fuzzy pink notebook with a pen that had a fluffy pink pom-pom at the end of it. She had a big, baggy sweater on over her uniform today that looked like it was eating her alive. Hey, I didn't see you at lunch, I said as I sat down. 
That's because I didn't have time to eat, she gushed. But I grabbed a fruit on the way here. She held up a small, singular apple. I made a face. Odette, that's not enough. Odette shrugged. You're a figure skater, Emma. You know how it is. We have to watch our weight. I did, but too many dancers and skaters sacrificed their health in an attempt to be the best. I didn't want to see Odette become one of them. She took a bite out of the apple and I chilled out. At least she was eating something. I was looking too far into it. Anyway, forget about all that, Odette swooned. I've been dying to tell you. I auditioned for the lead in the Malovian Ballet's rendition of Romeo and Juliet this spring, and I got the part! I'm going to be playing Juliet! I squealed and gave her a hug. The Malovian Ballet was a prestigious company. I was thrilled she'd landed the lead. Odette, that's great! Who's playing Romeo? Theo, Odette said automatically. Companies usually put us together. The director said we have great chemistry. Well, if that wasn't a fucking coincidence... That's very romantic, I said. Do you think the production will bring you closer? Maybe inspire some late night rendezvous behind the curtains after practice? What, me and Theo? Odette let out a skeptical laugh. You're so funny, Em. Theo and I aren't that way. He's not into me. I wasn't sure if Odette was still in denial or that oblivious. Theo practically drooled over her every day of the week. But guess what? Odette burst. There's someone who is. Do you remember Igor? Is he the alicorn you danced with at the ball last year? I asked, barely remembering him. Odette had mentioned his name in passing. Yep, Odette said. He works for the Malovian Ballet. He saw my audition and asked me on a date. We're going out tonight. Isn't that wonderful? My mouth dried up, but I forced out. Great. I hesitated before I asked. Does Theo know? Yeah, he saw Igor ask me out, Odette said. Why does that matter? Lord Lucian entered the room and I said, never mind. I wasn't getting through to her and class was about to start. I didn't have enough time to convince her now. Theo had told me he'd bonded with Odette, but that she didn't know yet. He was too chicken to confess and wanted her to come to the realization on her own. I'd tried talking him out of it, but he was insistent he was doing the right thing and begged me not to say anything to her. Looked like Theo needed to hurry up and summon some courage. Otherwise, this Igor guy was going to steal Odette away. I felt bad for my friends, but decided to stay out of it. As much as I wanted to help, I had major relationship issues of my own. I hope you'll listen closely, Lucien began as he came to the front of the room. This will be on the final exam. Everyone in the room gave a collective groan. Don't be like that, Lucian scolded. This is crucial information for a fate to know. Please pay attention. Lucian turned to the chalkboard. He used his woven telepathy magic to levitate a piece of chalk in the air. It began writing notes behind him as he spoke. Now, as you know, portals are magical transport systems Fey create with illusion magic. Lucian said. Most magical races than just Arcania can make portals, though they are not as widespread in other societies due to their extreme difficulty. The primary function of portals is to get from one place to another quickly. However, since creating portals takes an exceptional amount of magical energy, most Arcania prefer to use their wings instead to get from place to place. Lucian gestured to the chalkboard as the chalk began drawing a circular image on the board. The more people you transport through a portal, the more difficult it is to sustain. Minor fey and shifters can create portals that are able to travel single people within a few blocks or kilometers. Major sorceresses are strong enough to make portals that could take a group of people to another country on Earth entirely, though they'd most likely have to find a way back without magic. A kid named Nikolai raised his hand. So, let's just say you need to move an army. Could you potentially make a portal big enough to march the army through, even one by one, so they wouldn't waste energy traveling in other ways? That was a weird-ass question, Lucian frowned. In theory, it's possible. But to create something powerful enough to transport thousands of warriors at once would take immense effort. 
Such a person would have to be considered a demigod of sorts to pull that kind of magic off without killing themselves. Too much magical energy exerted at once will always kill the caster, no questions asked. Nikolai seemed disappointed. The chalk changed direction, so it was working on a drawing of a forest instead of the circle. Lucian continued. Portals can serve as more than a magical teleportation system. At their best, portals can be doorways into other places in the universe, locations that are not on Earth. Long ago, when the Fae used to bewitch and abduct humans back to Edamire, we'd create fairy circles, spheres of mushrooms in the grass, which, if humans stepped in, they'd be transported back to our home world. These fairy circles were actually cleverly disguised portals made by sorceresses meant to lure and trap humans, especially young ones, though this practice has died out since we've been unable to reach Edenmire. Only the most exceptionally powerful among us have the ability to create portals to other realms and dimensions. That is why, ever since the portal to Edenmire closed long ago, it has remained shut. So far, no fee on the earth has been powerful enough to open it up again. Lucian strode to the middle of the room. To create a portal, you must have utmost confidence. The process works by imagining yourself opening up a pocket in reality. You use that pocket to slip through space and come out the other side. Envision yourself at the destination and you are already there. Observe. Lucian waved his hands. In the air before him appeared a spinning magic, almost like a firecracker whirling in midair. The firecracker spun and sputtered as Lucian opened his arms, and the portal widened, large enough for him to step through. Lucian walked into the portal, and as he did, he vanished. A few surprised notes went throughout the classroom, until a similar portal opened up on the other side of the room. Lucian strode through, and there were a few impressed claps. Lucian nodded his head. Do portals work for time travel? Nikolai wondered aloud. Like, could you use it to change the past or the future? Lucian shook his head. Time travel is another matter entirely. No fae or supernatural being, for that matter, has ever managed to perform it. Such mysteries lie with the specter door of shadow, Neva, the goddess of time. Lucian gestured for us to rise. Push your desks to the side. I want everyone to work on creating a portal of their own. Don't worry. If you fail, it won't hurt you, just throw you back. I expect everyone to be able to create their own portal by the end of this semester. Chairs and desks made scraping sounds as they were moved to the side. I watched as students performed the same hand gestures Lucian had done the moment before. As their portals opened, many tried to step through but ended up being blasted backward as the portal shut unexpectedly. Too many were thrown against the wall or on their ass as the portal sent them flying. Odette made little grunting noises as she concentrated. She was still struggling to create her portal, but I hadn't tried yet. Lucian laid a hand on my shoulder. Emo, what's the hesitation? He asked. I scowled. To be honest, I don't want to end up with a broken leg. I observed as Nikolai helped a girl off the ground who'd been thrown so far backward by her portal she'd landed in the desks on the other side of the room and torn the sleeve of her sweater. We try here at Arcania University. Broken bones are not something to be afraid of, Lucian encouraged. Easy for him to say. He didn't have a big skating competition coming up next fall. I'm not sure I can do it, I confessed. Emma, a core tenet of illusion magic is belief. If you make the choice to do something, and are certain you will go through whatever means necessary to make that achievement, you will be able to accomplish great feats of magic, Lucian said. But you will never get anywhere if you don't take the first step. But I doubt myself, I admitted. How can I believe I can do magic if I'm just feeling, I don't know, unconfident? You can feel negative emotions while still persisting in belief, Lucian said. Belief is a choice, Emma not something we feel. Faith is something we do in spite of conflicting emotions, not something we experience. Have faith your magic can do this, no matter what your head or your heart says. I took a breath. He was right. I didn't want to be seen as a coward for refusing to do the assignment. Okay, let me try. Lucian stepped back. I summoned my magic, concentrating on it as a ball of energy in my chest. 
It waited there, warm and powerful. It was ready to do whatever I told it to. At that moment, it truly felt like I could accomplish anything. Okay, I told myself. I am going to make this portal, and I am going to reappear next to the chalkboard. I'm not leaving this classroom until I do. This will be easy for me, and if it's not, I'll take the steps I need to in order to make it easy. I can do this. My magic is strong enough. I moved my hands in the way Lucian had shown us. At first, a bit of doubt rose in my stomach, and the sparks that emerged in front of me flickered like they were about to go out. No, I thought. This is going to work. I've decided that it will. The doubt was still there, but my magic persisted besides. The portal opened. I saw when I faced it, the portal created a window to where I wanted to go, displaying the desk beside the chalkboard. I dropped my hands. I was sure the portal was steady, but my head screamed at me not to walk through it, just in case it backfired. Don't care. Doing it anyway. I held my breath as I walked through the portal. A sensation of weightlessness came over me as I passed through. Colors swirled around me in a beautiful rainbow, almost making it look like I was the center of a mix of paints and water. It felt like I was floating, though I pushed my feet to move forward. My shoes hit solid ground again, and the portal closed behind me as I emerged next to the chalkboard, twelve feet from where I was standing before. A wide smile spread across my face. I'd done it, and on my first try. Well done, Lucian announced. We made our first success of the day. A couple of people cheered, though most sent me dirty looks. They wanted to be the first one to do it, and me, the shunned cheater, had shown them up. Odette clapped her hands and bounced. Yay! Go, Emma! I tried again. This time, I was able to make the portal take me back to the spot I'd been standing in before. I made three others, each one taking me to different places around the classroom. I expected one of them to fail and backfire on me at some point, but none of them did. Unlike most forms of magic, portals were so freaking easy for me. I could do these in my sleep. Odette and I used the rest of class time to practice making them. Half of the class had gotten it by the time our hour was up, but no one had managed to make as many as I did. In fact, I was so proficient Lucian asked me to work ahead and showed me how to begin shutting down portals that were created by other Fey. I closed each of the portals he summoned with ease as I focused my intention on blocking his power. I felt relieved. I was usually behind in most of my classes on account of being the outcast. I might get a good grade for once instead of barely passing like I had last semester. Hey, C's get degrees, right? Portal work is not something I recommend for everyday practice, Lucian announced as class ended. In fact, I advise you to create portals only when it is absolutely necessary. Overextending your powers by summoning a portal that is beyond your control has been known to result in death. Use them wisely. Ew, uh, that wasn't pleasant. As people flooded out of the classroom, I touched Odette's arm. She looked exhausted and hadn't created a portal all session. Odette, are you all right? Odette was breathing hard. Yeah, I'm... I'm fine. I frowned. I felt tired from making the portals, sure, but not like Odette. Maybe it just affected us differently. While Odette gathered her things, I watched Lord Lucian. He sat at his desk and was working on grading papers. Odette and I were the only people left in here. I got an idea. Hey, can I catch up with you later? I asked Odette. I need to talk to Lucian. Her eyelids hung half-closed. Okie dokie. See you around. As Odette walked out, I stood in front of Lucian's desk. Lord Lucian, can I talk to you? I know it's not your office hours, but it's important. Lucian looked up and put his quill down. You don't need to come by during my office hours to speak to me, Emma. As one of my favorite students, you can drop by whenever you wish. I smiled. I didn't know I was one of his favorites. Thanks. I pulled up a chair and sat in front of his desk. I'll try not to take up too much of your time. 
I just have a question. Ask away. Lucian leaned back in his chair, folding his hands. My gut churned nervously. I... I was wondering if you could tell me what the World Weaver is. Lucian's eyes got large. His complexion went slightly pale, and if I wasn't seeing things, I think his hands started to shake. Hoarsely, he said, The World Weaver, why would you want to know about that? I'm writing a paper on it for another class, I lied, but I can't find any resources. You teach Fey history and are the most knowledgeable professor I know. I was hoping you could tell me where to start my research. Lucian didn't look like he believed me. I couldn't blame him. I didn't think this stuff was the kind of material they covered in first-year classes. But he sighed and said, What is it you want to know? What it is, basically. What it means, I said. I know the Black Claw wants to use the World Weaver's blood to resurrect Droga, but I don't know how or why. Lucian nodded. You are correct on that, Miss Sosna. The World Weaver is an intricate piece of Fey lore. The ancient Seely had stories and legends about her, but they were lost long ago after the separation of the Unseelie and Seely courts. So she's definitely a woman, and she's existed before? I asked. In a way, Lucian said. There was once many World Weavers in Nedemire, all female. She was not so much a person as more of a type of magic. A world weaver is a portalist whose exceptional skill was able to transcend different realities and realms. A world weaver could open a portal to any realm in any universe, whenever they wished. Wow. I guess that explained why portals were so easy for me. So what happened to them? I asked. All of the world weavers had on Seely blood. They were killed after the Seely won the war, Lucian said. I froze. All of them had unseelie blood, but I wasn't a dark fey, was I? Did that mean I was the first ever Seely world weaver? And if so, why now, after centuries had gone by? Lucian noticed my silence, so I rushed to say something. But you gave a lecture last semester how the Black Claw was looking for the world weaver on the night of Palinok, so they could use her to restore Droga to life. How can that be possible if the World Weavers were unseely and there's no unseely left? The World Weaver we're speaking of currently, mind you, if she exists, is thought to be a bridge between the two sides, Lucian said. A seely fay with unseely blood on her line. That's what enables her to have exceptional power and raise Droga from the dead. I swallowed a lump in my throat. I couldn't have unseely ancestry. Could I? Before Lucian could get suspicious, I asked, So do the Black Claw have a certain day on which they have to take the World Weaver's blood? I knew this already, though maybe Lucian could give me a date. He leaned forward. Yes, but as far as the proper time, I couldn't tell you. I've researched the World Weaver for decades, and I haven't even managed to find the year, let alone the exact date. Oh... My voice sounded disappointed. Lucian raised an eyebrow. Is there a particular reason you chose this topic for your paper? I shook my head. No, sir. I just thought it sounded interesting. Huh. Lucian scowled. Well, curious minds and all that. But I hope you have a strong stomach. Some of the aspects of the World Weaver's history is somewhat gruesome. Their magic was used to achieve great things, but also terrible, horrible things. There is a reason the gods permitted their extinction. A shiver crawled over my skin. I'm sure if the World Weaver is real, she's been sent by the gods to restore balance and make things right. That's why Milana had chosen me as her champion. To save the Fae. At least, I hoped so. Lucian's gaze was introspective. Perhaps. If the World Weaver is out there, I hope she uses her powers for good. Giving so much magic is a great responsibility. Keep in mind, not everyone goes to the Great Hunting Grounds after death. I didn't know what he meant. I mean, if Arcania didn't go there, where would they go? But I didn't want Lucian to get suspicious, so I stood up and said, 
Thank you for your help, Professor. This will be vital to my research. Any time. Oh, and Emma. I paused before I reached the doorway. Lucien's voice was stern when he spoke. Be careful. Don't go missing with things before you're ready. My throat closed up. I wasn't able to speak, so I just nodded and I hurried out of there. Panic closed in on me as I wandered the halls of Arcania University. I felt like Lucian knew I was the World Weaver. If he didn't know for sure, I was certain he at least suspected. He couldn't prove it, not yet, but if I wasn't careful, he'd be able to eventually. Lord Lucian was one of my favorite teachers. I liked him, but I didn't know if I could trust him with the fate of the Arcania. I trusted my friends and no one else. Who else had figured it out? Lady Magdalena? Is that why she had such big plans for me? I hoped to the gods Lady Corva didn't have any idea. I couldn't take that kind of pressure. I'd managed to calm myself down by the time I made it to the library. I'd come here on purpose, looking for Kiara. I needed help sorting this out and knew she'd be my best asset. Thank the gods she was there, sitting at a desk by the window. She had books spread over the table and was bent over them, scribbling notes with a quill. She was sitting next to a studious woven girl with light brown hair and brown eyes. Her name was Mava. She loved books and could always be seen with one in her arms. She got all the top grades in school. As such, it was typical to see her and Kiara studying together. I knew Mava was a woven not just by the mark on her hand, but also by her disposition. Shifters could tell what everyone's faction was by their scent, but honestly, it wasn't that difficult to tell no matter the gender. Alicorns were tall, slender, and blonde. Dragons were bulky, gruff, and loud, while griffins were reserved, shy, and patient. Wolvens were typically dark-haired introverts who kept silent more often than spoke. They preferred to observe. It'd taken me a while to tell the different factions apart when I first got to Arcania University, but now it was easy for me. I slid into the seat beside Kiara's. We had no hard feelings after the group meeting in the rec room. I wanted her to help us take down Gabby and Elijah, but I wasn't going to force her. I felt like I was asking a big favor for requesting her help with the World Weaver business. Hello, Emma, Mava said kindly. She began gathering up stacks of textbooks as she said, I wish I could stay and chat, but there's an author signing in Dolinska. A couple of famous co-writers are coming to sign books. I don't want to miss it because they're my favorite authors. Do you girls want to come with? It's okay, I'm kind of busy, I said. But save an autograph for me, won't you? Mava nodded. She looked to Kiara, but she shook her head no, and Mava hurried out of the library. I took a breath. Kiara... Is it okay if I ask you something? Kiara sighed. She seemed sort of down. I'm sorry, Emma. I've searched for days for information about the Weld Weaver in the library and otherwise, and I haven't found anything. It's not about that, I said. I don't blame you for being unable to find info on the World Weaver. This is complex stuff. I've always gotten ahead with research before, Kiara said in frustration. It feels like I'm failing. You're not. It's okay. I spoke with Lucien about it. I didn't tell him I was the World Weaver, just made it look like a research project, I said as she started. He gave me some pretty useful information. I told Kiara what Lucien had said to me moments ago. Kiara mused over what I said. Lord Lucien is probably right. He's rarely wrong. I'm just wondering how he knows all of this if I haven't been able to find anything. Where did he get his information from? I don't know but he's a part of the circle. They might have insider knowledge not available to anyone else. Kiara nodded introspectively. That's a very good point. But if that's true, why did he tell you about it? I twirled a strand of hair around my finger. I don't know. But to be honest, we're kind of close. Maybe he trusts me not to go spreading this around. She tapped her fingers against her books. Maybe. Though I do think he's right about one thing. What? You having unseely blood, Kiara said. It's a theory I've had for ages. I just couldn't prove it. You think I'm part unseely? I asked. Kiara stroked her chin with her quill. Something's not right, Emma. 
for you to use an unseelie object like the Dark Necklace, one with so much power, you'd have to be part unseelie. Any pure-blooded Seely who tried to draw from that necklace would be dead. The dark magic would have killed them. Then why hasn't the Circle investigated me? Wouldn't they suspect me of being part of the Black Claw? I asked. Having unseelie blood isn't against the law. It's in most of our genealogies just watered down from past generations. And you killed a Black Claw tribute last semester, Kiara pointed out. How could you be part of them if you're killing their members? That was a good point. If the necklace is as powerful as you're saying, the Circle should have punished me for using it, I protested. It's enough punishment that you and Ethan have lost the throne and been disgraced, Kiara said. You don't understand how awful it is to be shunned in Arcanian society, Emma, because you're an outsider, but your punishment won't ever end. Both your honor and Ethan's is gone now. They don't need to punish you when our world considers you a liar for the rest of your life. I gaped. But why do you think I'm unseely? I thought any fae could use dark magic. Yes, but not so much at once. I didn't understand just how powerful an object it was until I watched you use it in the King's Contest, Kiara said. That you survived at all must mean you have a close unseely relative in your bloodline. You're their descendant. I became breathless. Me, part unseely? It couldn't be. At the same time, it was the only thing that made sense. We should tell the others about this, I said. It's important. I agree, Kiara said, before she added. Though this is something we need to keep within the group. If people knew you had unseelie blood, they'd think you were pure evil. They wouldn't trust you and try to hurt you. I scoffed. Well, too late for that. You've got enough enemies, Emma. You don't need to make more, Kiara said disapprovingly. But what is it you wanted to ask me? Well, I was kind of confused by Lucian's lecture, I said. Lucian said that not all fey go to the Great Hunting Grounds after death. So, if you don't go to the Great Hunting Grounds, where do you go? To the Underworld, she clarified. It's a horrible place. Is it hell? Many cultures have a version of it. To the Elementi, it's a place where you're separated from your loved ones. You watch them die in a place of never-ending rest, she said. To the Miriamic Coven, it's a land of endless physical torture. Your body is mutilated, only to regenerate and be tortured over and over again. That made me sick to hear. What about us? Our underworld? It's not a happy place. She shivered. There isn't physical pain. And you don't see your loved ones die, but you're alone in a mansion of your own creation. You're always hungry to the point of starvation, but no matter how much you eat, it doesn't satisfy the hunger. You're desperately thirsty, but the water never quenches your thirst. You have endless riches and every material thing you ever wanted, but you get no enjoyment or happiness from them. Nothing satisfies the longing inside of you. The gods ignore your pleading and prayers. Worst of all, there's no one to talk to or share your loneliness with. There's nothing but your thoughts. You're cut off from any light or love that you ever may experience. You're stuck in the endless cycle of your own greed. Forever. My guts twisted. If that's true, why would anyone, Black Claw or otherwise, agree to follow Droga? Why would Gabby and Elijah swear themselves to the underworld just to suffer in the afterlife? For power, she said. It's thought that once Doroga is raised again, he'll defeat Tomir and take over the great hunting grounds before he conquers Adenmaya, Melovia, and the rest of Earth. He's promised his followers great magic if they risk the underworld for him, along with eternal life. Some people are willing to exchange some time spent in hell for the chance to become supreme and immortal rulers of both Earth and Edenmire if Droga succeeds. The Black Claw's mission became chillingly clear. If they used my blood to successfully raise Droga, and if Droga managed to defeat Tomir and the other gods, he'd take control, and his followers would rule over us all. Elijah and Gabby had signed up to follow Droga on the hope he'd reward them with immortal power. 
They probably figured they'd never even spend any time in hell anyway, because they were young and they would be alive by the time Droga came back. He'd put them on the throne forever in thanks of serving him. Elijah and Gabby's rule wasn't just a temporary position. It was a permanent one. They'd live into eternity and Malovia would never be free. What a fucking nightmare. Kiara frowned. You see what we're dealing with. If that's true, how can you be okay with not doing anything about this? I asked in frustration. Doesn't it go against a griffin's ideals for two rulers to be on the throne for literal eternity? Kiara hesitated. Yes, but there's more to it. Then tell me, I pleaded. We can work something out. Kiara's eyes wandered. Someone walked by, Alexei. He was with Theo, who seemed kind of depressed, on account of Odette going on a date with another man, I bet. Alexei smiled and waved as he passed. Kiara waved back, a blush rising in her cheeks. The reason for her refusal to help was clear. Kiara wasn't holding back on overthrowing Gabby and Elijah because of her morals. She was doing it to protect Alexei, because she knew the work we were doing was dangerous. If we got caught... He'd end up on the chopping block for high treason with the rest of us. Kiara bit her lip, and I said, You know what? It's fine. I understand. Kiara's shoulders slumped. She seemed relieved, if but a little guilty. I'm sorry, Emma. You know I would if only... You don't have to explain. You have your reasons. And they were valid. If I could turn back time, I would have done everything to prevent Ethan from getting involved if he wasn't already. But as Lucian explained, no such magic existed. And even if it did, I didn't think all the magic in the world would be enough to deter Ethan from his path of revenge. I just hoped, whatever happened, I didn't lose him. I'd had practice at the rink that day, then stayed in the rec room with Delmer and Kiara. We watched movies until late that night. Odette had promised she'd be there, but for some reason, she didn't show. I'd seen her stumble in around nine and head directly to her dorm, looking exhausted. I glanced at Delmer, but we didn't say anything. It was past midnight now, and no one was up. It was empty in the rec room. I'd reread the same sentence three times in the book I was holding. My eyes drooped, and I yawned, feeling like I was going to pass out any second. The girls had already gone to bed hours ago, but I'd stayed up for a little while longer, just in case. I thought I was in the clear, and gleefully thought to myself I'd be able to go to bed early tonight, just this once. Then I heard a dorm room door opening down the hall. God damn it. I tossed the book down and threw the blanket off of me so I could sneak around the corner. I poked my head around it, hoping against hope it was someone else. I swore when I saw Ethan had slipped out of his room. Gods, I wanted to kill him. Like, literally, rip his head off. Couldn't he give it a rest for one fucking day? Ethan had this hardened look on his face he always got when he was about to become the Phantom. There was no reason for him to be out this late at night. He had class early the next morning, so I knew exactly what he had in mind. Looks like Gabby was right. Ethan just couldn't stay away. He was going out in the field again, putting on that damn mask. His fear of the White Rose had finally become less pressing than his addiction to being a vigilante. I'd prayed he would hang it up. I'd hoped telling him I knew his identity would be enough for him to quit. But the gods knew Ethan was a stubborn man, and I was sure he'd rather die than give up being the Phantom. Like the devil herself, Gabby opened her dorm room door just down the hall. She'd been waiting for him, too. Her eyes followed Ethan as he headed down the stairs. Gabby turned her head and caught my gaze, raising her eyebrows in an obvious command. I clenched my teeth as Gabby shut the door behind her. Once again, I had no choice but to follow her orders. I was to tail Ethan tonight and thwart his plans to combat the cult while she laid her pretty little head on a feathered pillow and got a long, nice night of beauty sleep. But I couldn't keep doing this. The more I confronted Ethan, the bigger chance both of us would get killed. His late night escapading had to come to an end before we hurt each other. Or worse, he found me out. 
the white rose would stop the phantom. Tonight. And this time, I wasn't messing around. Chapter 7 Ethan I felt powerless. The phantom was the only way to get back some of that power. As hesitant as I was to go back into the field again, I had to. I knew where the Black Claw were hiding, and I couldn't let them continue in their operations. I had to do something, White Rose or not. I kept my eyes peeled for the sorceress as I ran toward the forest in my wolven form. I was looking for the same location as before, a cave set into the mountains deep in the woods. When I came to it, I searched everywhere for the Black Claw, but didn't see a sign of them. I carefully approached the cave. I expected to hit a magical boundary wall like I did before, but instead, nothing. I continued walking forward, my shifter eyes adjusted, enabling me to see in the dark. Yet the farther I went into the cave, the more empty it felt. My paws echoed as I walked across the stone, giving off a lonely sound that resonated within my bones. I got to the end of the cave. It halted in a circular alcove a hundred feet across. It was big enough for a base, but there was no one here. I took a deep breath. I could smell remnants of cultists. Sorceresses had been here only days before. There was still scents of things like incense and burnt candles drifting through the air. And blood. I smelled blood. I changed back into a man and cast an illusion spell, sparkling bits of light scattered from my gloved fingers illuminating the cave. I turned in a circle, observing what had been left behind. Crystals, charms, one cauldron, a few items of clothing, like a black cloak and a singular shoe. Stains of red littered the stone from the cult's sacrifices, but the blood was long past dry. They'd picked up and gone in a hurry days ago. They'd moved their location. But how? I searched the cave, looking for clues as to where they might have gone, but they'd left none behind. I was back at square one. Damn it. Every time I took a step forward, it was like the colt was five steps ahead. The white rose. She must have warned them. There was no other way. I bared my teeth. This woman was becoming a problem. I'd finally located the cult's base and had a chance to shut them down for good, and it was ruined by the White Rose's interference. I had to deal with her before she caused any more trouble for me. Tonight was a bust. I might as well go home. I walked out of the cave, my form tense. Lately, the Phantom was just as powerless as Prince Ethan. I shifted into a woven, but instead of going back to Arcania University, I changed my mind and headed in the other direction, creating tracks in the heavy snow. I wasn't done yet. I had to learn something new about the cult in order to avoid making this night a waste of my time. I was more or less being pathetically desperate. I didn't think I'd find anything, but instinct drove me on. For some reason, I followed my intuition south, toward the boundary wall that surrounded Malovia. It wasn't too far off, a few miles, mostly. I couldn't explain why, but it felt like that was where I had to be right now. I reached the border. I expected all to be quiet and uneventful. I was wrong. The border wall surrounding Malovia to keep monsters in was invisible, but an Arcanian could feel its magical energy pulsing through the area when it came near. Yet something was wrong. The border wall was weak. As I drew closer, I felt its power draining. There were holes in it big enough for monsters to step on through. The Black Claw had to be doing this. They were creating holes in the boundary wall so monsters could walk freely through and terrorize the human world beyond. But why? And for what purpose? The sound of a roar cut through the trees. I crouched down. My eyes widened in shock as I observed the scene ahead. There was a monster near the boundary wall, tied with ropes and chains. The creature was a Bukavich, a type of strange reptile. It resembled a warty toad, with six legs that ended in razor-sharp claws. Two massive horns stuck out of its head, and sharp teeth 
jutted out of its bulbous lips. The monster had to be twenty feet tall or more. Bukaviches were water monsters. They resided in swamps and were known to eat large game like bears that came by the streams to drink. They remained under water and didn't jump upon their prey until it was too late. They weren't necessarily common, however, not at this time of the year. Bukaviches hibernated in the winter in massive caverns until it was time to emerge in the spring. What was one doing out here at the end of January? The people holding the ropes and chains were the Black Claw. Male cultists, in both their human and shifter forms, struggled to contain the creature, while a few cultist sorceresses cast their illusion magic to hold the creature down. The giant monster fought, but despite its efforts to escape, it couldn't break free. The cultists finally forced the monster into a metal cage at the edge of the tree line. It screamed in rage and thrashed against the bars, struggling to get through. The woven cultists came forward and used their telepathy magic together to levitate the cage off the ground. I watched as the monster was carried into the woods, vanishing with the rest of the cultists as its cries penetrated the night. Why was the Black Claw imprisoning monsters? It made no sense. Wasn't their goal to let them slip into the border beyond? They must be using them for another purpose. A dark one, no doubt. I came out of the trees and into the meadow, changing back into a man. The Black Claw was gone. I planned to search the area for more clues. But the crunching of the snow behind me made me freeze. I turned. My veins turned to ice as I once again came face to face with a white rose. How had she found me? She must have been skulking around the cave. But even then, how had she caught up with me? Wolvens were fast runners, and she couldn't have followed me on foot. She must have wings. Flying would be the only way a sorceress could keep up with a shifter. Wings were a defining factor of an Arcania. No two were the same. If I saw her wings, I'd be able to figure out who she was. But she kept them concealed staring at me with blue eyes like mirrors. Her look was so haunted, it sent a shiver through my spine. You didn't listen when I told you to stay away, she said. She unleashed a dagger from her side. Looks like I'm going to have to teach you a lesson. She attacked before I could say anything in response. She ran at me full speed, the dagger folded at her side and waiting to strike. I took a defensive stance and withdrew my own weapon, ready to counterattack, but as I swung, she jumped over me, sailing in an arc as she flipped and landed on her feet on the other side. I was stunned. I'd never seen anyone pull off a move like that in my life. The surprise was just enough that it gave the white rose an opening, and she sliced forward with her dagger. I jumped backward in the nick of time, but not enough so that I got away without any damage. The tip of her blade cut my chest, digging in. Blood scattered across the snow. Ah! I stumbled. I wanted to examine the wound and see how badly she hurt me, but I didn't have time. The white rose began a relentless assault that I struggled to combat. Every time our blades met, something flashed in her eyes. Was it hatred? Or desperation? When she'd knocked my weapon to the side for the third time and almost cut me once again, I knew weapons weren't going to work with this woman. She'd been taught by a master and couldn't be bested that way. I needed to fight her with teeth and claws. I changed into a wolven and charged. The white rose's eyes widened behind her mask. She scrambled away, throwing out an illusion as I leapt for her throat. The illusion froze my limbs in place. My body became paralyzed for a few moments, and I fell to the ground like a statue of concrete. When I hit the snow, I regained control of my motor skills, but the white rose had gained the upper hand. Before I could get to my feet, she flung her arm out. A powerful illusion spell overtook me. It pinned me to the snow, spreading over my limbs like some kind of thick tar. It was insanely uncomfortable. Panic swelled in me as the white rose approached. What was she going to do with me? Was she going to kill me? I had to fight back with magic of my own. I harnessed what illusion magic was left inside of me and pressed against the white rose's spell. The sorceress gritted her teeth. She pushed her intention further down around me, though at this point I was beginning to rise. 
Once I'd managed to get back on my feet, I put all my will into breaking the spell and setting myself free. Finally, I tore the spell in two, and the white rose wavered. The cost of casting the spell hit her hard, and she fell to one knee. She was tired. She breathed in heavy pants as I approached. She looked up, her brown hair splayed across her face as I advanced. I'm going to tear you to shreds. I had every intention of doing so. This woman had foiled me twice. She wouldn't again. I ran, jaws extended toward her middle. The white rose forced herself to stand and did a few complicated, hasty maneuvers with her hands. A portal opened beside her, spinning rapidly and shooting off sparks that hissed as they hit the snow. She was getting away. I was within range. I changed back into a man and reached out my hand to grab her. The white rose bolted. My fingers uselessly grazed her cloak as she jumped through the portal. It sealed shut behind her, leaving me alone in the meadow. I screamed a cry of rage and kicked the snow. Why did the gods see fit to torture me like this? I wanted to follow, but I didn't know where she had gone, and I was useless at portal magic. Couldn't make a decent one if I tried. I put a hand to the gas she'd given my chest. It was bleeding, but wasn't deep. I wouldn't even need stitches. I'd bandage it up when I got home. My shifter healing abilities would mend the wound by tomorrow. Yet, if she'd been a bit faster, she would have gotten my heart. I huffed. I'd never get anywhere with my missions if this woman kept interfering. With her as a guard, the Black Claw would remain safe from my attacks, and that was something wholly unacceptable. I was changing my strategy. The Black Claw would have to wait, because I needed to discover the identity of the White Rose. February 1st was a freezing and dreary day in Malovia. Clouds had settled over the school, putting everything into a muddled shade of gray. It didn't help my mood. I knew I'd been in a bad way since my second confrontation with the White Rose, something Stefan was quick to point out. Would you please pull the hockey stick out of your ass? Stefan complained as we left the locker room together after practice. If you need help, bend over. Ha ha, I said sarcastically. The last thing on my mind was hockey at the moment, though I had to admit my performance today had been rather poor. You nearly took out Yan with one of your shots, Stefan countered. You're not on your game. It was true. I'd shot toward the goal but wasn't paying attention and hurtled the puck at one of my teammates, Yan. If he hadn't ducked, the puck would have smashed into his face and knocked him out. I gave a frustrated sigh. It doesn't matter. I don't think I'm cut out for this. I'm going to quit the team. What the fuck? You're our star player, Stefan shouted. Not anymore. On average, I usually scored two goals in our games against opposing teams. During the last three, I'd yet to sink one. I hadn't managed to put anything on the scoreboard after the Kings contest ended, and our roster was suffering horribly for it. I should back out and give some other guy a spot on the team. Someone who can actually make points. Dude, you can't give up hockey, Stefan said. It's hardly fun anymore, I said, though the comment hurt to say aloud. Elijah was on the team with us. I couldn't even get away from him at the rink. We'd been playing hockey together since we were kids. On any given day, I could put up with him and enjoy the sport, except in the last few weeks, he'd been intolerable to skate with. He acted like he owned the team now that he was to be crowned king. Lucian who was our coach, constantly butted heads with him. Elijah thought he was the god's gift to hockey and insisted on creating all the plays, no matter how stupid or ineffective they were. The team spent more time standing around watching them argue than actually practicing. It was getting old. I hoped when we had our next game, someone from the opposing team would put him in his place. It'd be nice to see Elijah get clobbered into the wall by a brutal check, or better yet, get the shit beat out of him during an on-ice fight. It was the only legal way anyone could touch him now. Maybe if I saw him lose a few teeth, it would settle some resentment burning in my chest. You're team captain. The boys are depending on you, Stefan said. You can't walk out on us now. Let Eli be captain. He knows it all. Bro, I'm tired of you being salty over your little shit of a cousin, Stefan said. 
It's time to stop being a bitch and put your big boy panties on. Excuse me? I rounded on him, dropping my bag. He dropped his beside mine. You heard me. Quit being a pansy, he shouted. I lunged. Stefan ducked, but I got my hands on him. We didn't really fight. More or less just tussled in the hallway and shoved each other. I kind of wanted to punch him, but still, shame had grown within me. I knew it was because he was right. As we wrestled, Lucian walked by with a coffee. He eyed us before he moaned tiredly. Boys, settle down. Stefan and I separated. I shoved him one last time, and he sent me the finger. Trying to bully me into buying your shit? I spat. I was so done with it all. For God's sake, I swear, if one more negative thing comes out of your mouth, I'm going to biff you, Stefan warned. Eli's going to be king, but we're doing something about it. You're not walking out on a sport you love because he's being a jackass. Suck it up and move on. I swept my hair out of my eyes. Fine. I know you're right. Of course I am, Stefan said smartly. Now come on, let's go see Emma. We took a detour to the opposite rink on the other side of the building, where they were hosting figure skating practice. Stefan nudged me as we walked through the double doors. So, you find out who your mystery lady is yet? No, I sighed. I told Stefan about the White Rose, but he knew as much about her as I did. It's maddening. I'll keep my eyes open, Stefan whispered. She's got to slip up at some point. She would, but I didn't know if either of us would be observant enough to catch it, particularly Stefan. A dump truck driving by with explosives was hardly enough to get his attention, and whoever the White Rose was, I had a feeling she was smarter than both of us. Emma was on the ice, practicing under Lady Magdalena's coaching. I watched as she circled the ice, attempting her triple toe loop and falling every time. Strange. She was usually perfect on that jump, but she couldn't land it today. Lady Magdalena barked orders as Emma teetered on her skates, looking exhausted. Emma seemed tired all the time, and it was affecting her performance. She didn't move as swiftly on the ice as before. She was much better than this. I'd watched her in practice several times before. She was an amazing skater, except she didn't look like it today. I worried she was getting burnt out. That was common with figure skaters. They pushed themselves too hard before their bodies shut down, and they couldn't do it anymore. She caught me watching her through the glass, and she blushed. I waved. She grimly smiled back before she attempted the toe loop again and failed. Emma and I hadn't spoken much, except in class. She'd been busy on the ice preparing for the big competition next season. I'd had hockey practice, as quite a few games were coming up soon. Needless to say, there hadn't been much time to see each other. And yet, there was. I was just making excuses as to why I wasn't hanging out with her, and I was certain she was doing the same. The rest of her practice was dismal. Stefan cringed, though I elbowed him to stop. Lady Magdalena eventually waved her off. Emma got off the ice, looking disappointed. Come by to see the local shit show? she asked. She sat down on the bench and began untying her skates. I sat beside her. It's just a bad day for everyone at the rink, I said. My practice was shit, too. Not Gabby. Her triple axle was flawless, Emma sneered. Stefan rolled his eyes, as if to say Emma and I have the same problem. Emma yanked off her skates. I attempted to comfort her by saying, You'll get back into the swing of things soon. It's just competition pressure. Emma scowled. All I know is, if I perform in competition like I did in practice today, I'll be lucky to get last place. The officials might ban me from the rink in embarrassment. Don't say that, I nudged her shoulder. You're a great skater. You just need to focus. Emma gritted her teeth. How can I focus when Gabby is out there pulling off a perfect performance and I suck? I think you guys need to stop comparing yourselves, Stefan spoke up. Both of us looked at him and he shrugged. Just my opinion. You're not going to be able to do your best if all you're doing is trying to better someone else. Emma and I blinked at each other. She was the first to speak. He's right, Emma said. Sorry for complaining. I know I should be focusing on myself. It's all right, I said. I've been comparing myself to others quite a bit, too. Good, now, kiss and make up. Stefan made kissing sounds at us. Emma narrowed her eyes at him. I tried not to scowl. 
Anyway, Emma began, I have something to tell you guys. Kiara thinks I have unseelie blood. What? Stefan and I asked at the same time. I leaned forward. Emma, tell us everything. Emma explained what Lord Lucian had told her about being the world weaver and her and Kiara's deductions about her being part on Seely. When she was done, she looked up at me and asked, You don't hate me now, do you? Because I have unseely blood? I shook my head. No, Emma, though I have to say, it is shocking. You should, though, Emma said. If Kiara's theory is correct, I'm basically part evil. Nah, -uh. good and evil are human concepts, Stefan said. In Edinmire, there was dark magic and light magic, and both were used equally without judgment. Laws and morals are somewhat human constructs. As long as it was within the bounds of nature, it was permitted by the Fae. Back then, anyway. That's not how things are now. If you use dark magic, you're accused of being a terrible person, Emma replied. How can such a thing as good and evil not be considered part of the old Fae? Stefan smirked. Hey, when a dragon kills a deer, it's not evil. We all gotta eat, and killing is within the bounds of nature, isn't it? So what changed? Emma wondered aloud. We began interbreeding with humans, I explained. They assigned the Seely the title of good, and the Unseely the title of evil, which more or less turned the Arcania against each other. It's one of the reasons we started the Civil War. Emma's gaze was accusative. You think the Unseely are bad. You made that clear when you took me to the Willow Maiden last semester. My stomach wiggled uncomfortably. I can't deny I'm somewhat prejudiced, I admitted, but I don't know everything, and there's always a way to have a new perspective on something. Perhaps there's something about the unseelie that I don't understand. You're brave enough to admit that, but what about other people? Emma asked. Whenever you bring the unseelie up, it's like you're uttering a curse. People act like they deserve to die out, and if you argue that dark magic isn't bad, you're instantly accused of being evil. It's like everyone knows better. They don't know better. They know different, I said. Maybe the unseelie aren't as bad as we've all been led to believe. History is written by the winners, remember? Emma slumped forward and put her chin in her hand. Well, it's not like we can ask the unseelie. They're all dead. Maybe not, Stefan said. If unseelie blood is in your veins, it has to be recent. Otherwise, it would have been diluted out. What if there's still a few unseelie hanging around in Malovia, just in hiding? Emma perked up. I could see an idea churning in her head. We can talk to my mom, Emma suggested. She might know something about my ancestry. Brilliant idea, Emma. My heart pounded in excitement. Let's head out. Emma went back to the locker room to change. When she'd done so, we took our bags back to Arcania University then said goodbye to Stefan as we began the walk through Dolinska. I changed into a woven and offered Emma my back. Want a ride? She seemed grateful for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. I knelt so she could climb on and said, Didn't think you wanted to walk all this way in the cold after having a long practice. Not really, Emma said. I don't have a lot of energy. And why was that? I trotted along at an easy pace. Emma buried her hands in my fur for warmth. Her head bobbed as we moved. She was falling asleep. Wake up, Emma, I growled and I jostled her. Those that take sleep in the chill have been known to never awaken again. She kept her eyes open after that, though they were bleary and faint. We crossed through town, then took a homemade path into the valley close to the city. I ventured over hills and watched as a herd of deer fled once they saw me. Finally, we came to Ivana's house. It was a small cottage on top of a very tall hill. Emma slid off my back and knocked on the door. A thin woman with a mane of red hair opened the door. She was beautiful and striking and looked younger than what I knew she had to be. Her smile brightened as she took us in. Emma, how nice of you to come by. She wrapped Emma in a hug before turning to me. You must be Prince Ethan. I'm honored, your highness. There's no need for formalities, I said kindly. We're family now. Just call me Ethan. Emma gave me a fond look, and Ivana said, Yes, you're mated. And what a wonderful thing that is. I'm very happy for you both. I'd never met Ivana in person before, 
but we'd communicated through text while Emma was in Poland, so this introduction wasn't as awkward as I expected. Or, perhaps Ivana was so welcoming, it didn't seem that way. Ivana squeezed me, and the gesture made me freeze up. Her embrace was loving and gentle. It didn't feel much like the stiff, forced hugs my mother gave me as a child. It was strange, to say the least. I wasn't quite used to affection like this. Come in, Ivana said, and she moved aside. Emma and I entered. I looked around the cottage. Herbs hung from the ceiling, and the scent of incense drifted throughout the cottage. The wood floor was covered with differently colored rugs and tapestries draped over the walls. Ornate china had been carefully stacked in cabinets. Jars filled with potion ingredients lined the shelves, and a cauldron bubbled on the stove. A hearth burned lowly in the living room across from the kitchen. A white cockatoo sat on a perch near the couch, cracking seeds in his beak. It felt very homey and warm. It was the perfect place for a sorceress. I caught Ivana staring at me. Is something wrong? I asked. She blinked and shook her head. Nothing, she said. It's just... You look very much like your father at that age. It's like stepping back in time. Emma had told me her mother had bonded with two shifters, one of them my father. She'd picked another, but by the way she looked at me, I was certain the choice had to be a very tough decision. I was just making a rose petal tea, Ivana said. It's a very good alchemy spell for calming. Ivana spooned the potion from the cauldron and poured it into three teacups. Emma and I sat down at the kitchen table. We drank slowly as Ivana eyed us. So what's the reason for the visit? Ivana asked. Surely you didn't come all this way in a snowstorm just to chit-chat. There's always a blizzard in Malovia, I joked. It's nothing unusual. Ivana smiled thinly. True, but there's something on your mind. I can see it in Emma's eyes. Emma tilted forward. There is, Mom. I wanted to tell you something about the contest. Ivana frowned. I thought we agreed not to talk about this. We did, Emma said, but it's important. Ivana huffed and sipped her tea. If you ask me, I think you should have won the contest, whether you use the unseely necklace or not. Damn the circle and their judgmental, arrogant ways. That's actually what we wanted to speak with you about. I looked at Emma. Emma took a deep breath. Well, we found out that for me to use an artifact like that with so much power, I'd have to come from unseely blood. Ivana nearly spat out her tea. She composed herself and said, No, that can't be possible. But it is, Emma insisted. We've researched it, and for me to draw from something like that, I'd have to be part on Seely, otherwise I'd be dead. Ivana shook her head. Well, that's news to me. If you have unseely blood, it's not in my ancestry. I come from a pure-blooded Seely line. My family, and this goes for myself as well, hate the unseely with a dying passion. She wasn't lying, as far as I could tell. Surprise clearly shone through in her tone. There was also a bit of disgust. Do you have something against the unseely? I asked. Ivana sniffed. You could say that? She didn't elaborate further. Yet you didn't mind me using the necklace, Emma objected. It's an object, Emma. A tool. Nothing more. Ivana's lip was still curled. But what about my father? Anastasi, Emma asked. Could he have unseely blood? Ivana shrugged. I highly doubt it. Anastasi was a seely fay, as far as I knew. Are there any ancestors of his around that we could speak to? I asked. Parents, perhaps? Ivana hesitated. Well, yes. Emma, your grandparents live in Dolinska, but I wouldn't suggest you speak with them. Why? Emma asked. They're my blood. But they are not our family, Ivana said. Your grandparents made it clear they hated me on sight. They didn't want Anastasi and I to be together. It's one of the reasons we had to run away. They know you exist, but beyond that, they failed to ever reach out. I'm sure they'll treat you with the same disgust they treated me with long ago. Emma was uncertain. But they might know something about this. If they do, they won't give you any information, Ivana replied. I'm sorry, but you need to stay away from those people. 
They're cruel. I don't want you seeking them out only to get hurt. Emma frowned. Okay. I leaned forward and dared to say, I hate asking this, but is there a gravesite of Anastasi's we could visit? It might give us clues. Ivana blinked. Yes. Just down the road is a graveyard. He's buried there. Ivana got up from the table and walked to the countertop, where a pot of white roses grew spectacularly. She took a few out of the pot, wrapped them in paper, and handed them to Emma. Here, when you go, lay them on your father's grave, from me. Aren't you coming? Emma asked. I... I don't think I'm ready, Ivana said. I'm sorry, Emma. I wish I could come with you, but... It's fine, Mom, Emma said. Ethan will take me. We thanked Ivana for the tea, then headed out. It was a short visit, but after Emma's grandparents had been brought up, her mother didn't seem in much mood to continue. Are you sure you want to do this? I asked as we left the cottage. Emma nodded firmly. Yes, I want to see my father's grave. I deserve that right. Then I will be with you all the way. I changed into a woven, and Emma got on my back, cradling the flowers to her chest as we bounded toward the cemetery. The graveyard was more or less only a mile off. It said something that Ivana had chosen to live so close to the remains of her lost love. It wasn't much, a small plot, surrounded by a fence, with a few scattered mausoleums and gravestones dotted over the landscape. Emma slid off my back and opened the wooden gate. I changed and followed behind her. Our eyes scanned the markers until we came to a simple, square stone void of decoration or grandeur. Emma knelt down and wiped the snow covering the name. Anastasi Ignacy, 1980-2001. There was nothing more than a date and a name. No inscription, no note, nothing of who he was or what he meant to people. It felt so cold. The wind whipped by, and Emma stared at the stone. I thought his grave would be more, I don't know, impressive. The way my mom talks about him, he sounds so amazing. His parents probably paid for the headstone, I said. If things weren't great between them before he died, they did the bare minimum required to mark his grave. Emma shivered. She placed the white roses over the plot and removed the paper, stepping back into me. There, she said. It looks a little better now. Emma teared up. She tried to hold them back, but a few tears slipped out of her eyes. My face twisted and I wrapped my arms around her. Oh, Emma. She turned into me and started to sob. I felt awful. This was bringing up all kinds of churning, painful emotions from the loss of my own father, but I couldn't break down now, not when Emma needed me. I'm sorry, she whispered. I don't even know why I'm crying. I shouldn't be grieving someone I never even knew. It doesn't matter if you never met him. He was your father, I said. I rubbed her back and held her close. That's still a loss. I just... I wish he was here. I never had a dad. I'd hoped and dreamed I'd get to meet him one day. My mom told me he died years ago, but it was like there was this stupid piece of hope inside of me that refused to believe it. She sniffed and pressed herself into my coat. I didn't think he was really dead, but now that I'm standing over his grave, I can't deny it. This is proof that he's gone. I knew how she felt, because even though I'd watched my own father die, I couldn't believe it myself. Not until I'd observed his body be sealed in the tomb at the cathedral. I'm here for you, Emma. Now and always. I pressed my lips into her hair as she cried. And there, in the twilight of the falling snow, I held her. Chapter 8 Emma After the meeting with my mother, Ethan and I didn't have any leads on investigating my mysterious unsealy ancestry. He'd used some of his leverage as Prince Regent to get us into the sealed-off Arcanian Hall of Records, but we'd searched, and Anastasi's records didn't contain any mention of him being unsealy. As it was written, his ancestors, and mine, were all sealy. I felt like I didn't know who I was or where I'd come from. The only other avenue we had was talking to my grandparents, but I had no desire to meet them after seeing my father's headstone. They hadn't even mentioned he was a father, a mate, and a son. They'd invested the minimal effort required to give him a decent burial. 
My mother had to be right. They knew I existed, and they never reached out, not once in 19 years. They were evil, and I wanted nothing to do with them. So, with the mystery unsolved, I buried myself in my classes. Faction abilities was becoming my favorite class, not just because I was good at woven magic, but because it was the only class where I got to spend time with Ethan. Today, we were working on expanding my telepathy magic. Ethan had me levitating heavier and heavier objects each time we met. This class period, I'd lifted a stack of heavy books and a ten-pound dumbbell. You're doing well, Ethan said when we'd advanced to the twenty-pound dumbbell and it failed to face me. Your power is growing in strides. I beamed. I loved hearing Ethan's praise. My attention turned to an alicorn statue on the other side of the classroom. It was taller than me and had to weigh at least a hundred pounds. Ethan caught me eyeing it. Emma, don't try it, he warned. You're not ready. I didn't listen. I wanted to prove to him I could do it. I focused my eyes on the statue. The alley corn began to shake. It wavered back and forth on concrete hoofs before it shakily rose into the air. I expected to feel some sort of resistance, but the statue lifted at my request. Ethan's eyes widened in shock. I could only lift it a foot off the ground before I felt my powers begin to fail. I gently set the statue down. Scattered applause littered throughout the classroom. Well done, Miss Sosna. Very good for a first year, Professor Lunesta said. I beamed. Last semester, I'd fainted when trying to levitate a stone. Today, I was able to lift a hundred-pound statue without breaking a sweat. Ethan's look was proud, yet slightly disapproving. You shouldn't push yourself before you're ready. Magic comes from energy. I don't want you getting sick because you're going past your limits. Relax, I rolled my eyes. There's nothing to worry about. Emma, Ethan said sternly. I mean it. You've been up all night studying for your classes. I know you want to become a great sorceress, but take a break. I think we should rest for the remainder of the class. I sighed. I've been up all night because of you, jackass, I thought, but I decided to listen to him. I slunk into the seat beside him and plopped my head in my hand. You don't have to remind me I have an illness, I told him. I'm perfectly aware I'm not like everyone else. Yes, I do, he shot back. I know how you are. You don't know your limits. At least, you don't care about them. If I don't make you rest, you won't. I huffed a red strand of hair out of my eyes. I want to be the best, which means I have to work ten times harder than everyone else to get there because I already have a hurdle in front of me due to my disease. You're a typical Arcadia. They all have a problem with power. Ethan drolled. He leaned back in his seat and lounged casually. Damn him, he looked so sexy like that. I just wanted to bang him right here and now. I tore my eyes off the bulge in Ethan's pants, no easy feat, before I asked, What do you mean? His face darkened. You haven't been around long enough to hear about the Great Supernatural War. That sounds ominous. Just how many wars did the Arcania have in their past? Ethan nodded solemnly. It was quite awful. Happened around eighty years ago. Back then, the Arcania were ruthless and cruel. We longed to take over the humans and the rest of the supernatural world. We made alliances with the Midnighters, the Vampires, and the Celestials, the Angels, to try to force the other magical races into submission. If they didn't comply, we had the fullest intention to destroy them. Mermaids, witches, and enchanters fought against us, but we had the upper hand. Gods, I burst. What happened? A miracle. If it wasn't for the Elementi getting involved at the last moment and fighting against us, we would have won, Ethan said. And I shudder to think what would have happened if we had. Magic is kept secret for a reason. Without boundaries, it causes chaos. Supernaturals aren't meant to be the supreme rulers of the world. Nature demands balance and she would have crafted an ultimate solution if that balance was offset. 
You mean, kill everything? I whispered. Perhaps, he shrugged. Though the Arcania beat her to it in one instance, the elves used to be a powerful supernatural race, but we completely wiped them out during the war, and I think few Arcania have any regrets about it. They believed the elves deserved it. My stomach churned. We exterminated them? How? The usual ways. Mass killings. Camps. Concentrated battles. Famine. Manufactured plagues and illnesses. His hands gritted into fists. And there's still people who deny that it happened. Ask any Arcania. Half of them will say the numbers killed during the elven genocide are exaggerated, or that it's a plot by other supernatural races to garner sympathy. We have records and data on those who died, yet so many will refuse that it's part of our history. That we willfully slaughtered people. Ethan, I didn't know what to say. This all sounded so sick. Ethan's tone became a whisper. It's one of the reasons I wanted to become king after I learned about it, so I could make sure the Arcania never did anything so horrible ever again. I reached out to grab his hand. You can still do that in some way. We're the new generation. We can change things for the better. Ethan frowned. You'd be surprised at how many Arcania are desperate for their chance at revenge. What? I snarled. But that's crazy and vile. Old prejudices die hard. There are a lot of people in Melovia who have a god complex, thinking the Fae are the superior magical race. The war has long been over, but some haven't forgotten about it. He shook his head. They see our losing the war as a great offense, something that must be rectified so that humans are put in their rightful place below us. Is Eli one of those people? I asked. Yes, I'm sure Elijah wants to start something like that again. Ethan said. It would be a very bad move. I'm not sure the other supernatural races would permit our kind to live if we attempted to pull a stunt like that twice. That we're not occupied and still allowed to have an army is a miracle in itself. I mused over what he had said. The more I found out about what Gabby and Elijah were planning, the more terrible an idea it seemed to put them on the throne. Even worse, if they managed to use my blood to raise Droga, the Dark God would help them, and the Arcania would win this time. They'd enslave humans and kill all the other magical races, making the Fae the dictators of the planet. I didn't know anything about the other magical societies, but I was certain we were more alike than different. No one race deserved to be enslaved and wiped out, magical or not. We had to stop them before their actions destroyed our world. You all did very well today, Professor Lunesta said. I expect you'll all pass the midterms coming up. Class dismissed. Ethan and I walked side by side in the hallway. It'd become a habit of ours to do so when we could. We were drawn together like magnets or moths to a flame. We didn't hold hands. Instead, he held out his arm, and I looped my own around it, moving as a unit. It was the prince in him to guide a lady around in such a refined way. But it didn't feel formal. It felt right. No one cast a second glance at us, but still, the feelings churning around inside of my gut were a combination of guilt and adoration. How could I hold Ethan so close when he didn't truly know what I was? I smirked. My gymnastics lessons back in Detroit had paid off during the fight with Ethan. I hadn't taken them for very long, liked skating more, to be honest. But I still had the ability to do many of the flips I'd learned, and it'd come in handy. His freaking mouth had dropped open when I'd done that flip. It'd been hilarious. The Phantom was shocked the White Rose could keep up with him in a fight. But Ethan was the one who had taught me how to duel. I could counter him, and even better, I knew all his tricks. That gave me an advantage. I'd been slow when I cut him the other night. I just wanted to hurt him enough to serve as a warning. I wasn't sure if he'd gotten the message through his thick skull. I sure hoped. 
He'd been tailing the Black Claw, who'd been transporting a large monster in a cage to somewhere. I was curious what they were doing as well, and kind of wanted Ethan to follow them so we could unearth this mystery. But Gabby's warning rang out in my mind, and I'd interfered. Whatever the cult was planning, it wasn't worth Ethan's life. Here we are, Miss Sosna, Ethan replied as we stopped at the doorway that led to introduction to portals. I regret leaving you, but I'm sure Lucian wouldn't want me posing as a distraction. I lifted a small smile. Distraction? You? Never. Ethan made a low, sexy sound, and fuck if it didn't make my legs go to water. Ethan gave me a quick kiss. Though our lips only met for a few seconds, it felt like my feet lifted off the ground. By the time he walked away, my head was still spinning. He made me feel breathless with a single touch. Shifters, I tell ya. I ventured into the classroom, but all thoughts of Ethan slipped away when I realized that it was empty except for two people, Lord Lucian and the woman who'd been wandering my nightmares for weeks. Queen Antonia lifted an eyebrow. Hello, Emmeline. My mouth ran dry. I couldn't speak. Ethan's mother was here in the school, and she didn't look happy to see me. Cleese is cancelled today at the Queen's request, Lucian said. His eyes darted to Antonia. If I can get you anything, my queen. That will be all. Queen Antonia abruptly cut him off. You may go. I wish to speak with her alone. Lucian's mouth thinned. He didn't want to leave me with her, but she was a freaking queen, so it wasn't like he had a choice. He strode out quietly, closing the door behind him. Don't lock me in here with her, I thought desperately, but it was too late. He already had. Queen Antonia's voice was cool. I warned you what would happen if you cost my son the king's contest, and you have failed miserably. If I could sink into the stone tiles on the floor, I would. Last time I'd faced the queen, I was fierce. I couldn't be this time. I hadn't owned up to my word. I knew she'd make me pay for it. I'm sorry. Your pitiful apologies are no use to me, Queen Antonia yelled. She lost her temper. Her voice came out in a powerful rage as she cursed me. You are a low-life commoner who caused my son to lose everything. Tears were welling in my eyes. I wanted to say that Milana had sent a hag to tell me to do it, but she wouldn't believe me, or even care. You have shamed my son's name and brought it down in the mud, Queen Antonia spat. You used filthy, unseely magic. You are lucky I don't smite you where you stand. She was making me feel like I was all wrong for Ethan. My lip wavered, but I refused to let any tears fall. Lady Magdalena had told me I needed to show Queen Antonia strength, and by the gods, I wouldn't appear weak now. Do you know what I could do to you? Queen Antonia asked. I gasped. My body began levitating off the ground. I clenched at my throat. She was using her illusion magic on me, convincing my mind she was choking me, though I knew she couldn't be. I pushed back against her spell, but I couldn't break it. I wasn't strong enough, or I was just so scared I didn't know what to do. I haven't decided how to deal with you yet, or when, Queen Antonia said, and she tightened her hold on me. But let me list all the ways. I could take away your medical care. Your little treatments could fly away with the wind. Perhaps that will teach you suffering as I have suffered. I felt like begging. How did she even know I was sick? I'd never told anyone. She'd gone digging through my medical files. Please, I gasped. Queen Antonia's eyes narrowed. Then she let me go. I collapsed to the floor. I held my neck, choking for air, though I knew I'd been breathing fine all along. Her heels clicked as she approached. She looked down on me like a stain upon the earth as she said, I will not harm you, as taking your life would be of great pain to my son. But I cannot say the same for your friends or family. Mark my words. 
You will pay for losing my son his crown. I will make sure of it. My body quaked. She could hurt my mom, or Dalmer, or Odette, or Kiara. She could do anything she wanted to me, and I had no way to fight back. Just then, the doors flew open with a powerful burst of magic. Lady Magdalena prowled into the room with all the rage of a warrior, flanked by Lord Lucian. Her head was held high and her shoulders thrown back as she glared at Queen Antonia like the sun. Lucian saw me on the ground and immediately went to help me to my feet. Lady Magdalena's eyes burned. She rounded on Queen Antonia and bellowed, You have some nerve coming into my university and attacking one of my students. I'm well in a mind to make you pay for it. I'd advise you to observe who you're speaking to, Queen Antonia hissed. I am the queen. Magdalena's tone was full of hatred, condescending and cruel. You have authority in Malovia, but within the walls of this school, the authority is mine. I am headmistress, and you are no longer the queen. You are queen regent. Your power here is limited, so I suggest you gather yourself and leave quietly. Fuck, these two hated each other. For what reason, I didn't know. But I felt like their animosity went far beyond me. Queen Antonia's eyes narrowed. She lifted her chin and refused to look at Magdalena. But she had eyes for me. As she strolled out, she said, You are safe here, girl, but only within this school. They don't do well in prisons, and once you stride outside these stone walls, you are mine. The lump in my throat had fallen to my gut, making me feel nauseous. Lucian swept the hair back from my forehead. Emma, are you all right? I couldn't speak. Lady Magdalena, the general she was, stopped before me and said, Don't let what she said bother you, Emmeline. The wicked old crone doesn't dare to cross me. She's tried before, and she will fail a second time. I knew her words were true, but still, I worried. Lady Magdalena could protect me from Queen Antonia, but only if I remained in the safety of Arcania University. And I was terrified for the people who resided outside of them, the main one being my mother. The morning of Valentine's Day arrived, and I woke up feeling like complete shit. My throat was sore, and my body ached all over. My skin was hot, and I had a cough that felt like it was sent straight from hell. My nose was stuffed up, and snot kept pouring out of my nostrils. I got up to look in the mirror and observed my red, puffy eyes and cracked lips. I looked like death warmed over. Sexy! Damn it. Ethan was right. I had been pushing myself too hard in my classes lately and become vulnerable. Not to mention Queen Antonia's threat had left me freaking out. Complete with the lack of sleep, it turned into a dangerous combination. Now my immune system was taking a shit and I was paying for it with a nice cold. Well, I wasn't going anywhere today. Might as well get a head start on my infusion. I forced myself to stagger to my desk so I could fill the plastic syringes with plasma and prime the four needles for insertion. As I was putting the needles into my stomach, Queen Antonia's words popped into my mind. I could take away your medical care. I scowled. Only evil people threatened to take treatment away from sick people. The cold-hearted bitch. She could go suck an eggplant. I hated how my treatments made me vulnerable like that. She knew I couldn't live without this stuff. I'd die without it, and she was willing to exploit that in an act of revenge. Well, screw her. Whatever she did, I'd stay alive out of spite just so I could stick it to her. I was in Arcadia, too, and I could be just as big an asshole as she was. After I got my needles in, I turned on the infusion pump, then climbed back in bed and propped up my pillow so I could breathe. I pulled my blanket over me and hoped the plasma would work miracles. I really didn't want to be sick all weekend. There was a knock on my door. Ethan poked his head in. I hadn't told Ethan about his mother's threat. I couldn't. How did you tell the love of your life that his mother was a venom-spitting cobra? 
His face fell when he saw me. Oh, Emma, I was going to ask if you wanted to go skiing, but you're obviously not feeling well. Don't rub it in, I groaned. My voice was stuffy. I knew you'd say I told you so. Your pain is never a cause for my celebration. He entered the room and shut the door behind him. I shoved the infusion pump underneath the blanket so Ethan wouldn't notice, but he caught me doing it. Can I see? He asked curiously. He sat on the bed beside me. It's fine if you don't want to. I hesitated. My first instinct was to tell him no. I mean, I figured he'd see all the tubes sticking out of me and think I was a robot or something. He'd realize how sick I really was, get scared, and run. But I was tired of hiding it from everyone, and he was my mate. He had to see it sooner or later, no matter how self-conscious I was about it. I removed the blanket. Ethan's eyes fell downward. I showed him my pump, and his eyes traveled up the length of the tubes and to the bottom of my shirt as I began to explain. This syringe is filled with plasma, which carries the antibodies my immune system doesn't make. The pump pushes the medicine into my subcutaneous fat layer through needles, and it's absorbed there into my bloodstream. I lifted my shirt to show him four butterfly needles placed in a semicircle around my stomach, kept in place by medical tape. I usually do it in my stomach, but I can do it in my hips and legs, too. I try to rotate between my stomach and hips so they don't scar as badly. I avoid my legs because, you know, I need to keep those perfect for skating. And this helps you? He raised his eyebrows. Yes, people who donate plasma are very important. They give me an added defense against infection. Without it, my body would shut down. Ethan nodded. That makes sense. How long does it take? He asked. Two hours, I said, give or take. I have to do it every week. That's a long time. Doesn't bother me. It gives me an excuse to avoid everyone. Ethan laughed. Typical Emma. He frowned as I pulled my shirt back over my stomach. Does it hurt? Sometimes, I said. Though it's getting easier now that my body is becoming used to it. It was painful in the beginning, but I'm doing better. That's good to hear. He carefully ran his fingers over my hip. Are there any side effects? I get freaking starving, I confessed. My stomach gave a rumble and Ethan laughed lowly. As I can see, I should get you something to eat. Can't have my own Awilka going hungry. It's still early morning, I said, though food sounded amazing right now. Ethan cocked an eyebrow. It's almost noon. Shit, I'd slept in a long time. I really was sick. But you were going skiing, I protested. They'll be fine without me. Not like I want to hear Del Mare and Stefan bickering on the slopes. Ethan chuckled. Kiara and Alexi will be the only tolerable ones. Theo will complain endlessly about Odette not showing up. She's not coming? My heart fell. He shook his head. No, she said she was busy. I frowned. Odette hardly hung out with us anymore. I didn't know what was wrong with her. But if you hang out with me, you'll get sick. Shifters can burn off viruses fairly quickly. If I get sick, I'll be all right. I want to take care of you. This guy knew all the right words to say. Okay, you win, I said. I'm not going anywhere. Ethan beamed like he'd won. I drifted into a nap while he was gone. When I woke up, Ethan had returned, carrying a tray of chicken noodle soup with an electrolyte replacing tea and a huge hunk of bread. You are a lifesaver, I said as I dove in, for as shitty as I felt, my appetite wasn't diminished at all. Ethan watched me eat. His eyes traveled to the infusion pump again. Thank you for showing me, Ethan said. I know it couldn't have been easy. I blushed, or maybe my temperature was just increasing, I didn't know. I wanted you to be the first, I said. Maybe now that you know, it'll be easier to tell other people. He leaned back against the wall. Are there any other things I should learn about CVID? Oh, lots. There was so much stuff that I didn't even know about yet. For example, it's hard for immunocompromised people to get fevers. And if we do, we should be taken to the hospital because that's an awful sign. That's good to know. He reached out and caressed my face. 
I want to know as much as I can about your disease, Emma, so I can help you. I shivered at his touch. Well, I guess this is a good start. I ate, though I didn't have food in my mind anymore. By the time Ethan had moved the tray off my bed, I was feeling warm again. Emma explores Ethan for a moment, but he insists she's too sick to experiment and that she needs rest. The moment doesn't proceed further. Emma begins imagining how she and Ethan can become closer. Ethan didn't leave my side all day. He got me everything I needed whenever I needed it. By the time my infusion was done, he'd returned from the pharmacy with a million different medications. He'd brought a humidifier, along with some essential oils and pain relief cream. He rubbed my muscles until I could feel the tension in them ease. God, he was an amazing guy. I'd gotten very lucky. You need a bath, Ethan said as he finished massaging my left foot. I'll fill the tub. What, am I gross? I teased. I didn't look the best, but I'd taken a shower last night. I know your muscles are tense, Ethan said. I could feel it as I was rubbing your back. I wish you'd rub something else, I thought, but I didn't know where it was coming from. I had the energy of a sloth right now, but still I was horny as fuck. Other people wouldn't get it, but hey, I was sick all the time. If I waited until I felt better to mess around, I'd never get any. Though today was worse than usual. Ethan filled the tub with hot water. The steam inside the bathroom made my sinuses open up, giving me some relief. He'd put some lavender oil in the tub, which was seriously helping me to breathe. Now behave. Don't make me come in there, Ethan said playfully as he shut the door with a wink. If only you would, I said back through the door. He didn't reply. I stripped and sighed as I sank down into the water. I took my time bathing, staying in the water until it began to cool. I noticed Ethan was quiet. I bet he was jacking off out there. Kudos to him for being a gentleman and not taking a peek. I wrapped myself in a towel. I was in the mind to drop the towel and dress in front of Ethan, you know, because what girl wouldn't, but he beat me to it when he entered the bathroom, carrying a stack of clothes. His eyes roamed up and down my form, covered up by only the towel, before he placed the clothes on the counter. I caught sight of the blue underwear on top and snickered. You went through my panty drawer, he frowned. Don't be like that. I had to. You didn't. You could have let me dress in front of you. His mouth twitched. I hardly think that's appropriate, given the situation at hand. You're no fun, I pouted. I coughed a few times and it sounded horrible. Ethan frowned. And that's why, he said. I'm not giving in to temptation. You need your rest. Damn you, Ethan Nowak. And I meant it. After I got dressed, out of his sight, badly... We cuddled on the bed for a couple hours and watched a movie. By the end of it, I was glad we hadn't messed around because I was ridiculously tired. Which was stupid because I hadn't done anything all day, but fighting off this virus was taking a lot out of me. I think I need to walk around a bit, I told Ethan as the movie ended, just to get a little exercise. I'll come with you. Ethan was hovering like a guard dog as I walked to the door. I did a quick loop around the rec room. It took all my energy, but Ethan was there every step of the way just in case I stumbled. When I was about to return to my dorm, I saw Stefan. He looked pissed off. Not a good sign. Once he saw us, he made a beeline straight to me. Trouble on the slopes? I asked, figuring drama had gone down while skiing. Stefan scowled. It's Irina. Something's wrong with her. My worry peaked. Delmer was in some kind of trouble? That couldn't be good. What do you mean? Well, we were skiing and this woman showed up. She was being obnoxious with her boyfriend. Stefan said, Irina wouldn't tell me anything. Kiara said it was her mom. Oh no. If Delmer's mom had been there, it had set her off. What happened? Ugh, I don't really know. Stefan scratched the back of his head. Irina looked at her, then she looked at me, and she burst into tears. I tried to help, but she ran away. She's locked herself in her dorm and refuses to come out. 
How awful. I wish I had been there. Maybe I could have calmed Delmare down. Emma, can you talk to her? Stefan asked. I feel helpless. Emma's sick. She can't do anything right now, Ethan said. It's fine, Ethan, I said. It'll only be a few minutes. Ethan's gaze was firm. Hurry right back. Jeez, he was overprotective. It was over the top. And very, very cute. I strode to Delmare's dorm and knocked on the door. Her voice came out muffled. I said fuck off, Stefan. It's me, I called. Let me in. There were footsteps and the turning of a lock. Delmare opened the door. She stepped aside. By the tear stains on her face, she'd been crying. It scared me. Delmare was tough. She didn't cry unless something really bothered her. Delmare's dorm was beautiful. It was decorated in shades of black and red. Countless sketches, paintings, and artworks lined the walls. Sculptures were placed on top of her desk, along with pages of poetry and novel manuscripts she hadn't yet finished. The smell of sandalwood and sage burned throughout the room. Art supplies, such as coloring pencils and paint jars, were scattered on the floor. A sketch of a black dragon hung directly above Delmer's desk, and it looked recent. It was a perfect portrait of Stefan in his shifter form. I sat on Delmer's bed. She turned to me. I heard you were sick. I'm fine, I said. Ethan's taking care of me. I'm concerned about you. Stefan is worried. She gave a frustrated sigh. He probably thinks I'm fucking nuts running off like that bawling. He just wants to help, I offered. Can you explain why you freaked out like that? She swallowed. I was having a good time until my mom showed up. I overheard her talking to her new boyfriend, different one than the last time, you know. He asked her if she had any kids, and she said no. My guts curled in sympathy. What the hell? That's fucked up, Mare. That's not even the worst part, she continued. I was holding it together. Then I saw that Stefan had overheard, too. He just looked at me like he couldn't believe my own mom wouldn't acknowledge me. I was so embarrassed. I just fell apart. I had to get out of there. I'm so sorry. My tone was honest. Your mom's a total shitbag. Delmer gave a harsh noise. Yeah, well, she wouldn't be the first to deny I was her kid. I'm used to it. What do you mean? My heartbeat had picked up. This sounded truly awful. My dad didn't want a sorceress child, Delmer started. He wanted a shifter. My eyes widened. I knew Delmer's dad had left, but I didn't know he had rejected her. Delmer's look was distant as she said, My dad comes from a long line of prestigious warrior dragon shifters. Big money, mostly male. I was the first girl to be born in a very long time. Shouldn't they celebrate then? I asked. Delmer gave a skeptical noise. No, he wanted a son. Women are for breeding in their family. That I was a female and his firstborn was incredibly disappointing to him, to the point of being offensive. What does it matter if you weren't born with a dick? I snarled. Gods, this guy sounded awful. He desired someone to carry on the family name, a shifter he could raise to fight. My dear old dad didn't believe women were capable of waging war, Delmer sighed and my mom did everything she could to keep him. But it didn't work in the end. He left. Delmer wouldn't meet my eyes as she continued. He was so ashamed of me, he wouldn't let me have his last name, even after my mom gave me the name Irina, after his grandmother in an attempt to please him. That's why I call myself by my last name. I don't want anything he gave me. And Delmer is the surname of my mother's family, not my father's. Her tone became cold, becoming distant with each passing syllable. He ditched us before I was even a year old. My mom, she couldn't handle losing her mate. She tried to replace my dad. She threw herself at men. 
I remember growing up she'd bring a new one home every night. She used to sing. She was a famous actress on the Malovia theater circle before she got dumped. After that, she never got another role. She sacrificed herself and who she was to find a husband. Her career, her hobbies, they all fell to the wayside to get love. None of them stuck, though. She got too clingy or too desperate, and it ended up chasing them off. Delmere wiped a tear that had fallen down her cheek. She did what she had to to keep me alive, and that was about it. She resents me, you know, because she thinks I chased my father off, like I could help being born a girl. Delmere, I was so shocked, I didn't know what to say. I mean, she made food and everything. I had a place to stay, and she never hit me or anything like that. If I needed something, she got it for me. I was able to have friends over and go to parties. She never stopped me from doing anything. She just didn't care. Delmere shrugged. When I got to be old enough to take care of myself, she'd run off for weeks at a time. Just leave money on the counter for groceries and go. She hugged herself. To be honest, I don't ever think she screamed at me. I wasn't important enough. I remember when I was really little, I took this jar of paint and I spilled it all over the rug, on purpose. I thought it might get her to notice me, and being yelled at was better than being ignored. But she saw it and just said we had to hurry to the store and buy another rug to cover up the stain because her new man was coming over in an hour and she didn't want him to see the carpet and think less of her. Delmere scoffed. I never forgot that. I was the reason men thought less of her, because it isn't rational for a woman with a toddler to have a messy house, right? The harsh laugh that came from Delmare's lips hardly seemed real. Come to think of it, I was never there when she brought her flings around. I was always either at a sleepover or being taken by the sitter somewhere. If someone couldn't watch me, She'd lock me in my room and tell me I had to stay very quiet. She'd give me brand new paint sets to keep me preoccupied, you know, because I loved art. I thought it was because she loved me. Then I put two and two together and figured out she was just hiding me. She knew shifters wouldn't want her if they found out she had a kid with somebody else. Delmere's vulnerable tone changed into the tough, hard exterior she usually gave off. Do you see why I can't be with Stefan? It's not going to work. Delmere, you are not your mother, I said softly. And even though Stefan's a dragon, he's nothing like your dad. But I love art so much. I would die for my work, she said. I can't imagine who I would be if I couldn't create. She gestured to her paintings, her sculptures, and her poems. I want to be an artist, a real one. And I can't be if a man is getting in the way. Why can't you have both? I suggested. My mother gave up everything to try and make a man love her. And she never succeeded. I don't want to become some desperate woman clinging to a man's approval to convince myself I'm worth existing. I need to keep my identity, Delmere said. I don't need a man to make me happy. Of course you don't. You can be happy all on your own but I think you and Stefan could have a beautiful life, I said. You can't sacrifice your future because your mother's a stupid broad. You don't understand. I want to travel, see the world. I want my work to hang in museums. I want to give speeches, have books published, be a sorceress of great power. Her voice took on a dreamy quality as she spoke. A man would just hold me back from that. He'd put restrictions on me, tell me what I could and couldn't do. I couldn't bear to lose my independence like that. You can do all those things with Stefan by your side, I said gently. He wouldn't hold you back from your dreams. He'd support you every step of the way. Don't give up on him because other people hurt you. He really does love you. She shook her head. I'm afraid to be in a relationship because I can't lose my identity, Delmare insisted. I can't afford to be in love. 
I paused for a moment before I said, But, Delmare, you already are. Delmare bit her lip. She turned to the sketch of the black dragon on the wall. She didn't deny my claim, but still, there was so much fear in her I could feel it from across the room. And what would happen if we did get together? If we got married and I gave him a daughter instead of a son? Delmare asked. Stefan wouldn't give a shit, I said firmly. He's not that type of guy. He'd be thrilled the child came from you. You're giving up something you really want because you're too afraid to see where it could lead. And I don't want that to happen to you, Delmare. I want you to be happy. Her face was torn, like she wanted to believe me, but deep down couldn't manage it. Look, Emma, I get what you're trying to do, and I appreciate your honesty because you're my friend. I just don't see how I could have both. It's either Stefan or my art. I have to pick one or the other, and right now, if I have to choose, it's going to be my art, because that's the only consistent thing that's ever been there. My mom didn't tuck me into bed at night. The stories in my head did. As much as I want to be with Stefan, I have to follow my dreams. My stomach plummeted to the floor. I'd been holding out hope for them, but Delmer was so terrified she'd end up like her mother. She was keeping her heart under lock and key. I understand. I got to my feet. I should get back to my dorm. Ethan's waiting. Delmer didn't respond. Her eyes were locked on the sketch of the dragon. Well? Stefan asked as I shuffled into the rec room. I wiped my snotty nose with my sleeve. Gross, but I didn't have any tissues. I didn't know how to explain this to Stefan or how much to tell him. Delmer's story was personal, and I didn't have the right to spread her past around. I took a deep breath and said, I'm sorry, Stefan. She's just not interested in a relationship. You were in there a long time, he accused. He knew there was more than I was letting on. I shrugged and said, It's her business. But Delmere has a complicated past. I don't think she's ready. I figured he'd give up let the mating bond go, and find someone else. Yet that's not what he did. Stefan sent a determined look toward Delmer's door. His gaze was steely and resolved. I got plenty of time to wait. He stalked off. I frowned as I watched him round the corner. Dragons were stubborn. This situation had come to a standstill, and Delmer wasn't giving in. But neither was Stefan. Chapter 9 Ethan. History of Druids wasn't one of my favorite classes. Professor Victor was very much into historical material, and he was known for giving long lectures. Today would be no exception. Still, when I entered his lecture hall on February 20th, something seemed different, though I couldn't quite lay a finger on what. I had the thought to skip and put the time into investigating the White Rose instead but my gut told me I needed to attend. I felt like I was going to learn something important today, and only a stupid Arcania ignored their instincts. History of Druids was held in a large, beautiful classroom next to the conservatory. The chairs and desks were set up in a circular fashion around a graceful oak tree that grew out of the center. The branches of the oak tree spanned above, while glass in the ceiling nourished the tree with sunlight. Professor Victor tended to the tree itself, giving it water and sustaining it with magical energy. As such, the tree pulsed with life and supernatural power, much like the Willow Maiden did. The classroom was always bright and open, leaving plenty of room for Arcania to cast spells. I took a spot near the front of the classroom, ten feet away from the trunk of the oak tree. Professor Victor spread his arms wide, and golden illusion magic emitted from his palms, settling in the leaves of the oak tree. The tree literally moved, giving a sigh and shaking as the shimmering dust reflected off its leaves. Today we'll be covering ancient druid lore, Professor Victor began. Now, as you know, the druids are commonly known as a group of Celtic people who lived in Britain and France, but Edinmire had druids of their own. They were called the Draca, 
a word in Malovian meaning religious teacher. Professor Victor strolled in a circle around the trunk. Malovian stems from the ancient Fay language. It is the tongue we spoke in Edinmire, and thus is the language we continue to use today, Victor explained. The Arcanian Druids, or Draika, were rumored to be revered spiritual scholars. They were considered the communicators between the Fae and the gods. Professor Victor held up a finger. Like the Unseely Fae, the Draika were wiped out during the war after the Arcania made their way to Earth. Their population was small, and it didn't stand much of a chance against the terrors being perpetuated at that time. Rumor is there are some Fae still living who possess Draika blood, but there's been no scientific nor magical proof of their survival. Victor clasped his hands in front of his body. Druids were gifted with the gift of prophecy, the ability to tell the future. They were sent messages from the gods to convey to the Arcanian race. The majority of these teachers, some, not all, were marked. These sorceresses had a special connection to the great hunting grounds and could therefore impart their wisdom upon the masses as they learned it directly from the spiritual realm. Since there are no prophets remaining in the Arcanian world, we can deduce that the Druids have gone extinct. What he said was true. Prophecies only came now by use of hags or other monsters, like in Emma's situation. We Fae had long lost the ability to receive prophecies, another consequence of war. The more I learned about the split between the Seely and the Unseely Fae, the more I wondered why it was even necessary in the first place. Though the druids are gone, we still have records about them and their lore, Victor explained. Fae scribes were able to record some of their teachings, as the druids themselves preferred oral instruction to keep their most sacred knowledge secret within their own circles. There is one particular tale of druid legend that has remained a secret. The Hidden King. That got my attention. I leaned forward. I wasn't the only one. Several other boys stopped taking notes to look up. I remembered the sight of Professor Waldron's body hanging from a spear on the wall and the message written in blood beside it. The Black Claw has found its master. Hail to the dark god Droga. Hail to the Hidden King. Professor Victor swallowed. I know this may be upsetting to some of you, but I can assure you, the incident surrounding Professor Waldron's death is nothing like the true history behind the legend. Many centuries ago, a Draka received a message from the gods about the Hidden King. She foretold that the Hidden King would doom Fay kind and bring an end to the Seely Fay. What's the exact wording of the prophecy? Nikolai asked. He was a griffin shifter and uncontrollably curious. He was always asking questions every class. His binder was stuffed full of all the notes he'd taken. Professor Victor smiled. It's nice to see a student so involved, though I have to tell you it's not elaborate. He shrugged. Just wondering. Victor cleared his throat before he began to recite. The Hidden King shall bring an end to the Arcania. It is he who will change our world forever. A shiver crossed over my spine. There was a beat of silence before Nikolai asked, That's it? A laugh traveled throughout the classroom. Nikolai went pink, and he objected. It's not that scary, really. Yes, it is. It's vague enough to be terrifying, Victor insisted. That there are no specifics is very important to Fay culture and how the Druids used to prophesy. The end may come at any time or any way, and our world will be irrevocably changed by it. So if it hasn't come true yet, how do we know it ever will? Nikolai asked. Professor Victor shrugged. The prophecy was foretold centuries ago, and so far has not come to pass. There have been so many false claims that many Fay regard it as a fairy tale. I recalled the prophecy spoken to Emma by the hag, that the hidden king was her enemy, and she needed to beware of him. He would bring her death. My blood ran cold, and my mouth became exceedingly dry. I wasn't sure if the hag had told the truth or not that day, but the fact that Emma had come face to face with Malona and the name of the Hidden King had come up more than once was too much evidence to deny. I'd tried 
and failed to find Black Claw members to interrogate last semester about the Hidden King. I'd caught one over the break, but I was too busy trying to find their hideout instead, convinced the Hidden King would be there when I arrived, and I could kill him. How stupid I'd been. The Hidden King was still running loose, and now I had the White Rose to deal with. My chances of killing him with her in the way were dismal. But I had to, for Emma's sake. Otherwise my mate would end up dead, and on my life that wasn't an option. It's not a fairy tale, is it? The Black Claw said that their leader was the Hidden King. They wrote the message when they killed Professor Waldron, Nikolai asked. Whoever murdered Professor Waldron was using the Hidden King as a way to foster fear, Victor stated. It's an old story, but is still remembered by many elderly Arcania. The Black Claw will use any opportunity to frighten the public and cause hysteria. If they declare the Hidden King as their leader, people will take him to be the prophesied one when really there's no proof. Just because someone says they are something doesn't mean they are. It's propaganda by the cult in an attempt to terrorize the masses. Nothing more, nothing less. The class settled then. Victor rattled on for another hour about Druid customs during the 5th century, but I was hardly paying attention. The Druids might have answers to the mystery of the Hidden King, but since they'd been wiped out, I wasn't getting any information from them. Victor could be right about the Black Claw using the Hidden King as propaganda. Or, what if they had truly found him? All I knew was I needed to get answers. Stefan was halfway through his meal when I stopped by the dining hall for lunch. Alexei and Theo were with him. Theo was tucking into a salad. Alicorns didn't much like meat, while Stefan stuffed down a bloody steak. Alexei, who always ate like a bird, was being quite peckish with his sandwich. We usually ate with the girls, but I didn't see them around. I slid next to Alexei. Something wrong? he asked of my perplexed expression. I was going to ask where the girls are, I said. Table looks empty without them. Odette's at practice, Theo said glumly. I wanted to ask why he wasn't there with her, as he was her partner for the ballet, but didn't because that sounded like a good way to get a horn up the ass. Kiara's studying, Alexei said with a sigh. Irina told me to fuck off, so I did, Stefan said through a full mouth. Steak juice dribbled down his chin, and Theo wrinkled his nose. What about Emma? I scanned the room, but there was no sign of my favorite redhead. Why is it our job to know where she is? She's your mate, Stefan argued. Yes, but... I took a breath. Look, I hardly know where Emma is because she's been avoiding me lately. I don't know why. She got over her cold and hasn't talked to me since. In the past week, it's like she looks at me and gets scared. She runs off whenever I try to talk to her. Had our moment in her bedroom been too much? I was trying to take care of her, but maybe I'd gone too far. Well, yeah, Alexei said offhandedly. She would be avoiding you after your mother threatened her. My blood ran cold as my heart stopped. In a deadly tone, I stated, What? Easy there, Stefan warned. He ceased eating for a moment to watch me. Um, you didn't hear about that? Alexei asked. Theo blinked. What exactly is going on? I hissed. My dark voice made me sound like a murderer. Theo and Alexei glanced at each other, and Theo said, The Queen Regent came into Emma's Intro to Portals class last week. From what I've heard, she blames Emma for you two losing the contest. As I understand it, she vowed to make Emma pay for it until Lady Magdalena came in and threw her out. My temper boiled. The nerve of my mother. What was she thinking? To come to the university and threaten my mate? I knew she was upset about the contest, but she had no right to do such a thing. Are you kidding? Why wasn't I informed of this? I thundered. Excuse me, but we're not your servants, my lord. Theo said sarcastically. I sent him a glare and said, Fine, but you are my friends. Someone should have told me. You tend to get a little testy about your mate, Stefan pointed out. He hadn't gone back to eating. What shifter doesn't? I wondered aloud. Okay, but we knew you would erupt once you found out, Alexei said. Emma had a bad cold last week. I figured your energy should be on taking care of her, not fighting with your mother. And the rest of us agreed, Theo said. Stefan nodded once. 
I was fuming, but they had a point. Alexei didn't know about Emma's condition, but he was a griffin. He had empathy magic. He could sense there was something more that Emma wasn't telling. Theo leaned forward. Look, it's a good thing we waited to tell you. If you had gone off on your mother, it would have made the rumors worse. The gossip around school has been juicy as all hell. It's all about how the Queen Regent can't stand her son's mate. And I didn't hear about this how. It's been a week. I shouted. Several people looked my way, but fuck them. Maybe it was because everyone's afraid of your wrath, Alexei offered. I paused. Thinking back, people had been getting awfully quiet whenever I walked into a room. I thought I just looked broody or something. My knuckles cracked. Stefan glanced down. He knew that he was the only shifter big enough at this table to stop me. Take some deep breaths, Princey. Gods, I was seeing red. I wanted to explode into my fur. I needed to get out of here before I caused a scene. I shoved away from the table and walked away. I'll be back. And where are you going? Theo called. Stefan groaned. To take care of the problem. I was supposed to attend Malovian diplomacy in an hour, but I would skip. I needed to have a talk with my mother. My mother was having tea with Lady Iris when I stormed into the place. The grand parlor went silent as I walked in. My mother's lips tightened as she witnessed my expression. She knew I wasn't happy. I'll take my leave, my queen, Lady Iris said. She picked up her skirt and hurried away, leaving my mother and I alone. I didn't waste a second. How dare you, I snarled. My mother raised an eyebrow. Excuse me? I am your mother, child. You have no right to harass my mate, I growled. What you did, storming into the school, threatening her, crossed a line. Mother gave me a haughty laugh, but it had no humor in it. My son, I am a royal, as are you. We can cross any line we desire. She deserves respect, I shot out. She is a commoner, Mother snapped, an American with no royal bloodline. I am ashamed of your decision to marry her. She was trying to guilt me, but I wouldn't have it. I could never be ashamed of Emma. Never. I love her, Mother. My knuckles cracked as my fists tightened. That should be enough for you. Mother scoffed. Love? Get a hold of yourself. Do you believe I loved your father when I married him? Because I did not. I did my duty to the crown and to my country, and I provided an heir, something your mate cannot do. For shame, Ethan. Red-hot rage flickered inside my chest, and I had to tell my wolf to calm down. I do not care whatsoever that she can't have children. I love her besides. You have a responsibility to the monarchy to provide a line of succession. You knew she could not give birth to a child, yet you chose her anyway, Mother cried. Her voice was so loud it seemed to shake the stone walls of the castle. She drew back and sniffed. Regardless, it makes no difference now. She lost you the king's contest. It is all for nothing. Your poor decision of mate has caused you the throne. I was so fucking sick of hearing about this contest, of going over it, of suffering from it, of experiencing the drawback. At this point, I was more than willing to put it behind me and forget it had ever happened. Do you want to know something, mother? I hissed. She was worth it. She was worth sacrificing the monarchy for. Mother let out a disgusted noise. Now I know the little tarts bewitched you. Don't call her names. Gods, if this was anyone but my mother. I reined in the violent wolf inside and claimed, In time, you'll grow to love her. But until that day comes, you will give Emma the respect she deserves as my bonded partner. You have no authority at which to give me orders. Mother seethed. I could see magic flickering at the edges of her fingers as she prepared to hit me. I didn't care. I wasn't a little boy anymore. She couldn't scare me with that nonsense. Her strikes would no longer hurt. I am asking you to be courteous to her. Nothing more. If you cannot fail to do that, I demand you keep your distance. If you dare to threaten her again, there will be bigger consequences from me. A vein bulged in my mother's forehead. You have failed your country and brought dishonor upon your faction. Go, Mother said as she waved her hand. 
I banish you from my sight. I will speak no further on this, I told her sharply. I mean what I said. I twirled on my heel and strode out. I must go. I have a meeting with Emma. My mother didn't respond. The guards and servants eyed me as I strolled out. News of my confrontation with the Queen Regent about my mate would surely be in the tabloids by tomorrow morning. I didn't care. It was worth it to protect Emma. I had to meet Emma by the conservatory that afternoon after three. We had a research project due for our faction abilities midterms and had yet to agree on what it was about. Both of us were busy, myself with the Phantom and Emma with God's knew what. We'd been pushing off starting on it when we should have begun weeks ago, and the due date was two weeks away. We needed to start now. I was able to calm down on the way back to the university. I didn't want Emma to see me like this, and what was done was done. Might as well put it behind us. I arrived late to Malovian diplomacy and finished up the rest of the class, though I could barely keep my head on straight. I was too bothered about what my mother had said to me, and honestly, in a hurry to get back to Emma. I raced to the conservatory the minute my class was dismissed. Emma looked incredible today. She was sitting on the side of the fountain inside the conservatory. She had on a thick dress that looked like a knitted sweater with a gray jacket and matching boots. She was also wearing woolen socks that went all the way up to her thighs. Those damn socks again. I had a major problem with them. My dick jerked in my pants when I saw them rising up under her skirt. Emma turned her head and caught me staring. A sly smile crept across her face when she noticed my gaze on her thighs. Like what you see? she asked. She'd known what I'd been doing. I tried and failed to save my pride and said, Only appreciating your outfit. She wiggled her eyebrows. Or maybe what's underneath it. I felt warmth creep over my face, but I extended a hand to her instead and offered, A prince's thoughts could never be so uncouth. She scoffed. More like you could never admit them. I wasn't going to let her win, but at the same time, this banter was one I would lose. I redirected the conversation and said, We don't have much time for games. If we don't decide on a research topic for faction abilities, we're going to fail. She sniggered. We have plenty of time to research this mating connection. Emma, I scolded, but I couldn't help it. My chest grew warm. She tapped her chin, her tone becoming serious. Can it be about anything? Anything pertaining to Arcanian magic? It doesn't have to specifically be woven, I sighed. Though Professor Lunesta is tough, she doesn't like it when students repeat topics. Anything that someone has done before gets a subpar grade. We need to come up with something new. Hmm. Emma's eyes brightened. The border wall around Malovia, the one that keeps letting out monsters, has that been faulty for a long time? No. I tilted my head. It's a relatively new problem. So what if we investigate the border wall? Emma asked. We could go there and look for clues as to what's breaking it down. Or who. Most importantly, why? I mused. That might be a good idea. A clever way to hide our investigation. I say we go for it. What part of the border wall do we start with? She asked. It's miles long. My mind crossed to where I'd just been a few days ago. The West. I know the wall is weak there. Emma said nothing more, but her gaze narrowed. She was wondering how I knew. I was sure. We began walking through the conservatory. There was an exit on the other side that led to the courtyard, where we could leave through the west side of campus. This time of year, the conservatory was blooming with all kinds of poinsettias, roses, and magical ferns. Emma ran her fingers over a tree that had a twisting trunk with purple flowers growing in the leaves, the petals humming and twirling as we passed. By the way, I began, you don't have to keep avoiding me. I know you're worried about my mother, but you shouldn't be concerned. I took care of her. Emma went red. What? Ethan, what did you do? I heard about your confrontation. I wish you would have told me yourself, instead of me having to find out from Alexi, I said sternly. Emma bit her lip. No girl wants to talk bad about her mother-in-law to her mate. I don't want to make you feel like you're stuck in the middle. You think I'm going to take her side instead of yours? Please, Emma. I huffed. I know my mother, and by far, she is no saint. What she did to you was deplorable. Emma twisted a red strand around her finger. So, what did you tell her? 
that what is between you and me is none of her business, and any threat she can make toward you is one I will protect you from, I said. She knows not to cross you if she doesn't wish to lose me. Her gaze was thoughtful. You didn't have to confront your mother on my behalf. I can take care of myself. Forgive me, Emma, but that is my duty as your mate. You come first above all others, even my mother. She would do well to remember that. Emma blushed. She threaded her fingers through mine as she said, Well, thank you. It was really sweet. Don't worry about her. I placed a kiss on her cheek. She'll learn to accept you in time. Emma's expression knitted together, but she said, Um, all right. As we walked along the conservatory path, Emma said, You know, I'm better now. There are no excuses this time. We should pick up where we left off. Emma says she wants to bring out Ethan's dark side and takes him to a secluded corner of the conservatory where he can enjoy her touch. Voices swelled as students swarmed into the conservatory. There must be another class soon. Conversation bloomed across the greenhouse. I shoved the handkerchief into my pocket and put an arm around Emma's shoulder. Come, we must go. Emma and I hurried out the back entrance of the conservatory. By then, all the sexual tension between us had drained away. Students crowded the courtyard, ending the moment. Emma scowled. Well, this puts a damper on things. I nudged her playfully. Don't worry, I'll get you back when you least expect it. Her cheeks burned and she gave me a hungry gaze. I changed into a wolven. Want to ride to the border wall? I asked. Emma shook her head. Her icy wings bloomed out of her back, and as she fluttered them, her feet rose off the ground. I figured we'd race. Last one to the border wall is a total loser. She'd taken off into the trees before I had a chance to spring after her. I pounced forward, racing behind. I could see the glittering of her blue wings as she charged ahead. Gods above, she was fast. Wolvens were some of the fastest Arcania around, but even I struggled to keep up with the frantic beating of her wings. She beat me to the border wall, though she was panting when I got there, leaning over her knees. I changed back into a man and frowned as I looked down at her. Maybe that wasn't such a good idea. I'm fine, Emma breathed out. She put a hand on my chest to steady herself. I guided her to a nearby rock and helped her sit down. It took ten minutes before Emma recovered. She rose to her feet and said, We should stop dicking around and get to work on that project. I wanted to ask if she was alright, but I knew she'd get upset. The wall is just over there. I led her to the invisible boundary. Emma placed her hand on the illusion. Ripples of shock waves resonated from her hand and through the wall, and she made a face. I can feel the holes in it, she replied. Definitely Arcania magic. Someone is making them on purpose. The cult, most likely, I mused. But why? What reason would they have to destabilize the rest of the world? Emma ran her fingers across the wall, creating more ripples. Their main fight is here, in Malovia. I don't know. It didn't make sense to me either. Our conversation was interrupted by the sound of snarling behind us, and it was close. Emma jumped. I started. We turned to see a monster emerge from the bushes, ten feet away. The creature was a black lion with three heads. It had golden eyes and a thick scar across its right paw. It was some kind of chimera, native to these parts. Ribs poked through its skin. It looked hungry, and we were the closest meal nearby. Neither of us had our swords. This was not a good situation. Emma, get behind me. I growled as I changed. I stood in front of her and lowered my head, baring my teeth. The lion charged. It sprang at me, claws extended. I pushed Emma out of the way before I rolled to the side. The lion landed and spun around, swiping its paw at me. I avoided a bite from one of its three heads and backed away. I couldn't fight it like this. If I got close and tried to rip out its throat, one of the three heads would end my life. I needed more shifters to take down this creature. The lion charged after me, but I sprang aside again. I growled as a warning to stay back. The lion rose up on its hind legs and batted at me with its paws, 
but I caught it off balance and knocked it off its feet. The lion sprung up, swishing its tail. Its golden eyes roamed. It knew I wasn't going to be an easy fight. He saw Emma as the simpler target. The lion changed direction and sprinted toward Emma, opening its three mouths to tear her apart. Emma, run! I cried out, racing after the lion. I wasn't going to get there in time. Gods, it couldn't end this way. Instead of running away, Emma faced the creature and reacted. A spinning magic bloomed from her palms. As the lion jumped to make his kill, Emma shot the spell forward, and a portal expanded before her. The lion let out an alarmed cry as it sailed through the portal, floundering its paws and trying to stop, but it was no use. I caught a glimpse of maple trees and an old, gothic mansion before the portal closed, taking the lion with it. Emma dropped to her knees. I changed back into a man and darted toward her, holding her up by the shoulders before she hit the ground. Are you all right? I asked. Her head lolled. My heartbeat picked up in concern. Emma fluttered her eyelids and said, I'm fine. I just wasn't expecting that. Where'd you send it? I asked, shaking her. She needed to stay awake. She shook her head rapidly. I can't be sure, but it had to be far away. Otherwise, I wouldn't be so weak. Portals are easy for me. How'd you get the idea to make a portal, anyhow? I... I don't know, Emma flustered. I just... I felt like it had to go someplace else. Didn't make a lot of sense, but what did it matter? All I cared about was that the thing was gone. We should go, before more monsters come lurking. I helped Emma to her feet and changed. On my back now, Emma. You're too weak to fly. She protested under her breath, but didn't object further. She laid on my back as I raced back to the university, totally spent. I had learned so much today, and yet the information had only led to more questions. Who was the Hidden King? Why was the cult following him? And what were they doing with the monsters at the border wall? I planned to get some answers tonight. When brute force couldn't handle the job, coin always would. There was a very shady tavern on the bad side of Dolinska called the Crooked Whip. It wasn't a nice place to hang out. It was constantly dark inside, even on the brightest of days, dirty, and attracted the worst people. Faye only went there if they were looking for trouble, which is exactly why the information I needed was most likely to be found there. The ale was watered down and cheap, and the barkeep wouldn't cut you off no matter how much you had, which made the tavern perfect for those with secrets to spill. I kept my hood up when I entered the tavern through the back. The hood concealed my face, so no one recognized my mask. A spindly dragon shifter polished filthy glasses behind the bar. Winover Birivum was gangly and small for his faction, but it didn't fool me. I'd seen him pin an unlucky Seely against a wall and nearly slit his throat for trying to walk out on a tab. The old man raised a greedy eyebrow as I leaned on the counter. The Phantom knew the barkeep, but kept him paid well to pass on information. Winover hadn't been able to give me any intel on where the Black Claw's new hideout was based, but perhaps he could tell me something about the Hidden King. Did you find who I asked for? I whispered, casting a quick glance to see if anyone was watching. Winover nodded. In the back. I slipped him a few coins, which he eagerly pocketed. I took a side door to the storeroom. A man drank deeply from a tankard, sitting by a table that was placed haphazardly next to barrels of aged ale. We were the only ones inside, and he was half drunk. He looked alicorn, definitely not a cultist, but probably knew those that were. I removed my hood. The alicorn lowered his tankard as he took me in. The phantom, he grunted. Winover didn't tell me I'd be talking to a vigilante. I'll make it worth your time. I'm looking for information, I told the man. Who is the Black Claw's leader? Who is the Hidden King? The alicorn smirked. Asking the tough questions, are we? I don't have time for games. Either tell me what you know or I'll take my payment and leave. He scowled. You don't have to be unpleasant about it. I thought the answer would be obvious. Obvious how? I questioned. He was trying my nerves. The alicorn shrugged and took another swig. I've got quite a few cultist friends. People I grew up with, you know. 
and they think their hidden king is none other than Elijah Zlodia. My blood ran cold. Elijah? No, it couldn't be. He was a total bastard, but was he that evil? I started toward the table. The alicorn's eyes became wide as I fisted a hand in his shirt. Are you lying? Tell me the truth. What reason do I have to lie? The alicorn rasped. Zolia came to the Black Claw before the contest began. He vowed to restore the cult to glory if they followed his rule. At least, that's how my friends tell it. The horror inside me grew and clawed its way at my insides. I wondered how far this man's love of money ran. I let him go and took a few steps back. Could you be persuaded to tell me where your friends are? I dared to ask. I don't want anyone getting hurt here, the alicorn said coolly. My friends may be cultists, but they are my friends. And I won't go giving them up so you can continue on your little killing sprees. That was fair. I needed to be cautious. I didn't want to piss off my informant. Yet there was still so much I didn't know. What about Waldron's death? You've heard of it. Who killed him? Gods, if I know, the alicorn grunted. It could have been some test by the cult to make Zlody approve himself. Are you saying he murdered Waldron in cold blood? I hissed. I don't know nothing about no murder, the man drawled. All I know is the cult has vowed to follow Elijah Zloda, their hidden king, and they're willing to spill blood to prove their loyalty. What about the border wall? I questioned. Everyone knows it's getting weaker, and monsters, the Black Claws abducting them. But why? The alicorn huffed. Why wouldn't they try to ruin the wall? To destabilize the region, of course. If I had to guess, the Black Claw is gathering monsters to sacrifice for their dark rituals. They're becoming stronger, you know. Stronger by the day. He crossed his arms. I'm not saying nothing more about it. I'm already in hot water. I say any more, and the cult will have my head. If they won't already, once they find out. I stood from the table and tossed a velvet bag of Malovian currency on the table. Your pay. The man snatched it greedily, and I made my exit from the pub. My teeth were gnashing in hatred and rage. Whether Elijah had killed Waldron or another cultist had done the job for him was irrelevant. Waldron was dead. There was no bringing him back. And I feared more people were about to die if something wasn't done. Elijah might be the Hidden King, but I couldn't touch him. Couldn't do a damn thing. Any repercussions I could take would only result in my execution or imprisonment. Most likely execution, if I decided to take extreme measures and assassinate the future king of the Arcania. Though I didn't mind sacrificing my life for the good of Malovia, I couldn't do that to Emma. I was mated now. I had to think of other people besides myself. And as much as I despised my cousin, I didn't know if I had the reserve to kill him. Though I hated to admit it, there was a small part of me that still loved him. We had a history together, before he'd betrayed me. A family bond. We'd once been like brothers, closer than any two men could be. Then everything had changed. I didn't want his life to end. I wanted to stop him from slaughtering other people. I hadn't asked for the burden of deciding to spare Elijah's life or saving the people of Malovia. I worried one day I'd have to make that choice. There was no proof Elijah was the Hidden King. I doubted he was any kind of prophesied one like the Druids said. Most likely, he'd ran with the assumption and fooled the Black Claw into thinking he was some sort of chosen one to get them to do his bidding. Didn't matter either way. If the cult thought Elijah was the Hidden King and was willing to follow him, he could get them to do terrible things on the ruse of a fairy tale. The prophecy said the Hidden King would kill Emma. I refused to allow that to happen. Elijah wouldn't touch Emma. If it came down to killing my cousin or saving my mate, I wouldn't hesitate. Elijah's life would be mine. Something in my gut told me I wasn't putting all the pieces together. I didn't know what I was missing. Our only hope was if Elijah and Gabby failed their competency tests. My friends and I were doing everything in our power to make sure that happened, but there were no guarantees. I heard the sound of a rock skittering across the rooftops and looked up. There, I caught a hint of a white cloak, eyes flashing behind a silver mask. I went to follow, but the white rose was already gone.
Chapter 10. Emma. I was getting damn tired of following Ethan around. More than that, I was damn tired of hiding the white rose from him. He knew now that Elijah was proclaimed the hidden king by the cult. He didn't have proof Elijah had killed Waldron, but he suspected. The reasons I had for concealing the white rose from Ethan were dwindling away. It had only been two months, but already this secret was becoming more than I could bear. At least intro to enchanting provided an adequate distraction. Professor Calliope was grilling us and I didn't have any time to think about Ethan while trying to enchant powerful objects. Today we're going to be learning about the art of transference. That is, the art of storing your powers within a weapon. Calliope instructed, This is not an ability specific to Arcania, though our illusion magic makes it easier for us than it is for other supernaturals. Other magical races have the ability of transference using crystals or other objects such as wands. Since fey practice forbids the use of those items, we specialize in trapping our illusion powers into our weapons, mainly our swords. Kiara shifted uncomfortably next to me. Underneath her shirt lay the crystal her sister had given her. Nobody else knew she had it but me. I knew the fey taught that crystals were demonic, only used by those who practice dark magic, but I wasn't convinced they were evil. I had to admit I didn't know much about them to be sure. Calliope held her own sword in front of the classroom. Storing your magic is very important. Magic users only have so much energy inside of them at a time. If one is to run out of magical energy, they'll be rendered unable to practice spells. Worse, if one pushes themselves past to the limits of their own magic, they could kill themselves. Having magic stored in your weapon for safekeeping provides a safety net for emergencies in either of these situations. She placed her longsword upon her desk. To transfer your powers into your weapon, place your hands on it. You can close your eyes or stare at it. You must keep your focus. Imagine funneling the power inside yourself into the weapon and tucking it there to give it a safe place to stay. Magical energy can be transferred from one source to another merely by touching, but to truly transfuse your object, you must have intent. Begin. I looked down. The sword Ethan had forged for me, Lord Brazan, lay on the velvet table in front of us. I'd been told to bring it today. On Kiara's side was a dagger that she'd borrowed from Professor Calliope. She grasped the hilt and narrowed her eyes, working on transference. You don't have a weapon of your own? I asked her. Kiara shrugged. Weapons aren't usually given to sorceresses until their mate has forged it for them, like with you and Ethan. I wiggled my eyebrows. So how long is it going to take for Alexi to make yours? She slapped me on the shoulder with her free hand. Stop! We're not even mated. Not yet, I teased. She blushed. Honestly, Emma, it's like mating is all that's on your mind. Hey, spring is on its way, I suggested. Which was very true. People were bonding left and right. After Valentine's Day hit, there were a ton of couples cozied up around the school. Why none of my friends had bonded yet when their mates were right in front of them was still a mystery. Or maybe not. Delmer knew she had bonded. She was just afraid of getting hurt. Odette didn't realize she had bonded with Theo and was distracted by another alicorn. Kiara couldn't quite say. Maybe she was still unsure. Something I understood. I'd walked around all last semester believing I couldn't possibly be bonded to Ethan when the truth was plain to see. I skimmed my fingers over the blade before me, tracing the patterns of running wolves. I took a deep breath and focused on the powers nesting inside my belly. I commanded my illusion magic to rise. It fought me, refusing to leave my chest. My magic had been weak ever since I'd gotten a cold, and I was still trying to recover. It'd been three weeks now, and I wasn't completely better. I still had a cough and felt tired from time to time. As someone with CVID, it took me forever to feel normal whenever I got sick. I'd been to the doctor, but he insisted there was nothing left to do but give it time. Give it time. Huh. Give it time until I caught something else, I bet. My magic wavered. Then finally, I felt it flow. It went through my heart, down my arm, and into the sword. 
As I trailed my hand down the blade, I could feel the magic waiting there as it thrummed throughout the sword. Lord Bazan was an excellent weapon. I'd placed a large amount of my magic into the blade, and there was still plenty of room to spare for more. Ethan had taken great care forging this sword for me. Still, the effort made me exhausted. Professor Calliope eyed me as if she wanted me to try again, but didn't force it when she saw how tired I was. My professors had been informed of my condition. I'd signed up in the disability office last semester when I got here and had forms delivered to all of them alerting them to my condition. The only professor I truly regretted knowing was Lady Corva. She'd find a way to use my illness against me. Emma, are you okay? Your skin's so pale, Kiara said. Her attention drew away from the dagger to focus on me. I caught my breath and forced out a joke. I'm a ginger. I'm always pale, girl. Kiara didn't believe me, but she didn't press either. She turned her focus back to the dagger, though her eyes kept flickering my way. I hadn't told her about my disease yet. There was no reason to hide it from her or any of my friends, but I still worried they wouldn't look at me in the same way. So I was trying to pretend I was normal for as long as I could, even though it was obvious I wouldn't be able to conceal it for much longer. Do you want me to take your sword back to your dorm? I can grab our textbooks. Kiara offered when class ended. I was wavering on my feet. Kiara, Delmer, and I were supposed to get together for a study session in the library. I had to go back to my dorm before then, but honestly, I didn't know if I could make the walk there and back. That would be great, I told her in relief. Meet you there? Kiara nodded. She took my sword, then started down the hallway. My gut churned in guilt. Kiara knew there was something wrong with me. I was doing a shitty job hiding it, yet still she wanted to help. I had to get over it and tell her, tell all of them. I headed to the girl's lavatory to splash some cold water on my face. Maybe it would help. Like the rest of Arcania University, the bathrooms were beautiful. Wooden stalls, elaborate floor-length mirrors, and carpet floors made up the room, with special vanities for girls to put on their makeup. Every time I had to piss, I felt like a movie star. There was one other girl in here, hiding in one of the stalls. As I was washing my face, I heard someone retch. I turned the water off and paused. It sounded like someone was gagging. Are you okay? I asked, and the vomiting stopped. I wiped off my face with one of the hand towels before I knocked on the stall door. The door opened. Bashfully, Odette emerged from the stall, a paleness in her cheeks. Worry flooded over me and took over my veins like ice. I couldn't tell the group about my CVID right now. We had bigger problems. Odette? I started as she wiped her mouth with her sleeve. Her uniform, which had fit her perfectly at the start of the semester, sagged off of one shoulder, exposing a bony arm. I'm all right, Odette rushed to say. I just don't feel well. I have the flu. She had to be lying. You were at ballet practice yesterday. So? Athletes don't get sick days. You know that, Emma. She shot back. I'd skated through colds and the flu plenty of times, but I knew that wasn't it. When was the last time you ate? Odette scoffed. This morning. Quit pestering me. It's not right. What did you eat? I demanded to know. Gods, I knew she'd been dropping weight, but I figured she was toning up due to all the practice she had day in and day out. I should have known better. Odette wrapped her arms around herself. I told you I'm fine. You need to believe me. She wasn't going to budge. I sighed. If you have the flu, you need to go to the hospital wing. The nurses there would see what was going on. They'd stop this. Odette narrowed her eyes. I'll be over it in a few days. I just need to rest. Rest isn't going to help. If you want to keep the part of Juliet, you have to nourish yourself and- Stop it, Emma! Odette shouted. I reeled back. Odette had never raised her voice to me, to anyone, so to hear her scream was kind of scary. This part means everything to me! You don't understand how much I want this! If I knew you were doing everything to win your competition, I wouldn't stand in your way! I'm not standing in your way, I pleaded. I'm trying to help you. Then 
let me be the best Juliet I can be and leave me alone. Odette slipped past me and ran out. My heart dropped. I knew what was wrong with her, but I didn't want to admit it. Yet the reality was staring me in the face. Odette had an eating disorder. She needed to get better because losing this part wasn't the worst thing that could happen to her. The alternative was too scary to consider. At the same time, who would I tell? I didn't know her parents. I could tell a teacher, but Odette was of age. No one could force her to get help unless she wanted it. Theo. I could tell Theo. I grabbed my bag and hurried through the hallway. I saw many alley corn boys in the crowded hallways, but none of them were Odette's mate. I gave up and went to the library. Maybe Delmare would know where he was. She always kept tabs on everybody. Kiara wasn't there when I arrived. Delmare had taken a square table by the window, between a few shelves that were isolated from the rest of the library. I slipped into the seat beside her and threw my bag on the table. Have you seen Theo around? I asked. It's an emergency. Delmare didn't hear me. Her head swiveled this way and that, as if looking for something or someone. What's wrong? I asked. But I had my question answered as a figure slipped out of the shadows. Andrick, the ugly dragon shifter that always hung around Elijah, lurched out from one of the shelves. Delmare's face became disgusted as he came into view. To my outrage, Andrick placed his brutish hands on Delmare's shoulders and began giving her a massage. I wanted to break his fingers. Hey, sweetheart, Andrick lulled. Where have you been hiding? Delmare cringed away. I will seriously punch you in the dick if you don't back off. Mava was at a table nearby. She was watching Delmare carefully in case she had to get a teacher. Mava was kind of a loner, but she was loyal to her friends. And she'd caught on that Andrick was a total creep. Andrick squeezed Delmare's shoulders and it looked like it hurt. Delmare winced and he said, That's only a teaser, baby. You know I like it rough. Hey, asshole, I snapped. Leave us the fuck alone. Andrick ignored me. He leaned down to whisper in Delmare's ear. I watched goosebumps travel up her arms as he said, Come on, let's go somewhere more private. The nerve of this prick. I stood up from my chair. It fell backward with a clatter as I shoved Andrick, releasing his hold on Delmare. I'm not afraid to get physical, I threatened. You want to join in on the fun? Andrick chuckled and a bit of smoke puffed out of his nostrils. Dragons are bigger than wolvens, if you're wondering. Like I'd ever have a threesome with this sick bastard. I rounded on Andrick. If you don't leave us alone right the fuck now, I will claw out your eyeballs and throw them back at you while I laugh. Andrick blinked. He hadn't expected such an insane response. I planted myself between him and Delmare as I growled. If you don't want to end up blind, go, before I rip your artery out of your throat and eat it for breakfast. I was shouting at this point. People from the aisleways were starting to stare. Andrick looked around the room before he took a few steps back. Crazy bitch, he muttered under his breath and stomped off. I picked my chair back up and took my seat again, though I was still shaking with fury. Mava hid a smile behind the book she had open and went back to reading. Delmare seemed relieved. Thanks, Emma. I've tried to ward him off before, but not like that. You have to act crazy. It throws them off if you get aggressive and make a scene, I said. Growing up in Detroit, my mom had taught me to get loud if someone was threatening me. Predators didn't like people who weren't easy targets. I've threatened... But he just keeps coming back, Delmare hissed. You should stay out of it. I don't want you to get hurt. Andrick's not going to touch me. He thought I was nuts and I had Ethan to protect me. I knew the little shithead was scared of my mate. Delmare, though, she was an open target. She shivered. I've tried using illusion magic, but he's older than me, which makes him stronger. I don't have enough magical experience to duel him and put him in his place. Have you told Stefan? I dropped my voice to a whisper. No way would the dragon shifter let this keep happening. He'd beat Andrick to a pulp. Delmare grabbed my arm. No, and you can't either. Emma, 
You can't tell Stefan about this. Swear to me you won't. Her nails dug into my wrist. It was painful. I winced and said, Stefan isn't going to let this continue. He'd make Andrik leave you alone. I need to prove I can handle myself, she pleaded. Strength is important among the Arcania. If I'm seen as weak, it'll get worse. Just please, don't say a word to him. I held in a breath. If Andrik keeps this up, I'm not making any promises. You need protection. Trust me, Emma. Telling Stefan is only going to start a feud between him and Andrik, and then he'll get in trouble because of me. If you're my friend, you'll keep quiet. Her gaze was pleading. My stomach twisted into knots. I didn't want to betray down there, but still, her safety came first. I'll stay silent for now, I promised. But the next time I see Andrik harassing you, I'm telling Stefan and the other guys. That is, if I don't smash an illusion spell into Andrik's face myself. I'm sure Ethan and the rest of the boys would get their kicks out of putting Andrik in his place. Literally. Dalmere let go of my arm with a scowl. Fine, whatever. Anyway, what is it you wanted to talk about? I opened my mouth. I was about to spill to her what I'd seen in the bathroom, but my words fell flat. I couldn't worry Delmer about Odette, not now. Not when Andrek was stalking her. I just need to talk to Theo, I said. Do you know where he is? No, she shook her head. His alicorn class took a field trip. He won't be back until the weekend. Fucking damn it. Gone right when I needed him. But there's a festival going on this weekend to celebrate the coming of spring. Dalmere suggested. All the Arcania will be there. I'm sure you can find him there. I didn't feel much like partying, but if Theo was around, I could talk to him about Odette. Okay, I replied. Count me in. I was so worried about Odette and Dalmere, but maybe the festival would provide me with a chance to help them both. That Saturday was a leap year and the day of the festival. On February 29th, I met Ethan at the entryway of the palace, all bundled up to head into the cold. It wasn't quite spring in Malovia yet, as evidenced by the giant snowdrifts outside, but hopefully the weather would clear up in a few weeks and we'd have warmth again. Though I felt plenty warm when I observed the features of Ethan's face. He met me with a gracious smile that made joy spread from the bottom of my core all the way to the ends of my being. There was a sultriness in his eyes that hadn't quite been there before. Things were different now between us in a big way. I mean, I'd jerked him off the last time we'd been together. It was totally hot. I was wearing a new pair of knee-length socks today. Ethan had been all over me in the conservatory, and it'd been because of those socks. I'd caught him staring a few times before at the other pairs I had, and knew he was into them. I ran out the next day and bought several more, because honestly, I knew they were insta-tickets into Ethan Nowak's pants. His eyes landed on the socks I wore and remained glued there until I was at his side. You're tormenting me, Miss Sosna. A little torture is good, I replied. I slipped my hand in his and squeezed it. And I like it when you check me out. He smirked. I'm certain you do. We walked into the main courtyard. What's the purpose of this festival? It seems like the Arcania have a lot of them, I said. There are four festivals of the year to celebrate the changing seasons. Bognaval is the festival of spring and Milana's holiday. Ethan informed me. The Arcania welcome the spring as it comes, blessing Milana with a party before she warms Melovia with her light. Milana was my goddess and the one who'd chosen me to be her champion. I loved learning about her. Ale tents are set up in the main square in Dolinska, Ethan said. The party's there. The others are already waiting. The tents in Dolinska were gigantic able to fit hundreds of people. We stepped inside where Arcania were taking tickets at the front counter. Ethan paid for the both of us before he wound us within the tables of the festival. Why do you always pay for me? I asked. You're my lady, he replied. Why shouldn't I? 
Well, I'd like to treat you now and then. I nudged him. You don't always have to play the role of Prince Charming. Ethan smiled like the idea was pleasant to him, but said nothing more. Bognaval was set up differently than Heimskanun. Huge bonfires blazing in the middle kept the tent warm, sorceresses dancing around them. In a square arena, alicorns sparred in their animal forms, using their horns like swords while people threw coin and cheered around them. Mark sold woven flower and grass crowns at vendors, which Mark bought and put in their hair. Ethan purchased two carnations from a girl selling them by the bunch and handed one to me. I smelled it, and magically, the petals bloomed right before my eyes. A pretty illusion. The scent of flowers was so strong in the tent it was almost overpowering. There was a loud band, which played traditional Malovian music. On the dance floor, couples twirled to the polka before coming together in a group dance. Long tables and benches were throughout the tent, loaded with food. Mugs of ale were everywhere, and at the back of the tent, giant tankards as big as dragons were being poured from every second. It was clear by the tipsy arcania at every table that the main purpose of Bognaval was to get very drunk. The Fae sang along to folk songs played by the band, ale spilling from mugs. The Arcania Alliance watched, police stationed throughout the tent to make sure a bar brawl didn't break out. An altar was set up to Milana at the head of the tent. There was a statue of the dear goddess before the wide table. On the table were eggs, flowers, and seeds. A few children played with rabbits near the altar, giggling and stroking their soft fur. Ethan crossed to the table. He kissed his flower and laid it upon the altar as an offering. I went to follow his lead, though I felt a wiggle in my stomach when I touched the altar. Milana was my goddess. I felt a special connection with her. She was the goddess of romance and love, two things that I was grateful to experience. Yet she was also the goddess of fertility and motherhood, something I would never have. I kissed the carnation. If it's possible, and you find it in your favor... Let it be me one day. I laid the flower on the altar, aware that Ethan's eyes were on me. He'd been watching. He couldn't hear my thoughts, but it damn well felt like he could. His eyes scanned the crowd for our friends. Where are they? We didn't have to ask. Even with the music, Stefan's loud voice was booming across the room. Our group took up an entire table of our own near the right back corner. Everyone was dressed in winter clothes to keep warm, except for Odette, who was wearing this big, overly poofy white dress that had the embroidery of flowers stitched into the fabric, and with a pink bow in the back that tied it all together. I was glad to see her wearing something spectacular like normal, and not the big, baggy clothes she'd taken to lately. Maybe she was getting better. But then again, I noticed Odette's plate was once again empty, as it had been most days we'd eaten together. I frowned. Things hadn't improved since I'd spoken to her. We slid onto the bench, and Stefan said, About time you showed up. Thought you'd never come. Ethan came all right. Delmere cracked. Odette and Kiara giggled. I bit my lip to keep from laughing with them. I'd told the three of them what had happened between Ethan and I in the conservatory. It'd been so exciting, it was hard to keep to myself. Stefan wiggled his eyebrows. Ah, so that's what took you so long. We didn't do anything today, I teased. Ethan smirked, but said nothing. He wasn't the kind to kiss and tell. Theo placed a mug into Ethan's hand. Have a drink, my friend. There was Theo. I needed to talk to him. But Odette was here. I couldn't ask to speak with him in private now. Are you doing okay, Alexi? I asked. I knew he was a griffin and therefore had empathy powers that he struggled with. It was an emotional overload for him to be here with all these people. He nodded. I'm good. It doesn't bother me. That was a nice surprise. Kiara grasped his hand and said, We've been working on our shields. He's doing so much better. Alexi blushed and I happily helped myself to a serving of sauerkraut and Polish sausage. Those two were so cute together. I couldn't wait for the day they admitted they liked each other. There was sudden applause and cheering that roared over the crowd, and the band stopped playing. I looked up. The food in my mouth soured as I saw Gabby and Elijah walk into the tent, led by a procession created by the circle. As they walked on stage, 
I noticed Ethan's expression visibly drop. Lord Zlodia raised his hands and the applause died down. Let us rejoice, for not only do we celebrate the arrival of spring, but the upcoming crowning of a new king. The Arcania cheered. Ethan stared into his mug. His fingers were white from him gripping it so tight. I put a hand on his knee. Do you want to get out of here? He scowled. I'd have to leave Malovia altogether to be rid of Elijah, and that is something I will not do. Might as well stay here. Our friends eyed him, but Ethan only downed his tankard. Gabby strolled forward on stage, and Lord Zlodia cried, I'd like to introduce my soon-to-be daughter-in-law and the future queen, Gabriella Sierre. Gabby dipped her self-righteous head, and a few sorceresses in the crowd screamed like she was a pop star, probably Melissa and Morgan. Zlodia gestured for Gabby to come to center stage and stated, A presentation of our future queen's power for all the Arcania to see. Show them, my dear. Gabby fixated her eyes forward. I swore they drilled into me, and she smirked before she raised her hands, using her magic to change the tent into an illusion of magic. The surrounding area changed. The tables and benches disappeared. Myself and the hundreds of the Arcania within became surrounded by a nighttime forest. My stomach clenched as I turned in my seat. Shadowy creatures roamed in and out of the leaves of the forest, their eyes upon me like they wanted a snack and I was it. The moon shone red from above and the skies were wiped of stars. The dark light made everything look coated in blood. An awful feeling of dread crept up in my chest, though I didn't know where it came from. People screamed in terror, and I heard the children in the tent cry, but I kept my tears held in. It was only an illusion I knew. I could see the telltale signs of wispiness at the edges of my vision, betraying that this was unreal. But it was a terrifying illusion nonetheless. I gazed at the faces of my friends. Odette had her hands over her eyes and was leaning into Theo, who rubbed her arms for support. Stefan and Delmer wore grim expressions. Alexi had his eyes held tightly shut, while Kiara whispered things to try to comfort him. Ethan acted like nothing was going on at all, merely poured himself another ale and kept on drinking, refusing to look at either Gabby or Elijah. I felt thoroughly miserable. The illusion ended and the tent reappeared. Gabby looked very pleased with herself. Many people remained quiet, white and shocked faces resonating throughout, but many others clapped and cheered with approval. Elijah and Lord Zlodia both held their heads high, bursting with pride. I scowled. This was a spring festival. Gabby could have made a pretty spring picture for everyone to enjoy, but instead she made a nightmare to terrify them because that was her plan. Gabby wanted people to be scared of her. She wanted the people to fear her. That was the only way she could keep them in line. Showing off like she did in the middle of the festival was one way to gain the favor or fear of her subjects. Her goal was to either impress or intimidate, and she'd done both. As the crowd continued to praise Gabby, my friends and I ducked our heads in. How could she do that? Odette whispered. She sounded scared. Kiara narrowed her eyes suspiciously. Delmere was fuming. Stefan's hand on her arm was the only thing that kept her from leaping up. I should walk right up to her and give her a smack, Delmere growled. What was she thinking? There are kids here. Theo became stiff, like a horse on high alert. Alexei had opened his eyes, but his gaze seemed haunted. I bet his emotional shield had broken, and he'd felt everyone in the room at once. Poor Alexi. Ethan broke from his statuesque appearance. Gabby shouldn't be this powerful, he murmured. Not at first year level. I agreed. Something's up with her, I said. She's using power that's not her own. She has to be. Do you think another sorceress is helping her? Maybe she was outside the tent and Gabby just pretended to do it herself, Odette asked. Stefan huffed. If you haven't noticed, Lady Corba isn't around. That was true. I hadn't seen the old crone anywhere. 
but that kind of illusion isn't easy to pull off. There's hundreds of people here to enchant, I pointed out. She'd need more than Lady Corva. The bitch probably has a whole team, Delmere complained. I wasn't sure. Gabby had shown spectacular power during the King's Contest, too. She hadn't been simple to beat. I think we should keep an eye on her, I said lowly. She's hiding something. Isn't she always? Dalmere sighed, but the group around the table nodded in unison. All except Ethan. He took another deep drink from his tankard again, and my stomach plummeted into a pit. As the night wore on, Elijah and Gabby made a show of making the festival all about themselves. We turned our back on them, but to be honest, they were hard to ignore. Gabby kept on performing spectacular illusions, creating a woolen out of sparks and changing it into a dragon. How is she doing that, I wondered. We'd just started getting into optical illusions in Intro to Illusion Magic. She hadn't been that good in class the other day. It was like she'd gone in a new direction with her powers. Ethan was taking losing the crown hard. He ordered ale after ale and kept his gaze on his mug as Elijah's boasting rang throughout the tent, saying nothing. It was difficult for me to watch, knowing how hurt he was. When he walked off to go to the bathroom, I scooted next to the boys. Worried about your man? Theo asked me as I sat beside him. He is a bit depressed, Stefan said under his breath. He'd stopped drinking an hour ago, probably to babysit Ethan. A bit? Alexi hissed. He's drowning his sorrows in ale. Hey, I'm not a griffin. I can't feel things like you can, Stefan protested. I figured you didn't need to be an empath to see Ethan was upset. He'd chugged the last two beers in a matter of minutes. How much can shifters drink? I asked. Ethan had to have worked through a keg by now. A freaking lot, Stefan responded. But our boy's at his limit. After Ethan returned, I put an arm around his back and drew him close. Maybe you should slow down, he frowned. What for? Nothing helps. Damn, he really was depressed. Do you want to talk about it? I asked, feeling helpless. Ethan shrugged. What's there to talk about? We might as well celebrate. This wasn't just about losing the crown. I knew for a fact he'd hit a dead end with his phantom investigations. He felt like a failure. Well, if you want to get it off your chest, I'm here, I offered. Ethan said nothing more, and I pulled away from him. I was trying so hard to make him happy, and I was failing. Gods, I felt like a horrible girlfriend. You can't make him feel better if he doesn't want to, Emma, Kiara whispered to me. Let him come around at his own time. I knew what she was saying, but it still felt like my fault. I just wanted Ethan to be happy. Why did Gabby have to come by and fuck that up? My concern over Ethan was temporarily dissolved as someone I didn't know came to the table. He placed a hand on Odette's shoulder lightly. As she turned, she squealed and giggled. Theo's smile fell, and I knew exactly who it was. Igor was blonde, like most alicorns were, and tall. But he definitely wasn't very handsome, sorry to say. I didn't know what Odette saw in him. Enjoying the festival? Igor asked. His voice was high-pitched and kind of annoying. Odette bobbed her head. Oh yes, it's absolutely wonderful! Odette spread her arms out wide. Igor, these are my friends! I've been dying for you to meet them! Igor's eyes didn't rise from hers. He didn't seem too interested in talking to us. Would you like to dance? Of course! Odette sprang right out of her seat. Her bow whacked Theo in the face. Igor and Odette strutted off walking hand in hand. Everyone looked away awkwardly, except for Stefan, who made no effort to hide his cringing. I didn't know what to think of Igor. I mean, he seemed like a nice enough guy, but it was hard to like him when I knew that Theo was perfect for Odette. The sight of Odette dancing with Igor turned me off the rest of my dinner. I'd gotten a second helping, but suddenly I wasn't hungry. I pushed my plate aside and said, Theo, can I talk to you? He wrenched his eyes away from Odette and said, Sure. We walked outside the tent, where it was quieter. A few snowflakes trickled down. I wiped one off my nose, as Theo said. I know I should tell her about our mating bond, Emma. I just need more time. It's not about that, 
I began. It's something else. Theo's body stiffened. Is something wrong with Odette? I took a steadying breath. I think so. Theo, I caught her throwing up in the bathroom the other day. He was a dancer. He knew what that meant. I felt my heart crack as I saw tears beating at the edges of Theo's eyes. He bit his lip to keep from crying, and I noticed his hands bunching into fists. Damn it, he whispered. I knew this would happen. I should have caught it sooner. You can't blame yourself for not noticing until now. She's barely around anymore, I said. She was always with fucking Igor. I think that's on purpose, Theo said. She knows we'll catch on if we don't see her eating. He shook his head. She's always making excuses as to why she wasn't eating. I knew she cared about this role, but I had hoped. He trailed off. Do you think you can get her to quit? I asked. No, ballet means everything to her. It's her whole life. That's the problem, I said in frustration. Sports like ballet and skating, they consume you. They take and take until there's nothing to give anymore, leaving you an empty vessel. You're preaching to the choir. I understand how it works, Theo said firmly. He ran a hand through his hair. People like you and I can put limits on how much we give to our art, but Odette can't. She wants to be a prima ballerina so badly, and she'll do anything to get there. She thinks it's worth it to sacrifice her health. But she danced with the Russian ballet and decided to quit to come to Arcania University. She was at the top and she gave all that up, I objected. Why would she do that? Theo shrugged. To be honest, I don't know why she quit the Russian company. But she needs to dance here. Malovia is her home. And we're just as competitive in ballet as Russia is. It's tough to get a spot at all, let alone a lead role in the Malovian ballet. Odette is under a lot of pressure to prove she's perfect. Theo's hands balled into fists. Though the bastard she's with doesn't help. Igor runs the company, and he's made it clear he's willing to replace Odette if she doesn't lose a few more pounds. Are you serious? I gaped. What a prick. He acts like Odette isn't trying hard enough when she's the one who tries the hardest, Theo said. She thinks he's coaching her to be better, but he's ruining her career. Theo sighed. I don't even think she'd believe me now if I told her I was her mate. She's too wrapped up in him. The jealousy in his tone was evident. I took Theo's hands in mine. You can't give up. Deep down, I know she loves you. But right now, she needs your help more than ever. Theo squeezed my hands. I will talk to her, Emma. I'll get her the help she needs. Relief flooded my middle. Thank you. He gave a sad smile back. You should get back to your own mate. I think he needs you too. Ethan sprang to the forefront of my mind. I dropped Theo's hands and raced into the tent. A shuddersome feeling took over me as I saw Ethan swaying in his seat, holding an empty tankard. He was drunk. I'd been gone for five minutes. How much ale had he had in that time? Yara seemed apologetic as I sat back down. I'm sorry, Emma. We tried telling him to stop. It's okay. I noticed people were staring. The reporters and paparazzi would notice him any minute if they hadn't already. Alexei eyed Ethan. Dude, you need to stop drinking. I'll be fine. Ethan slurred. Not even drunk. Bullshit, Alexei hissed. You're done. Alexei took the mug away. Ethan took a swing at him and missed. I was shocked. Ethan had never behaved this way. And that's your cue to go home, Stefan said. He grabbed Ethan around the shoulders and held him back. Come on, buddy. Let me go. Ethan tried to lunge away from Stefan, but I leapt up and wrapped my arms around him so he didn't make a scene. Ethan calmed at my touch, but the moment I let him go, he started freaking out again. Stefan jerked his head in the other direction. I'm gonna need your help. Got it, I breathed. I put one of Ethan's arms around my shoulders. God damn, he was heavy. See you guys later. So you don't need assistance? Alexei asked. Keep the press busy, Stefan quickly said. His eyes were hooked on a reporter on the other side of the tent, who had a camera and was covering the event. He hadn't noticed us yet, but he would. No problem, Delmer smiled. She stood up from her seat and began shouting loudly at Kiara. 
Excuse me? What did you say to me, bitch? Huh? Kiara asked, bewildered. Before she could do anything, Delmer had picked her up. She literally threw Kiara across the table into a group of sorceresses. They screamed. One spilled her ale on another's dress, and the girl reacted by pushing her down. Their mates got involved. Almost instantaneously, the tent changed from a party into a drunken brawl. Alexi turned into a griffin and pounced to stand over Kiara and protect her from being stepped on. In moments, the Arcania Alliance was in the middle of the fight, trying to sort things out. Stefan and I were able to slip Ethan out the back, but not before Elijah saw us leaving. He smirked. He knew he was getting to Ethan. Screw you, I hissed inside my head. Never have I hated him more in that moment. Stefan and I dragged Ethan to a carriage. Even with Stefan's help, it was no easy effort. The guy was twice the size of me. Ethan moaned. He looked positively green. Before I got him into the carriage, he retched and threw up ale all over the curb. The carriage driver sneered, but I tossed him an extra coin and he kept quiet. I've got to get him back to Arcania University. I'm coming with you. Stefan climbed inside. The ride back to school felt like it took forever and every bump in the road made Ethan gag. Thankfully, he didn't puke again until we got him back to the university after the carriage had stopped. My nose wrinkled as I watched Ethan vomit into a collection of bushes. By gods, how much did he drink? More than I've ever seen before, Stefan admitted. He took it hard. I was going to kill Gabby and Elijah. Help me get him to his room. Ethan was so sloppy on his feet, we more or less had to carry him. When we got to his dorm, I shoved Ethan on the bed. He fell like a sack of potatoes. Stefan thumbed at the hallway. I'm gonna give you two some space. He closed the door behind him. I worked on yanking off my mate's boots, though Ethan sloppily stood up and tried pushing me off. Get off me, miss. I made it, Ethan slurred. God damn it, you stupid wolf. It's me, I said. I was about tired of this. No, he cried. Again, he tried to push me off. I love him, ma. It's very honorable you don't want to cheat on me with myself. Still, affection bloomed inside of me at his admission. He'd never said he loved me before, but I'd bet he'd forget he said that in the morning. As stupid as this situation was right now, his actions were kind of sweet. Ethan was so drunk he couldn't walk straight, and he was still intent on being faithful to me. Guess I didn't have to worry about infidelity. Ethan retched. I ran to grab the trash can before he could hurl all over the floor. I caught his puke just in time, but he mostly threw up all over himself. I sighed. Damn it, he was a sloppy mess. I got a wet washcloth from the bathroom and cleaned off his face, though I didn't know what to do about the rest of him. I stared, looking at his ruined clothes. What did I do? Ethan was filthy, but he hadn't given me permission to undress him. And more importantly, he hadn't given me permission to see his missing leg. He kept it under wraps at all times and had been ridiculously secretive about concealing it from me. I didn't even know how to get his prosthetic off without hurting him. At the same time, I couldn't let him sleep in his own puke. Sure, I'd seen and touched Ethan's dick while we were fooling around the other day, but that was when he was sober enough to give consent. He couldn't even function in this state. While Ethan moaned on the bed, I slipped outside. Stefan was still waiting. How's it going in there? He asked. Bad. Do you care about dressing him? I asked. He's covered in vomit. Stefan smirked. Trust me, Em, Ethan and I have been skinny dipping since we were kids. I know what his package looks like and it's not that impressive. Okay, I knew for a fact that wasn't true. I had to use two hands to get him off. What about his leg? I asked. I was one of the people who helped him learn how to use his prosthetic. I know how to get it on and off, he said. You forget I was there the day he lost his leg. Stefan opened the door with a sigh. Wait here, I'll clean up, Princey Pie. Stefan slipped inside. The door closed. I bounced anxiously on my feet as I waited for Stefan to return. For God's sakes, man, pull yourself together, I heard Stefan say. Your girl's not impressed. Ethan made a gagging sound. I cringed. 
If you puke on me, I will punch you in the face. Stefan growled. Lie down. This is the last time I'm taking off your pants. I giggled. Had Stefan taken off Ethan's pants before? Oh, gods. There was more grumbling from Stefan until finally he stepped out of the room. Ethan's dressed and fast asleep, Stefan said. He'll be okay for now, though he'll hate himself in the morning. Thanks, Stefan, I said in relief. I couldn't have done this without you. He's my best friend, Stefan frowned. I'll always be there for him. I'm just worried about him. Don't tell him that. I smiled. I'm pretty sure he already knows. Stefan paused. He jiggled on the spot for a minute before he burst. These late-night rendezvous aren't good for him, don't you think? I knew what Stefan was admitting. He knew about the Phantom, and he was asking if I did too. Carrying this secret around by myself was way too exhausting. I couldn't do it anymore. I needed to confide in Stefan. I've tried to get him to stop, I said, but it's hard when I can't tell him that I know. Stefan's eyes widened. Why haven't you told him? He's been keeping this a secret from you for months, Emma. It's tearing him up inside. Believe me, I want him to know, but he can't, I pleaded. Why the hell not? Stefan snapped. Because if he does, there will be consequences for him, I said. From Gabby. Stefan's mouth dropped. Fucking Gabby? How much does she know? I held back. I could only tell Stefan so much. Enough that she could have him thrown in jail, or worse. Stefan went pale then. You can't expect me not to tell him. Yes, Stefan, I'm begging you, I pleaded. It's the only way to keep Ethan alive. Stefan's jaw popped. You're serious about this. Gabby will do anything to stay in power. Taking Ethan's life would be an afterthought to her. And if Ethan realizes I know he's the friend- Don't say it out loud, Stefan said quickly. He shook his head. Fine, Emma, I won't tell him now, but sooner or later he's gonna find out. Stefan huffed under his breath before he growled, I can't stay silent forever. He left then. Guilt grew in my stomach. Stefan wanted me to tell Ethan the truth and was upset when I refused to. How would he react when he found out I knew Andrick was harassing Delmer and didn't tell him? I crept inside Ethan's dorm again to check on him. He was sound asleep. He was shirtless, the bottom half of him covered up by a blanket, concealing his missing leg. Stefan had propped Ethan's prosthetic against the side of the wall. I sat on the edge of Ethan's bed. His hair was falling into his eyes. I stroked it back before giving a sigh. I knew too many damn secrets, and one of these days it was going to come back and bite me in the ass. Bad. Chapter 11 Ethan I didn't remember a damn thing about the festival or the events afterward, though I knew by the pounding headache I had the next morning it had been a disaster. I also knew I'd made a mockery of myself because Stefan had informed me how roaring drunk I'd gotten and how Emma had to drag me home before I, the Prince of Fools, embarrassed the crown and insulted the monarchy by getting pissed drunk in public. I was such a fool. I wasn't sure what Emma thought of it. I hadn't talked to her since it had all happened. I hoped to the gods she didn't think less of me. We had a big hockey game that day we couldn't afford to lose. I was still nursing my hangover. Stefan came in and handed me a potion as I got my stuff around. You look like shit, he commented. I chugged the potion. My hangover ebbed, but it didn't go away completely. I'd rather not speak of last night. Stefan gave a sarcastic sound. Nor would I, because as much as I love you, it's not in that way, and I've seen you in your boxers one too many times, my friend. You insinuate something's happened between us when it never has, I growled. Both Stefan and I were as straight as boards. Stefan wiggled his eyebrows. The ladies like it that way. Have you been telling sorceresses we fooled around in an attempt to pick up women? Perhaps before I met Delmare. I hate you. Hey, to the females of our species, two dicks are better than one. The girls today are freaks, man. Emma might enjoy a few fables of your own. You're asking to get kicked in the teeth. Might happen, Stefan's eyebrows raised. 
Team C is looking pretty feisty this morning. Arcania University had four different hockey teams separated into groups labeled Teams A, B, C, and D. Our team was Team A and had the best players, but C was catching up to us in the rankings. Right now, we were neck and neck for the head spot. Team B was so close behind both teams that their win against D last week put them in second place. My team was behind due to several lost games. We had to win today if we stood a chance of making the playoffs at the end of the semester. We started the walk to the rink. Before the grand staircase, we saw Delmare, Kiara, and Alexi. All of them were dressed in their faction colors with shirts that said Arcania University, waving flags that had the Team A symbol on it, a crest of a wolf fighting a dragon. Emma was there. Gods, I was embarrassed. I could feel my cheeks heat as I laid eyes on her. Hi, I breathed. My words choked up in my mouth as I lost what I was going to say. Hey, she replied. Are you feeling better? I'm fine, I rushed to say. I apologize that I got so carried away last night. It should have never happened. It's no big deal, she waved her hand. Everyone gets drunk at one point or another. Emma, I'm serious. I took her hands in mind. I want to make it up to you. After the game. Her smile warmed and she said, Okay. After the game? I dug in my hockey bag. Anyway, I know you'll be in the stands, so... Wear my jersey? I took out one of my hockey jerseys and handed it to her. This was the first time Emma would ever see me play. She was always practicing whenever I was on the ice, and I wanted the world to know she was mine. Emma ran her fingers along the stitching of my last name on the back of the jersey. I will. She slipped it on over her sweater. The jersey was huge on her, looked more like a dress, but gods, she was adorable in it. Let's hurry up, eh? Stefan said, before Lucian has our hides for being late. We hurried to the rink, which was filling up with spectators. There were two people missing from the group, Odette and Theo. Emma caught my curious look and said, I'm not sure where Odette or Theo are. I haven't seen them all morning. I hope everything's all right, I commented. Emma made a face and said, They had to deal with something. I'm sure it's fine. Her words carried a heavy weight, but I didn't challenge them. I had to focus on winning the game. Emma and I parted to go to warm-up. She kissed me lightly and whispered, Good luck. My chest lightened. I went to the locker room and laced up my skates, ignoring the slight pounding in my head. We need to concentrate on defense, Elijah bragged from the other side of the locker room. If we can get Team C on their guard, it'll be easier to score goals. Do as I say, and we'll win. Gods. Could he shut up? He was a shit leader. A couple of guys had clustered around his bench to listen in, but most of the team was ignoring him. We'd been divided this season. Not much of a team to go on. The crowd roared as we stepped on the ice to take our warm-up. The announcer in the stands was blaring our names player by player, but I tuned out the noise and focused. I saw Emma sitting in the corner of the rink with all of our friends. She mouthed good luck as I skated by and I smiled. Hey, keep your head on the ice, Stefan said as he skated past. You can bang your girl later. I shoved him. He gave me a cocky grin and skated off. Team C looked confident and prepared. They were gathered on one side of the rink against the boards, listening carefully to their coach's pep talk. My own team looked torn. Lucian shouted out instructions, but nobody was listening. The practice shots my team took missed. As I skated around, I noticed a couple of Team C players looking at me, though they averted their eyes when I sent them a glare. Most people were shocked that I still played hockey after I lost my leg. When I skated on the ice, the bottom half of my prosthetic was exposed for everyone to see, as my shorts didn't go past my knee, and there was no use for pads on the prosthetic itself. Yes, it was uncomfortable to be different. The first day back at practice had been horrible after I'd become an amputee, People had stared, but I'd since put up enough points on the scoreboard to shut people up, so anyone who doubted my capabilities as a player could kindly fuck off. The practice ended, and I skated to center ice to face off. I knelt down and focused as the referee dropped the puck 
and the game began. Team C didn't hold back. I immediately snatched the puck, but a brawny griffin body-checked me so hard he sent me sprawling to the ice. My shoulder throbbed as he stole the puck away. I cried out for one of my teammates to intercept him before he could reach our goalie, but he didn't skate fast enough. The griffin shot the puck. Our goalie reached out to snatch the puck out of the air, but was seconds too late. The puck nailed the net and the buzzer went off, signaling Team C had scored a point. Damn it! I smacked my stick onto the ice. We'd only been playing for a few minutes, and already Team C was ahead of us. I skated off the ice and took the bench as Lucian sent out a fresh line to play. Stefan took a drink out of his water bottle. Beside him, Elijah ranted. If you hadn't been such an idiot, we could have stopped him, Elijah bellowed at Yan. It's your fault he got passed. Yan stared at the ground, unsure of what to say. Lucian stepped in. We're a team, Elijah, he said forcefully. If we lose, we lose together. If we lose at all, it's because these useless fucks couldn't keep up with me. Elijah elbowed Yan. Yan took several deep breaths as his face turned red. I knew he was trying not to get mad because he feared the repercussions from Lord Zlodia if he reacted. Lucian scowled. If you had been paying attention to our own corner of the ice instead of everyone else's, you would have seen you had a chance to intercept the puck long before it got to our side of the rink after we lost the face-off. Elijah gaped. He didn't have anything to say after that. He just punched the boards and sulked. Lucian's eyes returned to watching the game. I gripped my stick and tried not to break it in half. Emma was looking at me. She seemed worried. I gave her a nod to show her it was okay, but her frown didn't lift. She didn't have to hear our conversations to know that Elijah was getting on my nerves. The first period was a bust. The second didn't go much better. Team C didn't score again, but we didn't score at all. I shot the puck several times toward the net, but the goalie was damn good and on his game today. He deflected every shot on goal I sent his way. Our own goalie floundered and almost let another goal in by the end of the second half. We only had one more period to turn things around and weren't even tied up. Emma gave me a small wave as I left the benches to go to the locker room for the break in between the second period and the third. I felt wholly embarrassed. My first time playing in front of my girl and I was skating like shit. I wanted to score a goal to impress her. At the very least, I didn't want my team to lose at her first game. Lucian's pep talk had done nothing to inspire us in the locker room, seeing as how Elijah kept unhelpfully interceding every time Lucian tried to rile us up. Most of the team was tired, if not feeling defeated. Lucian turned to me before we left the locker room. Ethan, you're team captain. You need to get morale up. What can I do? I said, exasperated. If you don't want to end the season on the bottom of the roster board, I suggest you whip them into shape, Lucian whispered. This team needs you. I took a deep breath and looked around at the despondent faces of my teammates. Lucian was right. This was a good team. I knew we were a good team. I'd played with these guys for ages and seen them in action. How we were performing today wasn't anywhere near what we could do in practice. They just needed someone to back them up. I got to my feet and gripped my stick. I tapped it on the floor, and everyone looked up. Elijah sneered, but he was the only one. Look, guys, I started. I know we're getting beat up out there, and right now, things aren't looking good. Fuck no, they ain't, someone said from the back, and a muddled array of agreement arose. But, I said, and the locker room fell silent. We aren't playing like we were born to play. I believe in you guys, all of you. There's some amazing players here, but we can't win today if we can't skate like we have heart. How are we supposed to do that? Yan asked. Unfortunately, he'd gotten a black eye and was holding an ice pack to his head. It wasn't a good month for hockey for him. I know I'm here for one thing, for the love of hockey, I said firmly. I play this sport because I love to be out there, not because I want to win. And none of you guys would have made it to this level if you didn't love this sport just as much as I do. So this next period, just go out and play, guys. Play for the love of hockey. 
because if you do that, we'll come out on top. My words had done something to rouse the team. Several guys were nodding. Stefan jumped to his feet and shouted, I'm ready to knock some heads. Who's with me? There were cheers. Masculine noises rose up around the locker room, and the team ran into the hallway with a renewed vigor. Elijah was muttering swear words as he pushed past me to take the ice. He was pissed off that my speech had gone so well. Screw him. He needed to learn a thing or two about humility before he became king. Lucian clapped me on the shoulder, and a bloom of optimism sprouted within me. Well done, Ethan, Lucian said. Now let's play. My shoulders felt lighter when I stepped onto the ice again. This time, the game went smoother. Our passes connected. The same Griffin player that had been thwarting me the entire game tried to steal the puck away again as I entered Team C's defense, but this time, I was ready for him. I passed the puck to Stefan, and he took a shot. The goalie attempted to stop it, but Stefan did a complicated maneuver and slid the puck right between the goalie's legs. The buzzer went off, signaling we were tied. Beautiful, man, I shouted. Stefan and I bumped our helmets together as our teammates crowded around us in a massive huddle, except for Elijah, who spat on the ice. You're not the only one who can deke and shoot a five-hole, bud, Stefan commented. The next play began. The other team nabbed the puck, but the player got a little too eager. He crashed the net and ended up slamming into our goalie. It looked like it'd been on purpose. The puck didn't go in, but the goalie struggled to get back up. He'd been hitting the groin. A groan went over the crowd as a couple of players helped our goalie up. They aided him in skating to the boards where our backup goalie took his place in net. The referee whistled, but he didn't give the player who hurt our goalie a penalty. Are you kidding me? I shouted, but the referee ignored me. That had been interference, if not roughing, but the refs were clearly playing favorites. Stefan had a glint in his eye that signaled he planned to dole out some justice. The player that hit our goalie got the puck early in the next faceoff, but Stefan wasn't going to let him get away with it. Stefan was the biggest guy out of all of us and known as the enforcer on our team. He skated toward the player that had assaulted our goalie and checked him to the boards. The player crumbled to the ice, then curled into a ball. The player forced himself upright and winced as he skated slowly to the boards. The referee blew his whistle and gave Stefan a penalty for charging. Stefan scowled, but dutifully went to the penalty box. Great. Now we were down a player. But it wasn't anything we couldn't handle. I faced the Team C player during the face-off. He was big for an alicorn and fast, but I lashed out my stick and stole the puck away just as the referee dropped it onto the ice. I was a woven, which meant I was faster than the other factions, even on the ice. I easily slipped between two dragon players as the opposing team's net drew near. My line to the goal was blocked, but Yan was waiting. His stick was at the perfect angle, ready to shoot the puck in. I passed the puck, but before Yan could grab it, Elijah snaked out and took it for himself. Elijah took a shot, but he was in a bad place, and the puck bounced off the goal post and into the glass surrounding the boards. My mouth dropped. I'd sent the puck to Yan. He'd been wide open, and it was an easy shot. We almost got a goal. If only Elijah hadn't been obsessed with getting all the glory to himself. I couldn't take it anymore. Someone had to put this snitch in his place. I skated up to Elijah as the game continued around us. What the hell was that? I screamed. I shoved him. The audience gasped, but I didn't care. Elijah wasn't a king yet, and out here, he was just another hockey player. Elijah gritted his teeth. Your pass was shit. If you had been faster, I could have scored. My temper burst free. If no one else on this ice had the balls to hit him, then I would. I threw off my gloves and delivered Elijah the hardest punch I could muster, straight on the jaw. He reeled back, stunned for a moment, before he tossed off his own gloves and grabbed me, wrenching me close. The game came to a stop and whistles were blown, but I hardly noticed. I drew my fist back again and again, clobbering Elijah in the nose, then the cheek. His face was bloody. He responded with punches of his own. One of his blows connected with my jaw, and I thought I felt a tooth come loose, but it didn't faze me. I pushed him to the ice and climbed on top of him, resisting the urge to choke him out. At that moment, 
I had so much hatred for Elijah, I wanted to kill him. This went beyond today's game. His actions constantly showed that he cared more about himself than doing what was best for everyone else, and that was the worst kind of ruler there was. The refs tore us apart. They escorted us to separate penalty boxes. It was worth it to see the blood streaked across Elijah's face. Team A will receive a five-minute major penalty for having a brawl between two of their own players, the announcer bellowed. I've been announcing for 20 years, and I've never seen anything like it, folks. Looks like Ethan Nowak is taking out some of his frustration at losing the crown to his dear little cousin. Stefan's penalty expired, so they let him out of the box to put Elijah and myself in. Our team tried to defend the net, but Team C scored another goal. My insides churned. I'd accused Elijah of putting himself first, but if I was honest, I'd done the same thing. I was so frustrated with him, I allowed my anger to hurt the team. By the time I was back up on the ice again, there was only a few minutes left in the game, and my teammates had tied it up, but I knew if we didn't wrap up this game now, we were in trouble. My team always lost in overtime. We just didn't have the stamina for it. We had to score another goal in this period and end the game now. Lucian had the sense to switch our lines and keep Elijah on the boards while I gave it the best I had. Stefan was out with me. My hands shook as I held my stick, but we won the faceoff. Stefan passed the puck to Yan, who passed it to me, and I passed it back. We played keep away with the Team C players, who were fed up with our tactics and looking to teach us a lesson. The goal loomed near. There were seconds remaining on the clock. Stefan passed the puck to me, and the world fell away as I took a one-timer shot, holding my breath. I'd done this a million times before, yet every time I did, it always felt like the first. That shot was like a rocket. It ricocheted off my stick and flew past the goalie, sinking into the goal. The buzzer sounded, and the game was over. A roar went across the crowd, compounded by groans from the Team C fans. A delighted yell rose over the stadium. It was Emma. She was jumping up and down and cheering. I beamed at her, proud that I'd pulled off a last-minute win out of my ass. It was all for her. My team stormed the ice and formed around me in a massive huddle, bumping helmets with me and clapping me on the back. I had the thought it really was stupid of me to consider quitting hockey, even if we'd lost today. I loved playing with these guys. It was one of my passions, and hockey had been my first love. I'd never give that up, even if I had to play with my poor sport of a cousin. Elijah didn't even get in line to shake the hands of the Team C players. He left the ice before we'd received the first congratulations on our win. What a little bitch, Stefan said. Lucian had noticed too, but he didn't go after Elijah to lecture him. Gods, was he afraid of what the repercussions would be too? Being the future king didn't give Eli a free pass for everything. I didn't get that kind of treatment as prince. But that was the difference. I didn't scare people. Elijah did. Emma threw her arms around me once I was out of the locker room and in the lobby. Congratulations, she squealed. She hugged me tightly. I embraced her back, feeling joy radiate all over my body. Getting a welcome like that after winning a game meant everything to me. I wanted to make her proud of me. I hoped I did that today. Eh, you did all right, Delmare said while munching on a soft pretzel. I've seen better. Stefan threw his arm around her shoulder and took a bite out of her pretzel. Did you see that massive hit? Shows you how strong I am, baby. Delmare rolled her eyes. Kiara lifted her fountain drink and said, Party in the rec room? There were shouts of agreement, and we headed back to campus. The rec room was packed when we got there. A couple of dragon shifters had brought out kegs and were distributing mugs around the room. Quite a few team members from Team A were already here with their friends and mates, celebrating the win. Team C players were also scattered around the area because, hey, free beer was free beer, even if you lost. Music blared from speakers someone had pulled out of their dorm. Our group snagged one of the last couches. I sat down and yanked Emma onto my lap. A whiff of her perfume crossed my nose as her red hair nestled against my shoulder and my dick jolted. Later, I told myself, when there weren't so many damn people around. Over the sound of the music, I yelled, 
So, how did you like the game? Loved it, Emma shouted back. I've always had a thing for hockey. Coming from Detroit, I should have guessed that, but it still made a soft spot open up in my heart for Emma. That she actually liked my sport and didn't merely put up with it made me happy. And hockey players, eh? Kiara said, elbowing Emma in a tease. Emma gave a coy look. Hey, hockey players are really hot, even though the figure skater and the hockey player getting together is a total cliché. There's a reason clichés are clichés, sweetheart, Stefan told her. They work. I just like violence. Delmare took another swig of her beer. And hockey is very violent. One of the few sports that allows you to still punch people. Stefan clinked his glass against hers. I like your thinking. I swear, one of the highlights of my day was watching you punch Elijah in the face, Emma said, turning to me. You could have lost by ten points, and I wouldn't have cared, because that was awesome. It was worth the price of admission, Alexei agreed. Oh my gosh, you should have seen Gabby, Kiara gushed. She was so furious Elijah lost that brawl. She threw her drink against the glass and everything. She let out a scream I thought for sure came from a banshee. She probably is a banshee. She's such a wicked witch, Emma said, and she gave a cackle. At least half banshee, Alexei offered. Kudos to the crazy man that slept with her mother. That got a laugh out of all of us, because Alexei was right. If Gabby was terrible, I bet whoever had raised her was just as big a monster. Our laughter died as we saw Odette approaching. We hadn't seen her all day. Emma perked up in my lap, but her hopeful gaze became frightened. Odette's lip trembled. There were tears blooming in her eyes, welling over the lids. She stopped in front of Emma and began shaking, stomping her foot. I hate you, you know that? She snapped at Emma. Kiara and Delmare both reeled back in shock. Alexei, Stefan, and I looked at each other while Emma stiffened. I did it to protect you, Emma insisted. You know I had to tell Theo. You didn't need to tell him anything, Odette shouted. There's nothing wrong with me. Odette's hands clenched into fists and they quivered at her sides. She appeared to be overstimulated from the loud music and all the people inside the rec room. It was only making her anger worse. Odette, calm down, I said gently. Odette ignored me. I can't trust you, Emma. You're an awful friend. Just stay away from me, okay? Emma's voice was gentle. I care about you, Odette. You haven't been eating, and you've been purging your food. I couldn't allow it to go on. I was shocked. Odette had an eating disorder? I suppose, looking back, the signs were clear to see. But how terrible. Emma had been carrying this alone, for I wasn't sure how long. And I'd gotten drunk last night, leaving her to shoulder the burden. I was a terrible mate. I couldn't have known, but still, we were all friends. I should have caught on. What? Delmare burst. Her eyes widened. This was news to her as well. Kiara was similarly surprised. Odette, why didn't you tell us? We could have helped you. Odette didn't answer. She only had eyes for Emma. You know how important ballet is to me. Maybe if you took your skating career just as seriously, you'd be able to keep up with Gabby instead of falling on your ass all the time at practice. That was a mean comment, one that I knew dug at Emma. My mate flinched before she gathered her bearings and let out a comeback. If your ballet career is so important... Why did you leave the Russian ballet for Arcania University? Emma snapped. She was finally losing her patience. Odette nervously pulled at her hair, on the verge of a meltdown. A few blonde strands came out as she burst. I didn't come back to dance in the Malovian ballet. I came back to dance with... Odette took a breath. She didn't finish her sentence, but everyone around us heard her words. She hadn't left Russia to attend Arcania University. She'd come back for Theo. Emma's features rearranged into porcelain glass, fragile and hopeful. It was worth it. Odette, Theo is your mate. I expected some grand revelation to come upon Odette, but it didn't happen. Odette wiped at her face. No, don't lie to spare my feelings, Emma. I thought there was something between us, but I was stupid. There's nothing there, and I've moved on, so don't try to get involved like you always do. You like sticking your nose into other people's business, and I'm just sick of it. It's the truth, Emma objected. 
Theo tried to say the same thing, but I know he's lying. If he loved me, he would have told me by now. He's been nothing but friendly toward me. That's not how a mate acts, Odette sniffed. Now he's trying to make me feel better by tossing himself at me when I know he doesn't care. It makes me feel pathetic. This was all wrong. Odette took Theo's passiveness for apathy. She thought he didn't love her. What a terrible mess. Odette, Theo does love you, Emma pleaded. He told me himself. Odette shook her head so rapidly, I imagined it flying off her shoulders. She put her hands over her ears and said, I don't believe you. I don't feel anything for him anymore. If we were mated, I would feel the bond, and I don't. I'm involved with someone else now. Please, Emma, keep your distance. Odette tore off. She ran through the crowd, darting between bodies on her way out of the rec room. Odette, wait, Emma cried. She got off my lap and I jumped up to go after her. We wove around the room in our chase, but Odette disappeared into the crowd. Emma and I got turned around. We circled in place, but didn't see Odette anywhere. We'd lost Odette. Damn it. Emma turned toward me, tears brimming in her eyes. Do you think she'll ever forgive me? I wrapped her in my arms and gave her a hug. She will, Emma. You did the right thing. Give it time. Emma closed her eyes and leaned against me as people moved around us. I held her for a long moment until her breaths calmed. I didn't pull apart from her until I felt a tap on my shoulder. Hey, Theo said. There were dark bags under his eyes and lines spanned his face. He looked like he'd been up all night. Are you okay? Emma asked softly. She doesn't believe me, Theo said hollowly. His voice sounded like one of a ghost. I waited too long. We know, I said, and I grasped his shoulder. But she will believe you eventually. You can't give up on your mate just yet. Theo stared at the floor, and Emma said, Well, at least you got her treatment, right? So she can recover from her disorder? Theo's tone remained grave. I tried, but she doesn't want to get help. What? Emma stammered. Did you tell the company? She's over age. I can't make her get help if she doesn't want it, Theo said helplessly. And at the ballet company, having an eating disorder is almost a sign of commitment to your craft. She's practically been praised for her devotion. That ass she's with, the director of the company, Igor, he thinks it's fine. That's just sick, Emma spat. Theo shrugged. Hey, it's ballet. You know how it is. What about her parents? I asked. Theo frowned deeper, if that was possible. Her father isn't around much these days. I've told her mother, but being a former prima ballerina herself, she doesn't see anything wrong with it. My stomach churned. I was an athlete as well, and I knew you had to make sacrifices for your sport, but this was going too far. Her own mother wouldn't put an end to this? It was beyond cruel. Emma leaned into me. In a helpless voice, she whispered, What are we going to do? We'll be here for her, I said. Odette needs support at a time like this. She has to know we're not giving up on her. Theo nodded. I feel like I ruined everything. Don't despair. You still have a chance, I insisted. Theo didn't say anything more, just slunk off. Disappointment grew within me for my friend. I knew how much he cherished Odette, despite doing his best to hide his feelings. Now it blown up in his face. Emma entwined her fingers in mine. This is my fault. Odette's secret needed to come out, I said. In time, she'll have to face the light. I squeezed Emma's hand. I know it hasn't been the greatest night, but I think it's best for now if we take your mind off it. I did promise to make up for my poor behavior from yesterday. You don't have to. I said I didn't care about that, she protested. But I do, and you deserve to be treated like a princess. I guided Emma outside, under the glow of the moon. I took a blindfold out of my pocket and handed it to her. Put this on. It's time for your surprise. Chapter 12 Emma Ethan guided me carefully as the blindfold made it impossible to see anything. I had no idea where we were going, 
but I felt the stone paths of campus beneath my feet become cobblestone as we ventured into the streets of Dolenska. Ethan Nowak, where are you taking me? I teased. It's a surprise. He called for a carriage. Ethan lifted me in, and I leaned against him as the carriage jolted down the street. He put his arm around me, and I inhaled his fresh, wolfish scent. Gods, he smelled so good. He smelled like home. The carriage stopped. Ethan took my hand and pulled me along another pathway. Soon, the rocks became grass, and I reached out a hand to feel velvet flowers skimming my fingertips. Open your eyes. Ethan took off my blindfold. I gasped. Ethan had led me to a beautiful garden. White roses bigger than my hand bloomed in a circle around the fountain of a woven shifter. Fireflies fluttered over the roses and glowed, while a small stream trickled peacefully over the smooth stones. A circular gate stood as the entrance, a low fence containing the area. Vines and ivy grew over the stone, bursting with fresh grapes. A willow tree suspended over the lawn as cherry blossom trees bloomed big pink blossoms, the petals floating down delicately and giving the area a sweet scent. Inside the garden, it was warm like springtime. Behind us rose the royal palace. As if the garden was contained by a glass dome, Snow fell outside of it, but never touched the garden. How is this possible? It's the dead of winter, I gasped. It's an illusion, one that never fades, even in the cold, Ethan said. The royal sorceresses tend to this garden and make sure it blooms all year round. On the other side of the garden was a wicker couch, flooded with cushions, and a stone table with the center that had coals blazing with fire. Ethan guided me to the couch, and we sat. The fire from the table warmed our skins as I heard crickets chirping in the surrounding night. Above, the stars shone brightly, sparkling like diamonds against a dark blue sky. Ethan put his arm around me. I bristled, though I didn't want to. I couldn't help but want to get close to him. It was like trying to fight nature itself, avoiding the connection he had to my body. It just wasn't fair. There was a rustling behind the willow tree. I jumped, but Ethan laughed. Don't worry, they won't hurt you. A creature cooed as it stepped out from the fronds. My eyes widened. The creature was twelve feet tall, with a whip-like tail that she curled behind herself. She had a long neck and two beautiful butterfly wings on her shoulders. Her face was small and round, accented with pink almond eyes. All over her body were pink feathers with darker fur. Another creature came out from behind her, though this one was blue and male. What are they? I whispered in wonder. They're called windfarers, Ethan said softly. When we crossed over from Edenmire, we brought some of our faken with us. Not every creature in Malovia is a monster. The creatures came close enough for me to touch. The pink one put her head down and sniffed at me, curious. You can pet her, Ethan said. She won't mind. I reached up to stroke the windfarer's nose. She gave a low coo. Her nose was so soft, like stroking velvet. The windfarer snorted, and the gust of wind from her nostrils blew back my hair. The pink windfarer turned to the blue, who I assumed was her mate. How many species of fey creatures are there in the world? I asked. Dozens, Ethan replied. They're quite marvelous. The pink windfarer let out a note, which her mate copied. Their voices sounded like songs. Ethan looked at me and asked, Wanna go for a ride? Huh? My head snapped to the side. Don't let us do that? Fey creatures are friendly to those that share their blood. We'll be fine. Before I could object, Ethan swung me onto the pink wayfarer's back. I gasped as he hauled himself onto the blue steed. Do you really think this is such a good- Ah! I startled as the windfarer beat her wings and took off. I fell forward and grabbed her thick fur. Her butterfly wings buffeted the air, and before I knew it, we were rising over the castle. I gasped and pressed myself to the windfarer's body. Though I had my own wings, I'd never flown so high on my own before. We soared into the clouds, and I looked down. Past the Windfarer's feet, the city of Dolinska looked like a fairy tale town. 
Its pitched roofs and winding cobblestone streets spoke of adventure and new things to see. Below was the great span of the woodland, and beyond that, the backdrop of the Malovian Mountains. The snow fell around us, and I cast a glance at Ethan. His hair was blown backward, features invigorated by the breathlessness the flight brought to us both. It was such a sad thing he didn't have wings, because Ethan was meant to soar. As the clouds swept around us, the windfarers hovered. They wound their long necks around each other like they were performing a mating dance and crooned happily. I got a crazy fucking idea. I didn't know if it was going to work or not, but screw it. I had the feeling I was capable. I summoned my wings to appear and flew off the windfarer. Even as I saw nothing below me, I knew my wings would keep me safe. I flew to Ethan. I reached out my arms for him, and he wrapped his own around me. I lifted him off the windfarer. I thought he might be heavy, but amazingly, he was incredibly light. I realized I was using my telepathy skills to keep us both aloft as my wings suspended us over the great Malovian landscape. Ethan was speechless. Gods, Emma, you are incredible. The windfarers flew around us, and he kissed me. My wings fluttered as my hands freely roamed his chest and abs, my telepathy magic buzzing in the back of my mind. His tongue entered my mouth and I savored it, swirling it with my own. Ethan let out a groan, and my hands fished for his hair. I yanked on the black strands, and he bit my lip lightly, sending a gasp shuddering through my body. Ethan pulled back for a moment. Quietly, he whispered, Una Wilka, do you think... could you... What? He was having a hard time saying his words. His eyes looked away as he asked bashfully, Could you ever fall in love with me? What a fool he was. He didn't see the obvious. I put my forehead against his and said, I already have. Ethan pleasures Emma while she carries them throughout the sky. They say I love you for the first time before Emma returns Ethan's touch. The Windfarers had ended their mating dance and they were looking at us. Okay, it was kind of weird they were around to watch but I think they were too busy flying around to pay much attention to the kinky shit we'd been doing. I returned Ethan to the back of his windfarer before I mounted my own. The pink windfarer gave a low noise and I patted her back. As we flew back toward the garden, Ethan was contemplative. That was powerful magic, Onawilka. I'm surprised you had the strength. I don't know. I shrugged. I struggle with magic in class, but sometimes I can do whatever I want. It's as if it depends on the spell feeling natural. What I just did, it took no effort at all. That's what illusion magic is, believing in yourself, he said. Confidence is key for everything an Arcania does. I suppose. I didn't know I couldn't do it, so it didn't stop me from trying. Ethan nodded introspectively. The Windfarers flew us back to Arcania University. They landed in front of the doors to the dormitories, then bowed their heads to us before they took off into the sky. Ethan's thumb rubbed the back of my hand as he whispered, It's late. You have practice tomorrow, Onawilka. It was the first time I despised getting up early to go ice skating. I wanted to spend the night with Ethan. I wanted to enjoy the feel of his hands on me once more. As Ethan and I parted ways at my dormitory, I'd reasoned that I had failed. My goal was to keep Ethan at a distance in order to keep him safe, but we were closer than ever before. We'd admitted we loved each other. The next step would only seal our relationship for good, and then there'd be nothing we wouldn't do for each other. I wouldn't be able to hold back. I'd have to tell Ethan that I knew he was the Phantom. I couldn't sleep with him otherwise. It wouldn't feel right. All the dark secrets I kept would have to be revealed. And if Gabby found out, there's no telling what she would do. The following week passed in a blur of classes and studying. I'd seen Odette several times in the hallway and tried reaching out whenever she went by. But once she saw me, she ran the other way. It was painful to be ignored by her. 
I knew she was mad at me, but she had to see that I cared, right? Except I was pretty sure Odette didn't think that way. She thought I was ruining her chances of becoming a prima ballerina and not trying to save her life. On Friday afternoon, I hoped I could gain some support from Delmer and Kiara. We met outside in one of the campus courtyards, underneath the shade of a tree. Both of them were sitting on a bench while a group of shifters played soccer in the background. Did you guys get through to her? I asked as I sat down. Kiara shook her head and my heart dropped. We've tried talking to Odette, but she refuses to hear us, Kiara said. She doesn't want to admit she has a problem. Delmer huffed. It's like she's cutting everyone out of her life that isn't fucking Igor. I frowned. What about Theo? She stopped talking to him completely, Kiara said sadly. I feel so bad for him. A knot of guilt pressed inward on my stomach. When was I going to stop screwing things up? Ethan wanted me to back off and wait for Odette to come to me, but at the same time I felt I couldn't do that. I wanted to rectify the mess I'd made and get her help. Where is she now? I asked. Where do you think? The studio? Delmer said sarcastically. She never leaves it. I stood up and gestured for the girls to follow. Come on, maybe if we talk to her all at once, she'll understand that we care. Delmer and Kiara followed. We left campus and hustled to the Malovian Ballet Studio, which was a large brick building near the center of town. As the building came into view, I saw someone standing there blocking the way. Oh, great. Fucking Andrick. What did this prick want? Andrick grinned like a crocodile the moment he saw Delmer. He slunk up to us like a filthy snake. Kiara and I instinctively pressed closer around Delmer. Her eye twitched as Andrick gave a toothy grin. You changed your mind yet about my little offer? He seethed, ignoring Kiara and I. My bed is open, sweetheart, but it won't be for long. Fuck off, would you? Delmer said, before I put another scar on that ugly mug. Oh, baby, Andrick hissed. I like your thinking. Let's play rough, shall we? You want rough? Take this, Delmer roared. Delmer pushed away from the two of us, rounded on Andrick, and delivered a punch. Her fist went straight to his nose, and I heard a cracking sound. Blood spurted everywhere. Andrick cupped at his face and yelled, You bitch! Come on, Mare! I screamed. I grabbed Delmer's arm, and we ran. Andrick shouted curses behind us. Well done, Delmer! Kiara praised as we scuttled away. You sure showed him. Delmer shook out her hand. I bruised my knuckles on that asshole's thick skull. Andrick hobbled back toward campus. He was still pouring blood and holding his nose, but with a dark look at Delmer, I was certain the bastard would be back. You really need to tell Stefan, or at least a teacher, this is sexual harassment. I protested. I'm fine, Delmer snapped. I can take care of myself. I gave an angry sigh, but let it go. We could only handle one issue at a time, and Odette's was currently more pressing. Plus, Delmer's stubborn ass wouldn't cave until she had no other choice, and I'd have to twist her arm to get her to ask for help. If Andrick bothered her one more time, fuck our promises. I'd go to Stefan and deal with her being mad at me. It wasn't like I had no experience with pissed-off friends. We stepped inside the ballet studio and listened. Soft piano music was drifting from upstairs. The floors were made of polished wood, the walls painted a light yellow. A flock of ten-year-olds in leotards squeezed past us, giggling. We passed multiple dance rooms, but with each peer inside the glass, I didn't see Odette. I figured we had to go up, and I climbed a wooden staircase that wound upward to the attic. Kiara glanced backward and said, This is where the company practices. Odette was in another studio behind a glass wall. She was sweating buckets, doing reps at the bar. She was ready to pass out. I could see her eyes fluttering as she struggled to stay upright. I stomped toward the entrance to the studio, but an alicorn shifter got in my way. Excuse me, but you aren't permitted to be here. This is a private practice. My eyes looked upward and I cringed. It was Igor. He wore a tight turtleneck sweater and a raised eyebrow. 
He crossed his arms and looked me up and down, as if judging if I was a ballerina or not. I need to talk to Odette, I said. It's urgent. It can wait after practice. She gets off at seven, Igor responded. That was hours from now, and I wasn't about to sit around. She can take a five-minute break. I went to go around, but he stepped in my way again. Odette has had enough distractions from her so-called friends, Igor sneered. I think you're leading her down the wrong path. If you want what's best for her, you'll allow me to guide her practice. Rage flared inside of me. After just dealing with Andrik, I'd had enough of interfering males today. I didn't let him stop me. I shoved past Igor and forced my way into the dance studio. He gave an indignant gasp, but didn't go to stop me. My stomach dropped. Odette's face was ashen and pale as she twirled over and over. A woman on the other side of the studio was barking orders, clapping her hands in time. She had her hair pulled back in a tight blonde bun, her makeup done to immaculate perfection. She shared Odette's features. I knew her name because Odette had mentioned it before. Agrippa Oksana. Fuck this. I strode to the speaker and turned the music off. Odette collapsed. She fell to her knees, gasping for breath. Agrippa whirled on me. Her cheeks were pink as she exclaimed, Excuse me? What is the meaning of this? I tried to be as respectful as possible. Mrs. Oksana, I'm Odette's friend. I came here to talk to her. I just want her to be okay. She's perfectly fine, as you can see, Agrippa replied. We're preparing for the performance. Odette was still panting. She looked anything but okay. I prayed to Milana to give me some patience before I said, She has an eating disorder. She needs help. Agrippa scoffed. She looked me up and down before she said, I'm sorry, but what you might consider a disorder, we consider discipline. I've heard you're a skater. You should try it sometime. It might help you to get off the ground. Was this bitch really calling me fat? I'd had people tell me I was overweight throughout my skating career, but it was never the truth. And even if it was, why did it matter? I'd had to stand there and listen as a little girl when some asshole coach told my mother I was too big for skating. This lady was no different from him. She might be a ballet instructor, but she didn't know jack about my body. Your daughter is sick, I belted. She needs help. Her career is none of your concern, Agrippa said coolly. From behind her, Odette looked onward desperately. Her eyes caught mine and her lip quivered. For as angry as she'd been at me the other day, she was begging for me to save her now. I balled my hands into fists. Look, lady, either you can let Odette go home now or I'm gonna- Emma, that's enough. A calm voice behind me interrupted the conversation. I turned. Shock ran through me as I saw my mother enter the studio. Mom had her hair swept up in a low bun, and the frown on her face was stern as she came near. Her dagger-like gaze fell on Agrippa and smoldered. Mom, what are you doing here? I asked in surprise. I've picked up coaching beginners as a side gig, Mom said, her eyes never leaving Agrippa's. I want to instill the right mindset in them. Agrippa's gaze narrowed. That was obviously a personal jibe. It's no surprise this girl's your daughter, Agrippa said, waving a hand. The Sosna family was never very good at achieving greatness. Being average is fine as far as you're concerned. I gave an outraged sound. Mom had been a beautiful ballerina and a great skater. Yeah, she never made it to the big time, but so what? She had fun doing what she loved, and there were tons of athletes who couldn't even come close to her skill. Agrippa's snide comments didn't faze my mother. Mom took my hand and said, I make sure to tend to my daughter's mental health. I can't say the same for you. Agrippa's nose wrinkled in disgust. Well, when you're on the way to the top, sacrifices must be made. Mom's tone was cool. Indeed. Come, Emma. Mom yanked on my hand, and I had no choice but to follow her. Odette's eyes were begging me not to leave her. My own watered, and I hoped she caught the love within them. Delmer and Chiara were waiting outside. 
Igor was looking surly. Mom rounded on him and barked, Don't you have somewhere to be? Igor shrunk back before he wandered off, muttering things under his breath. The music in the studio started up again. Behind us, I heard Agrippa barking orders at Odette to pick up the pace, and my blood boiled. You girls need to listen to me, Mom said as she looked at me, Kiara, and Delmer. Odette has made her choice. You have to respect it. Respect it? I burst. She's starving herself! She's wasting away in that studio! I pointed. Kiara and Delmer looked at the floor. Mom gave a long, drawn-out sigh. She glanced through the glass at Agrippa. Agrippa caught her gaze and sneered, closing the blinds. Listen to me. I've been through this before, Mom said. Agrippa and I were the closest of friends at Arcania University. But we fell apart when she let her career take over our friendship. I suggest you back off on having a relationship with Odette. She's just as devoted as her mother to ballet, and I don't want you to get hurt. Odette is nothing like that horrible woman, I spat. Agrippa was once sweet and kind as well. It's what made us such good friends, Mom said. But people change, and Odette's priorities are on the stage, just as yours are on the ice. I would never let myself get to this level. You wouldn't let me, I protested. Because I'm a mother who values my child more than her accomplishments, Mom said slowly. Agrippa isn't that way. She lost her chance to be a successful ballerina. She can have it again if she can live through Odette. It's just wrong. Odette isn't doing this for herself. She's doing it for her. I burst. But that's not your choice to make. Odette is a grown woman, and her mistakes are her own to make, Mom said. She'll never get better if you force her, Emma. My stomach churned. Mom smoothed her bun and replied in a soft voice, I know you love Odette, but trying to save her is only going to bring you a world of pain. You just have to accept that some people can't be helped. You can't save people from themselves. Trust me, I know. Mom's voice was somber with all the unspoken things that had passed between her and Agrippa years ago. But even so, I wasn't going to allow history to repeat itself. Though Mom escorted us out, I vowed not to leave Odette behind unless there was no other choice. Odette had been my first friend. She was my best friend. And unlike my mother, I wasn't going to stop fighting for her.